Chapter Zero of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh, A. Collins, and J. Watts. Reprinted from an English work entitled Half Hours with the Freethinkers. Editor's Preface. In these pages, appearing under the title of Half Hours with the Freethinkers, are collected in a readable form an abstract of the lives and doctrines of some of those who have stood foremost in the ranks of free thought in all countries and in all ages and we trust that our efforts to place in the hands of the poorest of our party a knowledge of works and workers some of which and whom would otherwise be out of their reach will be received by all in a favorable light we shall in the course of our publication have to deal with many writers whose opinions widely differ from our own and it shall be our care to deal with them justly and in all cases to allow them to utter in their own words their essential thinkings we lay no claim to originality in the mode of treatment we will endeavor to cull the choicest flowers from the garden and if others can make a brighter or better bouquet we shall be glad to have their assistance we have only one object in view, and that is the presenting of free and manly thoughts to our readers, hoping to induce like thinking in them, and trusting that noble work may follow noble thoughts. The free thinkers we intend treating of have also been free workers, endeavoring to raise men's minds from superstition and bigotry, and place before them a knowledge of the real we have been the more inclined to issue the half-hours with the freethinkers in consequence not only of the difficulty which many have in obtaining the works of the old freethinkers but also as an effective answer to some remarks which have lately appeared in certain religious publications implying a dearth of thought and thinkers beyond the pale of the church we wish all men to know that great minds and good men have sought truth apart from faith for many ages, and that it is because few were prepared to receive them, and many united to crush them, their works are so difficult of access to the general mass at the present day. End of the Editor's Preface Chapter Zero of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers Read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina. Chapter One of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Chapter One Thomas Hobbes. This distinguished freethinker was born on the 5th of April, 1588, at Malmesbury, hence his cognomen of the Philosopher of Malmesbury. In connection with his birth, we are told that his mother, being a loyal Protestant, was so terrified at the rumored approach of the Spanish Armada that the birth of her son was hastened in consequence. The subsequent timidity of Hobbes is therefore easily accounted for. The foundation of his education was laid in the grammar school of his native town, where most probably his father, being a clergyman, would officiate as tutor. At the age of fifteen he was sent to Oxford. Five years of assiduous study made him proficient as a tutor. This, combined with his amiability and profound views of society, gained him the respect of the Earl of Devonshire and he was appointed tutor to the earl's son lord cavendish from sixteen ten to sixteen twenty eight he was constantly in the society of this nobleman in the capacity of secretary in the interval of this time he travelled in france germany and italy cultivating in each capital the society of the leading statesmen and philosophers lord herbert of cherbury the first great English deist, and Ben Jonson, the dramatist, were each his boon companions. 
in the year sixteen twenty eight hobbes again made the tour of the continent for three years with another pupil and became acquainted at pisa with galileo in sixteen thirty one he was entrusted with the education of another youth of the devonshire family and for near five years remained at paris with his pupil hobbes returned to england in sixteen thirty six the troublous politics of this age with its strong party prejudices made england the reverse of a pleasant retirement for either hobbes or his patrons so perceiving the outbreak of the revolution he emigrated to paris there in the enjoyment of the company of gassendi and descartes with the elite of parisian genius he was for a while contented and happy here he engaged in a series of mathematical quarrels which were prolonged throughout the whole of his life on the quadrature of the circle seven years after he was appointed mathematical tutor to the prince of wales afterwards charles the second in sixteen forty two hobbes published the first of his principal works de Cive, or philosophical rudiments concerning government and society it was written to curb the spirit of anarchy, then so rampant in England, by exposing the inevitable results which must of necessity spring from the want of a coherent government amongst a people disunited and uneducated. The principles inculcated in this work were reproduced in the year 1651 in the Leviathan, or the matter, form, and power of a commonwealth, ecclesiastical and civil this along with a treatise on human nature and a small work on the body politic form the groundwork of the selfish schools of moral philosophy as soon as they were published they were attacked by the clergy of every country in europe they were interdicted by the pontiffs of the roman and greek church along with the protestants scattered over europe and the episcopal authorities of england indeed to such an extent did this persecution rise that even the royalist exiles received warning that there was no chance for their ostracism being removed unless the unclean thing hobbes was put away from their midst the young prince intimidated by those ebullitions of vengeance against his tutor was obliged to withdraw his protection from him and the old man then near seventy years of age was compelled to escape from paris by night pursued by his enemies who according to lord clarendon tracked his footsteps from france fortunately for hobbes he took refuge with his old protectors the devonshire family who were too powerful to be wantonly insulted while residing at chatsworth he would no doubt acutely feel the loss of descartes the cardinal de richelieu and gassendi in the place of those men he entered into a warm friendship with cowley the poet selden harvey the discoverer of the circulation of blood charles blunt and the witty sir thomas brown in sixteen fifty four he published a letter upon liberty and necessity this brief tractate is unsurpassed in freethought literature for its clear concise subtle and demonstrative proofs of the self-determining power of the will and the truth of philosophical necessity all subsequent writers on this question have largely availed themselves of hobbes arguments particularly the pamphleteers of socialism it is a fact no less true than strange that communism is derived from the system of hobbes which has always been classed along with that of machiavelli as an apology for despotism the grand peculiarity of hobbes is his method instead of taking speculation and reasoning upon theories he carried out the inductive system of bacon in its entirety reasoning from separate generic facts instead of analogically by this means he narrowed the compass of knowledge and made everything demonstrative that was capable of proof belief was consequently placed upon its proper basis and a rigid analysis separated the boundaries of knowing and being hobbes looked at the great end of existence and embodied it in a double axiom first the desire for self-preservation second to render ourselves happy 
from those duplex principles which are inherent in all animals a modern politician has perpetrated a platitude which represents in a sentence the end and aim of all legislation the greatest happiness for the greatest number this is the ultimatum of hobbes philosophy its method of accomplishment was by treating society as one large family with the educated and skilled as governors having under their care the training of the nation all acting from one impulse self-preservation and by the conjoint experience of all deriving the greatest amount of happiness from this activity hobbes opposed the revolution because it degenerated into a faction and supported charles stuart because there were more elements of cohesion within his own party than amongst his enemies it was here where the cry of despotism arose the roundheads seeing they could not detach the ablest men from the king's party denounced their literary opponents as lovers of belial and of tyranny this was their most effective answer to the leviathan in after years when the episcopal party no longer stood in need of the services of hobbes they heaped upon him the stigma of heresy until his sideviant friends and enemies were united in the condemnation of the man they most feared mr owen in his schema of socialism took his leading idea on non-responsibility from hobbes explanation of necessity and the freedom of the will the old divines had inculcated a doctrine to the effect that the will was a separate entity of the human mind which swayed the whole disposition and was of itself essentially corrupt ample testimony from the bible substantiated this position but in the method of hobbes he lays down the fact that we can have no knowledge without experience and no experience without sensation the mind therefore is composed of classified sensations united together by the law of an association of ideas this law was first discovered by hobbes who makes the human will to consist in the strongest motive which sways the balance on any side this is the simplest explanation which can be given on a subject more mystified than any other in theology a long controversy betwixt bishop bramhall of londonderry followed the publication of hobbes views on liberty and necessity charles the second on his restoration bestowed an annual pension of one hundred pounds on hobbes but this did not prevent the parliament in sixteen sixty six censuring the decive and leviathan besides his other works hobbes also translated the greek historian thucydides homer's odyssey and the iliad the last years of his life were spent in composing behemoth or a history of the civil wars from sixteen forty to sixteen sixty which was finished in the year he died but not published until after his death at the close of the year sixteen seventy nine he was taken seriously ill at the urgent request of some christians they were permitted to intrude their opinions upon his dying bed telling him gravely that his illness would end in death and unless he repented he would go straight to hell hobbes calmly replied i shall be glad then to find a hole to creep out of the world for seventy years he had been a persecuted man but during that time his enemies had paid him that tribute of respect which genius always extorts from society he was a man who was hated and dreaded he had reached the age of ninety-two when he died his words were pregnant with meaning and he never used an unnecessary sentence a collection of moral apothegms might be gathered from his table talk when asked why he did not read every new book which appeared he said if i had read as much as other men i should have been as ignorant his habits were simple he rose early in the morning took a long walk through the grounds of chatsworth and cultivated healthful recreation the after part of the day was devoted to study and composition like sir walter raleigh he was a devoted admirer of the fragrant herb 
Charles II's constant witticism, styled Hobbes as a bear against whom the church played their young dogs in order to exercise them. If there had been a few more similar bears, the priestly dogs would long since have been exterminated, for none of them escaped unhurt from their encounters with the grizzly of Malmesbury, except it was in the mathematical disputes of Dr. Wallace. He was naturally of a timid disposition. This was the result of the accident which caused his premature birth, and being besides of a reserved character, he was ill-fitted to meet the physical rebuffs of the world. It is said that he was so afraid of his personal safety that he objected to be left alone in an empty house. This charge is to some extent true, but we must look to the mitigating circumstances of the case. He was a feeble man, turned the age of threescore and ten, with all the clergy of England hounding on their dupes to murder an old philosopher, because he had exposed their dogmas. It was but a few years before that Protestants and Papists had complimented each other's religion by burning those who were the weakest, and long after Hobbes death protestants murdered ruined disgraced and placed in the pillory dissenters and catholics alike and thomas hobbes had positive proof that it was the intention of the church of england to burn him alive on the stake a martyr for his opinions this then is a sufficient justification for hobbes feeling afraid and instead of it being thrown as a taunt at this illustrious freethinker it is a standing stigma on those who would reenact the tragedy of persecution if public opinion would allow it sir james mackintosh says the style of hobbes is the very perfection of didactic language short clear precise pithy his language never has more than one meaning which never requires a second thought to find by the help of his exact method it takes so firm a hold on the mind that it will not allow attention to slacken his little tract on human nature has scarcely an ambiguous or a needless word he has so great a power of always choosing the most significant term that he never is reduced to the poor expedient of using many in its stead he had so thoroughly studied the genius of the language, and knew so well how to steer between pedantry and vulgarity, that two centuries have not superannuated probably more than a dozen of his words. From the Second Dissertation, Encyclopedia Britannica, page 318. Lord Clarendon describes the personal character of Hobbes as one for whom he always had a great esteem as a man, who, besides his eminent parts of learning and knowledge, hath been always looked upon as a man of probity and a life free from scandal. We now proceed to make a selection of quotations from the works of this writer, commencing with those on the necessity of the will, in reply to Bishop Bramhall the question is not whether a man be a free agent that is to say whether he can write or forbear speak or be silent according to his will but whether the will to write and the will to forbear come upon him according to his will or according to anything else in his own power i acknowledge this liberty that i can do if i will but to say i can will if i will i take to be an absurd speech further replying to bramhall's argument that we do not learn the idea of the freedom of the will from our tutors but we know it intuitively hobbes says it is very true few have learned from tutors that a man is not free to will nor do they find it much in books that they and in books that which the poets chaunt in the theatres and the shepherds on the mountains that which the pastors teach in the churches and the doctors in the universities and that which the common people in the markets and all the people do assent to is the same that i assent to namely that a man hath freedom to do if he will but whether he hath freedom to will is a question which it seems neither the bishop nor they ever thought of 
a wooden top that is lashed by the boys and runs about sometimes to one wall sometimes to another sometimes spinning sometimes hitting men on the shins if it were sensible of its own motion would think it proceeded from its own will unless it felt what lashed it and is a man any wiser when he runs to one place for a benefice to another for a bargain and troubles the world with writing errors and requiring answers because he thinks he does it without other cause than his own will and seeth not what are the lashings which cause that will hobbes casually mentions the subject of praise or dispraise in his reference to the will those who are old enough will remember this was one of the most frequent subjects of discussion amongst the earlier socialists these depend not at all in the necessity of the action praised or dispraised for what is it else to praise but to say a thing is good good i say for me or for somebody else or for the state and commonwealth and what is it to say an action is good but to say it is as i would wish or as another would have it or according to the will of the state that is to say according to the law does my lord think that no action could please me or the commonwealth that should proceed from necessity things may be therefore necessary and yet praiseworthy and also necessary and yet dispraised and neither of them both in vain because praise and dispraise and likewise reward and punishment do by example make and conform the will to good or evil it was a very great praise in my opinion that valerius Paterculus gives cato when he says that he was good by nature et quia alter est non potui and because he could not do otherwise this able treatise was reprinted and extensively read about twenty years ago but like many other of our standard works is at present out of print the leviathan is still readable a bold masculine book it treats everything in a cool analytical style the knife of the socialist is sheathed in vain no rhapsody can overturn its impassioned teachings rhetoric is not needed to embellish the truths he has to portray for the wild flowers of genius but too frequently hide the yawning chasms in the garden of logic it is not to be expected that this book will be read now with the interest with which it was perused two centuries ago then every statement was impugned every argument denied and the very tone of the book called forth an interference from parliament to stop the progress of its heresies now the case is widely different and the general tenor of the treatise is the rule in which are illustrated alike the works of the philosophers and the dreams of the sophists priests we give part of the introduction nature the art whereby god hath made and governs the world is by the art of man as in many other things so in this also imitated that it can make an artificial animal for seeing life is but a motion of limbs the beginning whereof is in some principal part within why may we not say that all automata engines that move themselves by springs and wheels as doth a watch have an artificial life for what is the heart but a spring and the nerves but so many strings and the joints but so many wheels giving motion to the whole body such as was intended by the artificer art goes yet further imitating that rational and most excellent work of nature man for by art is created that great leviathan called a commonwealth or state which is but an artificial man though of greater stature and strength than the natural for whose protection and defence it was intended and the sovereignty of which is an artificial soul as giving life and motion to the whole body to describe the nature of this artificial man i will consider first the matter therefore and the artificer both which is man second how and by what covenants it is made 
what are the rights and just power of authority of a sovereign and what it is that preserveth and dissolveth it third what is a christian commonwealth lastly what is the kingdom of darkness the first chapter treats of senses concerning the thoughts of man i will consider them first singly and afterwards in train or dependence upon one another singly they are every one a representation or appearance of some quality or accident of a body without us which is commonly called an object which object worketh on the eyes ears and other parts of a man's body and by diversity of working produceth diversity of appearances the original of them all is that which we call sense for there is no conception in a man's mind which hath not at first totally or by parts been begotten unto the organs of sense the rest are derived from that original speaking of imagination hobbes says that when a thing lies still unless somewhat else stir it it will lie still for ever is a truth no one doubts of but that when a thing is in motion it will eternally be in motion unless somewhat else stay it though the reason be the same namely that nothing can change itself is not so easily assented to for men measure not only other men but all other things by themselves and because they find themselves subject after motion to pain and lassitude think everything else grows weary of motion and seeks repose of its own accord little considering whether it be not some other motion wherein that desire of rest they find in themselves consisteth when a body is once in motion it moveth unless something else hinder it eternally and whatsoever hindereth it cannot in an instant but in time and by degrees quite extinguish it and as we see in the water though the wind cease the waves give not over rolling for a long time after so also it happeneth in that motion which is made of the internal parts of man then when he sees dreams etc for after the object is removed or the eye shut we still retain an image of the thing seen though more obscure than when we see it the decay of sense in men waking is not the decay of the motion made in sense but an obscuring of it in such manner as the light of the sun obscureth the light of the stars which stars do no less exercise their virtue by which they are visible in the day than in the night but because amongst many strokes which our eyes ears and other organs receive from external bodies the predominant only is sensible therefore the light of the sun being only predominant we are not affected with the actions of the stars this decaying sense when we would express the thing itself i mean fancy itself we call imagination as i said before but when we would express the decay and signify the senses fading old and past it is called memory so that imagination and memory are but one thing which for diverse considerations hath diverse names such is the commencement of this celebrated book it is based upon materialism every argument must stand this test upon hobbes principles and characteristically are they elaborated hobbes de Sieve says of the immortality of the soul it is a belief grounded upon other men's sayings that they knew it supernaturally or that they knew those who knew them that knew others that knew it supernaturally a sparkling sneer and perhaps the truest answer to so universal an error dugald stuart in his analysis of the works of hobbes says the fundamental doctrines inculcated in the political works of hobbes are contained in the following propositions all men are by nature equal and prior to government they had all an equal right to enjoy the good things of this world man too is by nature a solitary and purely selfish animal 
the social union being entirely an interested league suggested by prudential views of personal advantage the necessary consequence is that a state of nature must be a state of perpetual warfare in which no individual has any other means of safety than his own strength or ingenuity and in which there is no room for regular industry because no secure enjoyment of its fruits in confirmation of this view of the origin of society hobbes appeals to facts falling daily within the cycle of our experience does not a man he asks when taking a journey arm himself and seek to go well accompanied when going to sleep does he not lock his doors nay even in his own house does he not lock his chests does he not there accuse mankind by his actions as i do by my words for the sake of peace and security it is necessary that each individual should surrender a part of his natural right and be contented with such a share of liberty as he is willing to allow to others or to use hobbes own language every man must divest himself of the right he has to all things by nature the right of all men to all things being in effect no better than if no man had a right to anything in consequence of this transference of natural rights to an individual or to a body of individuals the multitude become one person under the name of a state or republic by which person the common will and power are exercised for the common defence the ruling power cannot be withdrawn from those to whom it has been committed nor can they be punished for misgovernment the interpretation of the laws is to be sought not from the comments of philosophers but from the authority of the ruler otherwise society would every moment be in danger of resolving itself into the discordant elements of which it was first composed the will of the magistrate therefore is to be regarded as the ultimate standard of right and wrong and his voice to be listened to by every citizen as the voice of conscience leviathan edition sixteen fifty one from the dissertation on the progress of ethical science page forty one such are the words of one of hobbes most powerful opponents dr warburton says the philosopher of malmesbury was the terror of the last age as tyndall and collins are of this the press sweats with controversy and every young churchman militant would try his arms in thundering on hobbes steel cap this is a modest acknowledgment of the power of hobbes from the most turbulent divine of the eighteenth century victor comian gives the following as his view of the philosophy of hobbes there is no other certain evidence than that of the senses the evidence of the senses attests only the existence of bodies then there is no existence save that of bodies and philosophy is only the science of bodies there are two sorts of bodies first natural bodies which are the theatre of a multitude of regular phenomena because they take place by virtue of fixed laws as the bodies with which physics are occupied second moral and political bodies societies which constantly change and are subject to variable laws hobbes system of physics is that of democritus the atomistic and corpuscular of the ionic school his metaphysics are its corollary all the phenomena which pass in the consciousness have their source in the organization of which the consciousness in itself is simply a result all the ideas come from the senses to think is to calculate and the intelligence is nothing else than an arithmetic as we do not calculate without signs we do not think without words the truth of the thought is in the relation of the words among themselves and metaphysics are reduced to a perfect language hobbes is completely a nominalist with hobbes there are no other than contingent ideas the finite alone can be conceived the infinite is only a negation of the finite beyond that it is a mere word invented to honor a being whom faith alone can reach the idea of good and evil has no other foundation than agreeable or disagreeable sensations 
to agreeable or disagreeable sensation it is impossible to apply any other law than escape from the one and search after the other hence the morality of hobbes which is the foundation of his politics man is capable of enjoying and of suffering his only law is to suffer as little and enjoy as much as possible since such is his only law he has all the rights that this law confers upon him he may do anything for his preservation and his happiness he has the right to sacrifice everything to himself behold then men upon this earth where the objects of desire are not superabundant all possessing equal rights to whatever may be agreeable or useful to them by virtue of the same capacity for enjoyment and suffering this is a state of nature which is nothing less than a state of war the anarchy of the passions a combat in which every man is arrayed against his neighbor but this state being opposed to the happiness of the majority of individuals who share it utility the offspring of egotism itself demands its exchange for another to wit the social state the social state is the institution of a public power stronger than all individuals capable of making peace succeed war and imposing on all the accomplishment of whatever it shall have judged to be useful that is just before we dismiss the father of free thought from our notice there remains a tribute of respect to be paid to one whom it is our duty to associate with the author of the leviathan and who has but just passed away one man amongst the british aristocracy with the disposition of a tribune of the people coupled with thoughts at once elevated and free and a position which rendered him of essential service to struggling opinion this man saw the greatness the profound depth the attic style and the immense importance of the works of hobbes along with their systematic depreciation by those whose duty it should be to explain them especially at a time when those works were not reprinted and the public were obliged to glean their character from the refutations so called by mangled quotations and a distorted meaning impelled by this thought and anxious to protect the memory of a philosopher his devoted disciple at a cost of ten thousand pounds translated the latin and edited the english works of hobbes in a manner noteworthy alike of the genius of the author and the discernment of his editor for this kindness a seat in parliament was lost by the organization of the clergy in cornwall the name of this man was sir william molesworth let freethinkers cherish the memory of their benefactor we now take our leave of thomas hobbes he had not the chivalry of herbert the vivacity of raleigh the cumulative power of bacon or the winning policy of locke if his physical deformities prevented him from being as daring as vain he was as bold in thought and expression as either descartes or his young friend blount he gave birth to the brilliant constellation of genius in the time of queen anne he did not live to see his system extensively promulgated but his principles moulded the character of the men who formed the revolution of sixteen eighty eight equally as much as hume established the scotch and german schools of philosophy and voltaire laid the train by which the french revolution was proclaimed peace to his memory it was a stormy struggle during his life its frowns cannot hurt him now could we believe in the idea of a future life we should invoke his blessings on our cause that cause which for near two hundred years has successfully struggled into birth to youth and maturity striking down in its onward course superstitions which hath grown with centuries and where it does not exterminate them it supplies a purer atmosphere and extracts the upper sting which has laid low so many and which must yet be finally exterminated the day is rapidly dawning when our only deities will be the works of genius and our only prayer the remembrance of our most illustrious chiefs End of section one of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Read for you by Ted DeLorme.
Chapter Two of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Chapter Two. Lord Bolingbroke. Henry St. John, Lord Bolingbroke, was born in his family seat at Battersea, on the 1st of October, 1672, and died there on November 15, 1751, in his 79th year. He was educated by a clergyman in an unnatural manner, and speedily developed himself accordingly. When he left Oxford, he was one of the handsomest men of the day his majestic figure refined address dazzling wit and classic eloquence made him irresistibly the first gentleman of europe until his twenty-fourth year he was renowned more for the graces of his person and the fascination of his wild exploits rather than possessing a due regard to his rank and abilities his conduct however was completely changed when he became a member of parliament the hopes of his friends were resuscitated when they discovered the aptitude for business the ready eloquence and the sound reasoning of the once wild st john he soon became the hardest worker and the leader of the house of commons the expectations of the nation rose high when night after night he spoke with the vivacity of a poet and the profundity of a veteran statesman on public affairs in 1704 he received the seals as secretary of war and was mainly instrumental in gaining marlborough's victories by the activity with which he supplied the english general with munitions of war on the ascendancy of the whigs st john resigned his office and retired into privacy for two years when the whig administration was destroyed and st john reappeared as secretary for foreign affairs his greatest work now was the negotiation of the treaty of utrecht this treaty was signed by st john then lord bolingbroke he being sent to paris as the british plenipotentiary and was hailed by the parisians as a guardian angel to such an extent was this feeling manifested that when he visited the theatres every one rose to welcome him so long as Queen Anne lived, Bolingbroke's influence was paramount, but associated with him was the Earl of Oxford, in opposition to the Whig party, and serious differences had arisen between the rivals. Oxford was dismissed four days before the Queen's death, and Bolingbroke officiated in his place, until Oxford's vacancy was filled, which all expected would be given to himself a stormy debate in the privy council so agitated the queen that it shortened her life and the council recommended the earl of shrewsbury as premier and with him the whigs with the accession of george came the impeachment of bolingbroke by the victorious whigs knowing that it was their intention to sacrifice him to party revenge and that his accusers would likewise act as his judges he wisely withdrew himself to france the pretender held a mimic court at Avignon, and a debating society at Lorraine, entitled a Parliament. He offered Bolingbroke the office of Secretary of State, which was accepted by him, and it was only at this time that the emanations of the exiled Stuart's cabinet possessed either a solidarity of aim or a definite purpose. If Louis the Fourteenth had lived longer, he might have assisted the pretender, but with his death expired the hopes of that ill-fated dynasty bolingbroke strove to husband the means which the chevalier's friends had collected but the advice of the duke of ormond was listened to in preference to bolingbroke's the results which bolingbroke foretold proceeding rashly and failing ignominiously both occurred the insurrection broke out and failed no other end could have been anticipated intrigues were fast coiling themselves around the secretary he was openly blamed for the reverses in Scotland, but he was alike careless of their wrath or its issue. One morning Ormond waited upon him with two slips of paper from the pretender, informing him that his services were no longer required. After his dismissal he was impeached by the lackeys of the pretender under seven heads, which were widely distributed throughout Europe. There is this anomaly in the life of Bolingbroke, witnessed in no other Englishman in one year he was the most powerful man in england secretary of state an exile 
and then in the same year he occupied a similar office to one who aimed at the english throne and was impeached by both parties for several years he occupied himself in france with philosophical pursuits until the year seventeen twenty three when he received a pardon which allowed him to return to england but still his sequestered estates were not returned and this apology for a pardon was negotiated by a bribe of eleven thousand pounds to the german duchess of kendal one of the king's mistresses alexander pope was bolingbroke's constant correspondent pope had won the applause of england by his poems and was then considered the arbiter of genius voltaire occupied a similar position in france since pope first laid the copy of his greatest epic at the feet of bolingbroke and begged of him to correct its errors he had gradually won himself that renown which prosperity has endorsed but what a unity in divergence did those philosophers present the calm moralism of pope his sweet and polished rhyme contrasted with the fiery wit and hissing sarcasm of the frenchman more trenchant than pope's yet wanting his sparkling epigrams the keen discernment of both these men saw in bolingbroke a master and they ranked by his side as twin apostles of a new and living faith it was the penetration of true greatness which discerned in the english peer that sublimity of intellect they possessed themselves without the egotism of an imbecile rival bolingbroke had cherished the ethics of one and restrained the rancor of the other and both men yielded to him whose system they worshipped and this trinity of deists affords the noblest example which can be evoked to prove the harmony of reason amidst the most varied accomplishments although pope's name occurs but seldom in the history of free thought while that of bolingbroke is emblazoned in all its glory and voltaire is enshrined as its only deity yet we must not forget that what is now known as the only collection of st john's works the edition in five volumes by mallet were written for the instruction of pope sent to him in letters discussed and agreed to by him so that the great essayist is as much implicated in them as the author of the dictionary it is said in his society these two illustrious men felt and acknowledged a superior genius and if he had no claim to excellence in poetry the art in which they were so preeminent he surpassed them both in the philosophy they so much admired for ten years after this period he devoted himself to various political writings which were widely circulated but we must waive the pleasure at present of analyzing those and confine our attention to the alliance between pope and bolingbroke in the new school of philosophy bolingbroke's principal friends were pope swift mallet wyndham and atterbury the first three were most in his confidence in regard to religion and although pope was educated a roman catholic and occasionally conformed to that hierarchy and like voltaire for peace died in it yet the philosophical letters which passed between pope and st john fully established him as a consistent deist an honor to which swift also attained although being a dignitary of the church but if doubts arise on the subject they can easily be dispelled. General Grimoire, in his Essai sur Bolingbroke, said that he was intimate with the widow of Mallet, the poet, who was a lady of much talent and learning, and had lived upon terms of friendship with Bolingbroke, Swift, Pope, and many other distinguished characters of the day, who frequently met at her house the general adds that the lady has been frequently heard to declare that these men were all equally deistical in their sentiments que c'était une société de pure deistes that swift from his clerical character was a little more reserved than the others but he was evidently of the same sentiments at bottom there is a remarkable passage in one of pope's letters to swift which seems rather corroborative of the general's he is inviting swift to come and visit him the day is come he says which i have often wished but never thought to see when every mortal i esteem is of the same sentiments in politics and religion dr wharton remarks upon this paragraph at this time therefore seventeen thirty three he pope and bolingbroke were of the same sentiment in religion as well as politics and pope 
writing to swift is proof sufficient that bolingbroke swift and himself were united in opinions wherever swift's name is known it is associated with his spleen on account of his not being elevated to the episcopal bench when he was promised a vacancy which was reserved for him but queen anne absolutely refused to confer such a dignity upon the author of gulliver's travels that profound satire upon society and religion and this occurring at a time when his energetic services were so much needed in defense of the government he so assisted by pamphleteering satire and wholesale lampoons mr cook says the earl of nottingham in the debate upon the dissenters bill chiefly founded his objection to the provision that the bishop should have the only power of licensing tutors upon the likelihood there was that a man who was in a fair way for becoming a bishop was hardly suspected of being a christian this pointed allusion to swift passed without comment or reply in a public assembly composed in a great measure of his private friends and associates this seems to intimate that the opinion of his contemporaries was not very strong in favor of swift's religious principles this may suffice to prove the unanimity of sentiment existing among this brilliant coterie one a political churchman another the greatest poet of his age the third the most accomplished statesman of his country although they were united in religious conviction it would have been certain ruin to any of the confederates if the extent of their thoughts had reached the public ear the dean wrote for the present the poet for his age and the peer for the immediate benefit of his friends and a record for the future but they were all agreed that some code of ethics should be promulgated which should embody the positive speculations of bolingbroke with the easy grace of pope the elaborate research of the philosopher with the rhetoric of the poet swift coalesced in this idea but was to a certain extent ignorant of its subsequent history it was not thought prudent to trust mallet and others with the secret for this purpose the essay of man was designed on the principles elaborated by bolingbroke in his private letters to pope it was bolingbroke who drew up the scheme mapped out the arguments and sketched the similes it was pope who embellished its beauties and turned it into rhyme dr wharton the editor of pope also proves this lord bathurst told the doctor that he had read the whole of the essay on man in the handwriting of bolingbroke and drawn up in a series of propositions which pope was to amplify versify and to illustrate if further proofs are required that bolingbroke was not only a co-partner but coadjutor with pope it is found in the opening of the poem where the poet uses the plural in speaking of bolingbroke awake my saint john leave all meaner things to low ambition and the pride of kings laugh when we must be candid when you can and vindicate the ways of god to man cook's life of bolingbroke second volume page ninety seven this is sufficient to prove the partnership in the poem and from the generally acknowledged fact of his connection we have no hesitation in declaring that this poem is the grand epic of deism and is as much the offspring of bolingbroke as his own ideas when enunciated by others there is not a single argument in the essay but what is much more elaborated in the works of bolingbroke while every positive argument is reduced to a few poetic maxims in the essay we may as well look here for bolingbroke's creed rather than amongst his prose work there is however this difference that in the essay there is laid down an ethical scheme of positivism i e of everything in morals which can be duly tested and nothing more while in the prose writings of bolingbroke the negative side of theology is discussed with an amount of erudition which has never been surpassed by any of the great leaders of free thought the first proposition of the essay is based on a postulate upon which the whole reasoning is built overthrow this substratum and the philosophy of the essay is overturned admit it and its truth is evidence it is what can we reason but from what we know this is equivalent to saying that we can only reason concerning man as a finite part of an infinite existence 
and we can only predicate respecting what comes under the category of positive knowledge we are therefore disabled from speculating in any theories which have for a basis opposition to the collected experience of mankind this was a position laid down by bolingbroke to escape all the historical arguments which some men deduce from alleged miraculous agency in the past or problematical prophecy in the future it likewise shows the untenable nature of all analogy which presumes to trace an hypothetical first cause or personal intelligence to account for a supposed origin of primeval existence by which nature was caused or forms of being first evolved although it may be deemed inconsistent with the philosophy of bolingbroke to admit a god in the same argument as the above we must not forget that in all speculative reasoning there must be an assumption of some kind which ought to be demonstrated by proof or a suitable equivalent in the form of universal consent yet in the case of the god of the essay we look in vain for the attributes with which theists love to clothe their god we can but perceive inexorable necessity in the shape of rigid and unswerving laws collected in one focus by pope and dignified with the name of god so that the difference betwixt a deist of old and an atheist of the modern school is one of mere words they both commence with an assumption the atheist only defining his terms more strictly the subject matter in both instances being the same the only difference being the one deceives himself with a meaningless word the other is speechless on what he cannot comprehend the essay shows a scheme of universal gradation composed of a series of links which are one intertwined within the other every rock being placed in its necessitated position every plant amidst its growth bearing an exoteric similitude to itself every animal from the lowest quadruped to the highest race of man occupying a range of climate adapted to its requirements the essay here is scientifically correct and agrees with the ablest writers on necessity a german philosopher renowned alike for rigid analysis and transcendent abilities as a successful theorist observes when i contemplate all things as a whole i perceive one nature one force when i regard them as individuals many forces which develop themselves according to their inward laws and pass through all the forms of which they are capable and all the objects in nature are but those forces under certain limitations every manifestation of every individual power of nature is determined partly by itself partly by its own preceding manifestations and partly by the manifestations of all other powers of nature with which it is connected but it is connected with all for nature is one connected whole its manifestations are therefore strictly necessary and it is absolutely impossible to be other than as it is in every moment of her duration nature is one connected whole in every moment must every individual be what it is because all others are what they are and a single grain of sand could not be moved from its place without however imperceptibly to us changing something throughout all parts of the immeasurable whole every moment of duration is determined by all past moments and will determine all future moments and even the position of a grain of sand cannot be conceived other than it is without supposing other changes to an indefinite extent let us imagine that grain of sand to be lying some few feet further inland than it actually does then must the storm wind that drove it in from the seashore have been stronger than it actually was then must the preceding state of the atmosphere by which this wind was occasioned and its degree of strength being determined have been different from what it actually was and the preceding changes which gave rise to this particular weather and so on we must suppose a different temperature from that which really existed a different constitution of bodies which influenced that temperature 
how can we know that in such a state of weather we have been supposing in order to carry this grain of sand a few yards further some ancestors of yours might not have perished from hunger cold or heat long before the birth of that son from whom you are descended and thus you might never have been at all and all that you have done and all that you ever hope to do must have been hindered in order that a grain of sand might lie in a different place the whole of the first book is devoted to the necessitated condition of man in relation to the universe in one portion there is a succession of beautiful similes portraying the blissful state we are in instead of being gifted with finer sensibilities or a prescience which would be a curse fix destination of man page eight and nine pope although an ardent disciple of bolingbroke did not entirely forsake the prejudices of childhood he still indulged in a bare hope of a future life which his master with more consistency suppressed so that when the poet rhymed the propositions of st john he pointed them with hope in an eternal future for that speculation which was still probability in his day is now nearly silenced by modern science but we must not confound the ideas of futurity which some of the deists expressed with those of christianity they were as different as the dreams of christ and plato were dissimilar pope hoped for a future life of intellectual enjoyment devoid of evil but the heaven of the gospel is equally as necessary to be counterbalanced by a hell as the existence of a god requires the balancing support of a devil we therefore can sympathize with the description of a heaven the poor indian looked for some safer world in depths of woods embraced some happier island in the watery waste where slaves once more their native land behold nor fiends torment nor christians thirst for gold to be contents his natural desires he asks no angels wings no seraphs fires but thinks admitted to that equal sky his faithful dog should bear him company pope durst not emphatically deny the future life theory so he attacked it by elaborating a physical instead of a spiritual heaven so heterodox a notion of the indian's future sports is not to be found in theology especially as he pictures the indian sports with his dog here was a double blow aimed at christianity by evolving a positive idea of future pleasures and the promulgation of sentiments anti-christian again he attacks them for unwarrantable speculation in theology when he says in pride in reasoning pride our error lies this is a corollary to the first proposition what can we reason but from what we know the only predicate we can draw from this is the undoubted fact we have no right to profess to hold opinions of that upon which we cannot have any positive proof the last line of the first book has been generally thought open to attack it relates to necessity whatever is is right and is not to be viewed in relation to society as at present constituted but to the physical universe the second book deals with man in relation to himself as an individual the third as a member of society and the last in respect to happiness throughout the whole essay the distinctions arising from nature and instinct are defined and defended with vigour and acuteness both are proved to be equally great in degree in spite of the hints constantly thrown out in reference to godlike reason versus blind instinct we confess our inability to discern the vaunted superiority of the powers of reason over those of its blinder sister we see in the one matchless wisdom profound decision unfailing resource a happy contentment as unfeigned as it is natural on the other hand we see temerity allied with cowardice a man seeking wisdom on a watery plank when every footmark may serve him for a funeral effigy political duplicity arising from his confined generalization of facts a desire to do right but checked by accident and cunning everywhere uneasy always fatal 
if the christians fables were true we might say that adam and eve were originally in possession of instinct and reason and fell by listening to the promptings of volition instead of the unswerving powers of the brutes and for a hereditary punishment was cursed with a superabundance of reason for with all our intellectual prerogatives we have yet failed to arrive at a definite course of action which should influence our conduct the essay speaking of government by christianity says force first made conquest and that conquest law till superstition taught the tyrant awe she taught the weak to bend the proud to pray to power unseen and mightier far than they she from the rending earth and bursting skies saw gods descend and fiends infernal rise here fixed the dreadful there the blessed abodes here made her devils and weak hope her gods gods partial changeful passionate unjust whose attributes were rage revenge or lust such as the souls of cowards might conceive and formed like tyrants tyrants would believe zeal then not charity became the guide and hell was built in spite and heaven in pride and again for modes of faith let graceless zealots fight his can't be wrong whose life is in the right the essay concludes with an invocation to bolingbroke whom pope styles my guide philosopher and friend such is the conclusion of the most remarkable ethical poem in any language it is the iliad of english deism not a single allusion to christ a future state of existence given only as a faint probability the whole artificial state of society satirized prayer ridiculed and government of every kind denounced which does not bring happiness to the people the first principle laid down is the cornerstone of materialism what can we reason but from what we know which is stated explained and defended with an axiomatic brevity rarely equalled never surpassed with a number of illustrations comprising the chef d'oeuvre of poetic grace and synthical memory combined with arguments as cogent as the examples are perfect it stands alone in its impregnability a pile of literary architecture like the novum organon of bacon the principia of newton or the essay of locke the facades of its noble colonnades are seen extending their wings throughout the whole sweep of history constituting a pantheon of morals where every nation sends its devotees to admire and worship let us now turn to the philosophical works of bolingbroke by the will of bolingbroke he devised this portion of his manuscripts to david mallet the poet for publication the noble lord's choice is open to censure here he knew the character of mallet and could expect little justice from him who should have been his biographer the manuscripts were all prepared for the press long before bolingbroke died in this original state they were addressed to pope when published they appeared as letters or essays addressed to alexander pope esq the political friends of st john wished their suppression fearing that they would injure his reputation by being anti-christian a large bribe was offered by lord cornber if mallet would destroy the works he no doubt thinking more money could be made by their publication issued them to the world in seventeen fifty four but without giving a biography or notes to the books his work being simply correcting the errors of the press true there existed no stipulation that he should write the life of bolingbroke but no one can doubt that such was the intention of the statesman when he bequeathed to him property which realized ten thousand pounds in value every one knows the huge witticism of dr johnson who accused bolingbroke of cowardice under the simile of loading a blunderbuss and then leaving a scotchman half a crown to fire it when he was out of the way when those posthumous works appeared the grand jury of westminster presented them to the judicial authorities as subversive of religion morality and government they were burnt by the common hangman 
with difficulty we give a quotation from bolingbroke's ideas of a future life in volume four page three forty eight he says i do not say that to believe in a future state is to believe in a vulgar error but this i say it cannot be demonstrated by reason it is not in the nature of it capable of demonstration and no one ever returned that irremediable way to give us an assurance of the fact again he speaks personally in reference to himself pope and wollaston whom he had been opposing he alone is happy and he is truly so who can say welcome life whatever it brings welcome death whatever it is if the former we change our state that you or i or even wollaston himself should return to the earth from whence we came to the dirt under our feet or be mingled with the ashes of those herbs and plants from which we drew nutrition whilst we lived does not seem any indignity offered to our nature since it is common to all the animal kind and he who complains of it as such does not seem to have been set by his reasoning faculties so far above them in life as to deserve not to be levelled with them at death we were like them before our birth that is nothing so we shall be on this hypothesis like them too after our death that is nothing what hardship is done us unless it be a hardship that we are not immortal because we wish to be so and flatter ourselves with that expectation if this hypothesis were true which i am far from assuming i should have no reason to complain though having tasted existence i might abhor nonentity since then the first cannot be demonstrated by reason nor the second be reconciled to my inward sentiment let me take refuge in resignation at the last as in every other act of my life let others be solicitous about their future state and frighten or flatter themselves as prejudice imaginative bad health nay a lowering day or a clear sunshine shall inspire them to do let the tranquillity of my mind rest on this immovable rock that my future as well as my present state are ordered by an almighty creator and that they are equally foolish and presumptuous who make imaginary excursions into futurity and who complain of the present lord bolingbroke died in the year seventeen fifty one after a long and painful illness occasioned by the ignorance of a quack while lying on his deathbed he composed a discourse entitled considerations on the state of the nation he died in peace in the knowledge of the truth of the principles he had advocated and with that calm serenity of mind which no one can more fully experience than the honest freethinker he was buried in the church at battersea he was a man of the highest rank of genius far from being immaculate in his youth brave sincere a true friend possessed of rich learning a clear and sparkling style a great wit and the most powerful freethinker of his age end of chapter two lord bolingbroke recorded for you by ted delorme Chapter Three of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Chapter Three. Condorcet in the history of the french revolution we read of a multitude of sections each ruled by a man and each man representing a philosophy not that each man was the contriver of a system but the effervescence of one as true as robespierre was the advocate of rousseau as marat was the wilkes of paris as danton was the Paine, and mirabeau the expediency politician of reflex england so true is it that condorcet was the type of the philosophic girondists the offspring of voltaire the two great schools of metaphysics fought out the battle on the theatre of the constituent assembly in a spirit as bitterly uncompromising as when under different phraseological terms they met in the arguments of the schoolmen or further in the womb of history on the forum of athens 
it is a fact no less true than singular that after each mental excitement amongst the savants whether in ancient or in modern times after the literary shock has passed away the people are inoculated with the strife and destitute of the moderation of their leaders fight for that doctrine which they conceive oppresses their rights the french revolution was one of those struggles it gave rise to epoch men not men who originated a doctrine but those who attempted to carry it out condorcet was one of those men he was the successor of voltaire in the encyclopedic warfare the philosopher amongst the orators destitute of the amazing versatility of the sage of finet he imbibed the prophet's antipathy to superstition and after a brilliant career fell in the wild onslaught of passion the revolution was the arena on which was fought the battle involving the question whether europe was to be ruled for a century by christianity or infidelity the irresolution of robespierre lost to us the victory of the first passage of arms equally as decisive as lafayette in eighteen thirty and lamartine in eighteen forty eight being liberals lost in each case the social republic by their vacillating policy the true freethinkers of that age were the girondists with their heroic death the last barrier to despotism disappeared the consulate became the only logical path for gilded chains and empire with the ostracism of the republicans by napoleon the little a parallel is completed between the two eras of french history the family name of condorcet was caritat his father was a scion of an aristocratic family and an officer in the army the son who gave honor to the family was born in the year seventeen forty three at ribemont in picardy his father dying early left his son to be educated with his wife under the guardianship of his brother the bishop of lisieux a celebrated jesuit the mother of condorcet was extremely superstitious and in one of her fanatic ecstasies offered up her son at the shrine of the virgin mary how this act was performed we cannot relate but it is a notorious fact that until his twelfth year the embryo philosopher was clothed in female attire and had young ladies for companions which m arago says accounts for many peculiarities in the physique and the morale of his manhood the abstinence from all rude boyish sports checked the proper muscular development of his limbs the head and trunk were on a large scale but the legs were so meagre that they seemed unfit to carry what was above them and in fact he never could partake in any strong exercises or undergo the bodily fatigues to which healthy men willingly expose themselves on the other hand he had imbibed the tenderness of a delicate damsel retaining to the last a deep horror for affliction of pain on the inferior animals in seventeen seventy five he entered the jesuit academy at rieris three years afterwards he was transferred to the college of navarre in paris and soon made himself the most distinguished scholar there his friends wished him to enter the priesthood not knowing that even in his seventeenth year he had embraced the deism of the age at the age of nineteen he left college and immediately published a series of mathematical works which established his fame shortly after this the academy of sciences chose condorcet for their assistant secretary in the year seventeen seventy he accompanied d'alembert on a tour through italy making a call for some weeks at ferney where he was delighted with the company of voltaire and was duly recognized as one of the encyclopedists and on his return to paris became the literary agent of his great leader a quarterly reviewer writing on voltaire and condorcet says of the former when he himself in these latter days was resolved to issue anything that he knew and felt to be pregnant with combustion he never dreamt of paris he had agents enough in other quarters and the anonymous or pseudonymous mischief was printed at london amsterdam or hamburg from a fifth or sixth copy in the handwriting of some dutch or english clerk thence by cautious steps smuggled into france and then disavowed and denounced by himself and for him by his numberless agents 
with an intrepid assurance which down to the last confounded and baffled all official inquisitors until in each separate case the scent had got cold therefore he sympathized not at all with any of these his subalterns when they in their own proper matters allowed themselves a less guarded style of movement on one occasion condorcet's imprudence extorts a whole series of passionate remonstrance from him and his probable complaints but the burden is always the same tolerate the whispers of age how often shall i have to tell you all that no one but a fool will publish such things unless he has two hundred thousand bayonets at his back each encyclopedist was apt to forget that though he corresponded familiarly with frederick he was not a king of prussia and by and by not one of them more frequently made this mistake than condorcet for that gentleman's saint-like tranquillity of demeanour though it might indicate a naturally languid pulse covered copious elements of vital passion the slow wheel could not resist the long attrition of controversy and when it once blazed the flame was all the fiercer for its unseen nursing you mistake condorcet said d'alembert he is a volcano covered with snow when Turgot became minister of marine he gave condorcet a post as inspector of canals from this he was subsequently promoted to the inspector of the mint when Turgot was replaced by Necker, Condorcet resigned his office. In 1782 he was elected one of the forty of the Academy of Sciences, beating the astronomer Bailey by one vote. In the next year d'Alembert, his faithful friend, died, leaving him the whole of his wealth. His uncle, the bishop, likewise died in the same year, from whom he would receive a fresh accession of property shortly after this time condorcet married madame de grouchy also celebrated as a lady of great beauty good fortune and an educated atheist the marriage was a happy one the only offspring was a girl who married general arthur o'connor uncle to the late fergus o'connor an irish refugee who was connected with emmett's rebellion during the excitement of the american war of independence condorcet took an active part in urging the french government to bestow assistance in arms and money upon the united states after the war was concluded he corresponded with thomas paine who gradually converted him to the extreme republican views the illustrious needleman himself possessed which in this case rapidly led to the denouement of seventeen ninety one when he was elected a member of the legislative assembly by the department of paris in the next year he was raised to the rank of president by a majority of near one hundred votes while in the assembly he brought forward and supported the economical doctrines of adam smith proposed the abolition of indirect taxation and levying a national revenue upon derivable wealth in amount according to the individual passing over all who gained a livelihood by manual labor he made a motion for the public burning of all documents relating to nobility himself being a marquis he took a conspicuous place in the trial of the king he voted him guilty but refused to vote for his death as the punishment of death was against his principles the speech he made on this occasion is fully equal to that of paine's on the same occasion when the divergence took place between the jacobins and the girondists condorcet strove to unite them but every day brought fresh troubles and the position of the seneca of the revolution was too prominent to escape the opposition of the more violent faction robespierre triumphed and in his success could be traced the doom of his enemies an intercepted letter was the means of condorcet's impeachment deprived of the support of isnard brissot and vergniaud the jacobins proscribed without difficulty the hero whose writings had mainly assisted in producing the revolution his friends provided means for his escape they applied to a lodging-house keeper a madame vernet if she would conceal him for a time she asked was he a virtuous man yes replied his friend he is the stay you say he is a good man i do not wish to pry into his secrets or his name once safe in this asylum he was unvisited by either wife or friends moreover such was the hurry of his flight that he was without money and nearly without books 
while in this forced confinement he wrote the Echi d'un tableau historique des progrès des esprits humains and several other fragmentary essays in this work he lays down a scheme of society similar to the new moral world of robert owen opposing the idea of a god he shows the dominion of science in education political economy chemistry and applies mathematical principles to a series of moral problems along with the progress of man he combined the progress of arts estimating the sanatory arrangements of our time he prophesied on the gradual extension of longevity amongst the human race and with it enjoyments increased by better discipline in gustatorial duties he has similar views on the softer sex to m prudhomme his immediate disciple and in the close of the work condorcet announced the possibility of a universal language which is daily becoming more assimilated to modern ideas the guillotine had not been idle during the few weeks of condorcet's retreat fancying that if discovered he might be the means of injuring his benefactress he resolved to escape from the house of madame Vernet previous to doing this he made his will m arago describing this epoch in his closing days says when he at last paused and the feverish excitement of authorship was at an end our colleague rested all his thoughts anew on the danger incurred by his hostess he resolved then i employ his own words to quit the retreat which the boundless devotion of his tutelar angel had transformed into a paradise he so little deceived himself as to the probable consequences of the step he meditated the chances of safety after his evasion appeared so feeble that before he put his plan into execution he made his last dispositions in the pages then written i behold everywhere the lively reflection of an elevated mind a feeling heart and a beautiful soul i will venture to say that there exists in no language anything better thought more tender more touching more sweetly expressed than the avidun proscrit a sa fille. those lines so limpid so full of unaffected delicacy were written on that very day when he was about to encounter voluntarily an immense danger the presentiment of a violent end almost inevitably did not disturb him his hand traced those terrible words mamor mamor prochain with a firmness that the stoics of antiquity might have envied sensibility on the contrary obtained the mastery when the illustrious proscribed was drawn into the anticipation that madame de condorcet also might be involved in the bloody catastrophe that threatened him should my daughter be destined to lose all this is the most explicit allusion that the husband can insert in his last writing the testament is short it was written on the fly-leaf of a history of spain in it condorcet directs that his daughter in case of his wife's death shall be brought up by madame vernet whom she is to call her second mother and who is to see her so educated as to have means of independent support either from painting or engraving should it be necessary for my child to quit france she may count on protection in england from my lord stanhope and my lord dare in america reliance may be placed on jefferson and bosch the grandson of franklin she is therefore to make the english language her first study such was the last epistle ever written by condorcet notwithstanding the precautions taken by his friends he escaped into the streets from thence having appealed in vain to friends for assistance he visited some quarries here he remained from the fifth to the evening of the seventh of april seventeen ninety four hunger drove him to the village of clamet when he applied at a hostelry for refreshment he described himself as a carpenter out of employment and ordered an omelette this was an age of suspicion and the landlord of the house soon discovered that the wanderer's hands were white and undisfigured with labor while his conversation bore no resemblance to that of a common artificer the good dame of the house inquired how many eggs he would have in his dish twelve was the answer twelve eggs for a joiner's supper this was heresy against the equality of man they demanded his passport he had not got one the only appearance of anything of the sort was a scrap of paper scrawled over with latin epigrams 
this was conclusive evidence to the village dogberries that he was a traitor and an aristocrat the authorities signed the warrant for his removal to paris ironed to two offices they started on the march the first evening they arrived at bourges-lorraine where they deposited their prisoner in the jail of that town in the morning the jailer found him a corpse he had taken poison of great force which he habitually carried in a ring thus ended the life of the great encyclopedist a man great by his many virtues who reflected honor on france by his science his literary triumphs and his moral heroism he had not the towering energy of marat nor the gushing eloquence of danton neither had he the superstitious devotion to abstract ideas which characterized the whole course of robespierre's life the oratory of danton like that of marat only excited the people to dissatisfaction they struck down effete institutions but they were not the men to inaugurate a new society it is seldom we find the pioneers of civilization the best mechanics they strike down the forest they turn the undergrowth they throw a log over the stream but they seldom rear factories or invent tubular bridges amongst the whole of the heroes of the french revolution we must admire the girondists as being the most daring and at the same time the most constructive of all who met either in the constituent assembly or the convention the jacobin faction dealt simply with politics through the abstract notions of rousseau but of what use are human rights if we have to begin de novo to put into operation rather let us unite the conservative educationalism of socialism with the wild democracy of ignorance politics never can be successful unless married to socialism it was not long after condorcet's death before the committee of public instruction undertook the charge of publishing the whole of his works for this they have been censured on many grounds we consider that it was one of the few good things accomplished by that committee there is nothing in the works of this writer which have a distinctive peculiarity to us few great writers who direct opinion at the time they write appear to posterity in the same light as they did to a public inflamed by passion and trembling under reiterated wrongs when we look at the works of dolbach we find a standard treatise which is landmark to the present day but at the time the system of nature was written it had not one tithe the popularity which it now enjoys it did not produce an effect superior to a new sarcasm of voltaire or an epigram of diderot condorcet was rather the co-laborer and literateur of the party than the prophet of the new school voltaire was the christ and condorcet the saint paul of the new faith in political economy the doctrines of the english and scotch schools were elaborated to their fullest extent retrenchment in pensions and salaries diminution of armies equal taxation the resumption by the state of all the church lands the development of the agricultural and mechanical resources and the abolition of the monopolies total free trade local government and national education such were the doctrines for which turgot fought and condorcet popularized if they had been taken in time france would have escaped a revolution and europe would have been ruled by peace and freedom it may be asked who brought about the advocacy of those doctrines for they were not known before the middle of the eighteenth century they were introduced as a novelty and defended as a paradox france had been exhausted by wars annoyed by ennui brilliant above all by her genius she was struck with lassitude for her licentious crimes there was an occasion for a new school without it france like carthage would have bled to death on the hecatomb of her own lust her leading men cast their eyes to england it was then the most progressive nation in existence the leading men of that country were intimate with the rulers of the french the books of each land were read with avidity by their neighbors a difference was observable between the two but how that difference was to be reconciled was past the skills of the wisest to unravel 
england had liberal institutions and a people with part of the substance and many of the forms of liberalism along with a degree of education which kept them in comparative ignorance yet did not offer any obstacles to raising themselves in the social sphere before france could compete with england she had to rid herself of the feudal system and obtain a magna carta she was above four centuries behind hand here she had to win her spurs through revolutions like those of cromwell's and that of sixteen eighty eight and the still greater ones of parliament the free thinkers of england prepared the whig revolution of william by advocating the only scheme which was at the time practicable for of the two the protestant and the catholic religion the former is far more conducive to the liberties of a people than the latter and at the time and we may also say nearer the present the people were not prepared for any organic change this being the case it is not to be wondered at that the french revolution was a failure as a constructive effort it was a success as a grand outbreak of power showing politicians where in the future to rely for success the men who undertook to bring about this revolution are not to be censured for its non-success they wished to copy english institutions and adapt them to those of the french for this purpose the continental league was formed each member of which pledged himself to uproot as far as lay in his power the catholic church in france a secret name was given to it l'enfant and an organized attack was speedily commenced the men at the head of the movement besides voltaire and frederick were d'alembert diderot grimm st lambert condillac helvetius jordan lalande montesquieu and a host of others of less note condorcet being secretary of the academy corresponded with and directed the movements of all in the absence of his chief every new book was criticized refutations were published to the leading theological works of the age but by far the most effective progress was made by the means of poems essays romances epigrams and scientific papers the songs of france at this era were written by the philosophers and this spirit was diffused among the people in a country so volatile and excitable as the french it is difficult to estimate too highly the power of a ballad warfare the morality of abbots and nuns were sung in strains as rhapsodical and couplets as voluptuous as the vagaries of the songs of solomon much discretion was required that no separate species of warfare should be overdone lest a nausea of sentiment should revert upon the authors and thus lead to a reaction more sanguinary than the force of the philosophers could control in all those cases condorcet was the prime mover and the agent concerned he communicated with voltaire on every new theory and advised him when and how to strike and when to rest in all those matters condorcet was obeyed there was a smaller section of the more serious philosophers who sympathized with yet did not labor simultaneously for the common cause those men the extreme atheist clever but cautious men who risked nothing mirabeau and Olbach were the types of this class it is well known that both frederick voltaire and condorcet opposed those sections as likely to be aiming at too much for the time when it was considered prudent to take a more decided step the encyclopedia was formed condorcet had a principal part in this work which shook priestcraft on its throne it spread consternation wherever it appeared and was one of the main causes of the great outbreak no one can sufficiently praise a work of such magnitude nor can any one predicate when its effects will cease in the life of condorcet by arago there is a curious extract copied from a collection of anecdotes said to be compiled from his notebooks and dignified with the title of memoirs de condorcet it relates to a conversation between the abbe galliana and diderot in which it is said condorcet acquiesced the subject is the fair sex diderot how do you define a woman galliana an animal naturally feeble and sick diderot feeble has she not as much courage as a man galliana do you know what courage is it is the effect of terror 
you let your leg be cut off because you are afraid of dying wise people are never courageous they are prudent that is to say poltroons diderot why call you women naturally sick galliana like all animals she is sick until she attains her perfect growth then she has a peculiar symptom which takes up the fifth part of her time then comes breeding and nursing too long and troublesome complaints in short they have only intervals of health until they turn a certain corner and then elles ne sont plus malades de très elles ne sont que de rails diderot observe her at a ball no vigour then monsieur la galliana stop the fiddles put out the lights she will scarcely crawl to her coach diderot see her in love galliana it is painful to see anybody in a fever diderot monsieur l'abbe you have no faith in education galliana not so much as in instinct a woman is habitually ill she is affectionate engaging irritable capricious easily offended easily appeased a trifle amuses her the imagination is always in play fear hope joy despair and disgust follow each other more rapidly are manifested more strongly effaced more quickly than with us they like a plentiful repose at intervals company anything for excitement ask the doctor if it is not the same with his patients but ask yourself do we not all treat them as we do sick people lavish attention soothe flatter caress and get tired of them condorcet in a letter remarking on the above conversation says i do not insist upon it as probable that women will ever be euler or voltaire but i am satisfied that she may one day be pascal or rousseau this very qualification we consider is sufficient to absolve condorcet from the charge of being a woman hater his opponents when driven from every other source have fallen back on this and alleged that he viewed the sexes as unequal and that the stronger had a right to lord it over the weaker but which is the weaker euler and voltaire were masculine men a woman to be masculine in the true sense of the word is an anomaly to be witnessed with pain she is not in a normal condition she is a monster women should live in society fully educated and developed in their physical frame and then they would be more feminine in proportion as they approach the character of mary wollstonecraft they have no right to domineer as tyrants and then fall into the most abject of slaves in each of the characters of pascal and rousseau was an excess of sensibility which overbalanced their other qualities and rendered their otherwise great talents wayward and to a certain extent fruitless the peculiarity of man is physical power and intellectual force that of woman is an acute sensibility condorcet then was justified in expressing the opinions he avowed upon the subject in a paper in the year seventeen sixty six read before the academy on ought popular errors to be eradicated condorcet says if the people are often tempted to commit crimes in order that they may obtain the necessaries of life it is the fault of the laws and as bad laws are the product of errors it would be more simple to abolish those errors than to add others for the correction of their natural effects error no doubt may do some good it may prevent some crimes but it will occasion mischiefs greater than these by putting nonsense into the heads of the people you make them stupid and from stupidity to ferocity there is but a step consider if the motives you suggest for being just make but a slight impression on the mind that will not direct the conduct if the impressions be lively they will produce enthusiasm and enthusiasm for error now the ignorant enthusiast is no longer a man he is the most terrible of wild beasts in fact the number of criminals among the men with prejudices christians is in greater proportion to the total number of our population than the number of criminals in the class above prejudices freethinkers is to the total of that class 
I am not ignorant that, in the actual state of Europe, the people are not, perhaps, at all prepared for a true doctrine of morals, but this degraded obtuseness is the work of social institutions and of superstitions. Men are not born blockheads, they become such. By speaking reason to the people, even in the little time they give to the cultivation of their intellect, we might easily teach them the little that it is necessary for them to know. Even the idea of the respect that they should have for the property of the rich is only difficult to be insinuated among them, first because they look on riches as a sort of usurpation, a theft perpetrated upon them, and unhappily this opinion is in great part true secondly because their excessive poverty makes them always consider themselves in the case of absolute necessity a case in which even very severe moralists have been of their mind thirdly because they are as much despised and maltreated for being poor as they would be after they had lowered themselves by larcenies it is merely therefore because institutions are bad that the people are so commonly a little thievish upon principle we should have much liked to have given some extended quotations from the works of condorcet but owing to their general character we cannot extract any philosophic formula which would be generally interesting his lettres d'un theologian are well deserving of a reprint they created an astounding sensation when they appeared being taken for the work of voltaire the light easy graceful style with deeply concealed irony the crushing retort and the fiery sarcasm they made even priests laugh by their attic wit and incongruous similes but it was in the academy where condorcet's influence was supreme he immortalized the heroes as they fell and pushed the cause on by his professional duties he was always awake to the call of duty and nobly did he work his battery he is now in the last grand sleep of man the flowers of poesy are woven in amaranth wreaths over his tomb end of chapter three read for you by ted delorme Chapter Four of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Four of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Spinoza. Baruch Spinoza, or Espinoza, better known under the name of Benedict Spinoza, as rendered by himself in the Latin language, was born at Amsterdam in Holland, on the 24th of November, 1632. There is some uncertainty as to this date, as there are several dates fixed by different authors, both for his birth and death, but we have adopted the biography given by Dr. C. H. Bruder in the preface to his edition of Spinoza's works his parents were jews of the middle or perhaps somewhat humbler class his father was originally a spanish merchant who to escape persecution had emigrated to holland although the life of our great philosopher is one full of interesting incidents and deserves to be treated fully we have but room to give a very brief sketch referring our readers who may wish to learn more of spinoza's life to levis's biographical history of philosophy westminster review number seventy seven and encyclopedia britannica page one forty four his doctrines we will let speak for themselves in his own words trusting thereby to give the reader an opportunity of knowing who and what spinoza really was one man shrinks with horror from him as an atheist voltaire says that he was an atheist and taught atheism another calls him a god intoxicated man we present him a mighty thinker a master mind a noble fearless utterer of free and noble thoughts a hard-working honest independent man as one who two centuries ago gave forth to the world a series of thinkings which have crushed with resistless force the theological shell in the centre of which the priests hide the kernel truth 
spinoza appears in his boyhood to have been an apt scholar and to have rapidly mastered the tasks set him by his teachers full of rabbinical lore he won the admiration of the rabbi moses mortira but the pupil rose higher than his master and attempted to solve problems which the learned rabbis were content to reverence as mysteries not capable of solution first they remonstrated then threatened still spinoza persevered in his studies and in making known the result to those around him he was threatened with excommunication and withdrew himself from the synagogue one more effort was made by the rabbis who offered spinoza a pension of about one hundred pounds a year if he would attend the synagogue more frequently and consent to be silent with regard to his philosophical thinkings this offer he indignantly refused reason failing threats proving futile and gold being treated with scorn one was found sufficiently fanatic to try a further experiment which resulted in an attempt on spinoza's life the knife however luckily missed its aim and our hero escaped at last in the year sixteen sixty spinoza being then twenty-eight years of age was solemnly excommunicated from the synagogue his friends and relations shut their doors against him an outcast from the home of his youth he gained a humble livelihood by polishing glasses for microscopes telescopes etc at which he was very expert while thus acquiring by his own handiwork the means of subsistence he was studying hard devoting every possible hour to philosophical research spinoza became master of the dutch hebrew german spanish portuguese and latin languages the latter of which he acquired in the house of one francis van den Ende, from whom it is more than probable he received as much instruction in atheism as in latin spinoza only appears to have once fallen in love and this was with van den Ende's daughter who was herself a good linguist and who gave spinoza instruction in latin she however although willing to be his instructress and companion in a philological path declined to accept his love and thus spinoza was left to philosophy alone after his excommunication he retired to rindsburg near the city of leyden in holland and there studied the works of descartes three years afterwards he published an abridgment of the meditations of the great father of philosophy which created a profound sensation in an appendix to this abridgment were contained the germs of those thinkings in which the pupil outdid the master and the student progressed beyond the philosopher in the month of june sixteen sixty four spinoza moved to Warburg, a small village near the hague where he was visited by persons from different parts attracted by his fame as a philosopher and at last after many solicitations he came to the hague and resided there altogether in sixteen seventy he published his tractus theologico politicus this raised him a host of opponents many writers rushed eager for the fray to tilt with the poor dutch jew his book was officially condemned and forbidden and a host of refutations were circulated against it in spite of the condemnation it has outlived the refutations spinoza died on the twenty first or twenty second of february sixteen seventy seven in his forty-fifth year and was buried on the twenty fifth of february at the hague he was frugal in his habits subsisting independently on the earnings of his own hands honorable in all things he refused to accept the chair of professor of philosophy offered to him by the elector and this because he did not wish to be circumscribed in his thinking or in the freedom of utterance of his thoughts he also refused a pension offered to him by louis the fourteenth saying that he had no intention of dedicating anything to that monarch the following is a list of spinoza's works principiorum philosophies renati descartes tractatus theologico politicus ethica tractatus politicus de emandation intellectus epistolae grammaticus hebraque etc 
there are also several spurious works ascribed to spinoza the tractatus politicus has been translated into english by william mccall who seems fully to appreciate the greatness of the philosopher although he will not admit the usefulness of spinoza's logic mccall does not see the utility of that very logic which compelled him to admit spinoza's truth we are not aware of any other translation of spinoza's works except that of a small portion of his ethica by levis this work which was originally published in sixteen seventy seven commenced with eight definitions which together with the following axioms and propositions were reprinted from the westminster review in the library of reason definitions one by cause of itself i understand that the essence of which involves existence or that the nature of which can only be considered as existence two a thing finite is that which can be limited terminari potest by another thing of the same nature ergo body is said to be finite because it can always be conceived as larger so thought is limited by other thoughts but body does not limit thought nor thought limit body three by substance i understand that which is in itself and is conceived per se that is the conception of which does not require the conception of anything else as antecedent to it four by attribute i understand that which the mind perceives as constituting the very essence of substance five by modes i understand the accidents affections of substance or that which is in something else through which it is also conceived six by god i understand the being absolutely infinite that is the substance consisting of infinite attributes each of which expresses an infinite and eternal essence explication i say absolutely infinite but not in suo genere for to whatever is infinite but not in suo genere we can deny infinite attributes but that which is absolutely infinite to its essence pertains everything which implies essence and involves no negation seven that thing is said to be free which exists by the sole necessity of its nature and by itself alone is determined to action but that is necessary or rather constrained which owes its existence to another and acts according to certain and determinate causes eight by eternity i understand existence itself in as far as it is conceived necessarily to follow from the sole definition of an eternal thing axioms one everything which is is in itself or in some other thing two that which cannot be conceived through another per allud must be conceived per se three from a given determinate cause the effect necessarily follows and vice versa if no determinate cause be given no effect can follow four the knowledge of an effect depends on the knowledge of the cause and includes it five things that have nothing in common with each other cannot be understood by means of each other that is the conception of one does not involve the conception of the other six a true idea must agree with its original in nature seven whatever can be clearly conceived as non-existent does not in its essence involve existence propositions one substance is prior in nature to its accidents demonstration per definitions three and five two two substances having different attributes have nothing in common with each other demonstration this follows from definition three for each substance must be conceived in itself and through itself in other words the conception of one does not involve the conception of the other three of things which have nothing in common one cannot be the cause of the other 
demonstration if they have nothing in common then per axiom five they cannot be conceived by means of each other ergo per axiom four one cannot be the cause of the other q e d four two or more distinct things are distinguished among themselves either through the diversity of their attributes or through that of their modes demonstration everything which is in itself or in some other thing per axiom one that is per definition three and five there is nothing out of ourselves extra intellectum outside the intellect but substance and its modes there is nothing out of ourselves whereby things can be distinguished amongst one another except substances or which is the same thing per definition four their attributes and modes five it is impossible that there should be two or more substances of the same nature or of the same attributes demonstration if there are many different substances they must be distinguished by the diversity of their attributes or of their modes per proposition four if only by the diversity of their attributes it is thereby conceded that there is nevertheless only one substance of the same attribute but if their diversity of modes then substance being prior in order of time to its modes it must be considered independent of them that is per definition three and six cannot be conceived as distinguished from another that is per proposition four there cannot be many substances but only one substance q e d six one substance cannot be created by another substance demonstration there cannot be two substances with the same attributes per proposition five that is per proposition two that have anything in common with each other and therefore per proposition three one cannot be the cause of the other corollary one hence it follows that substance cannot be created by anything else for there is nothing in nature except substance and its modes per axiom one and definitions three and five now this substance not being produced by another is self-caused corollary two this proposition is more easily to be demonstrated by the absurdity of its contradiction for if substance can be produced by anything else the conception of it would depend on the conception of the cause per axiom four and hence per definition three it would not be substance seven it pertains to the nature of substance to exist demonstration substance cannot be produced by anything else per corollary one proposition six and is therefore the cause of itself that is per definition one its essence necessarily involves existence or it pertains to the nature of substance to exist q e d eight all substance is necessarily infinite demonstration there exists but one substance of the same attribute and it must either exist as infinite or finite but not finite for per definition two as finite it must be limited by another substance of the same nature and in that case there would be two substances of the same attributes which per prop five is absurd substance therefore is infinite q e d scholium one i do not doubt but that to all who judge confusedly of things and are not wont to inquire into first causes it will be difficult to admit the demonstration of proposition seven because they do not sufficiently distinguish between the modifications of substances and substances themselves and are ignorant of the manner in which things are produced hence it follows that the commencement which they see natural things have they attribute to substances for he who knows not the true cause of thing confounds all things and feigns that trees talk like men that men are formed from stones as well as from seeds and that all forms can be changed into all other forms 
so also those who confound the divine nature with the human naturally attribute human affections to god especially as they are ignorant of how these affections are produced in the mind if men attended to the nature of substance they would not in the least doubt proposition seven nay this proposition would be an axiom to all and would be numbered among common notions for by substance they would understand that which exists in itself and is concerned through itself i e the knowledge which does not require the knowledge of anything as antecedent to it but by modification they would understand that which is in another thing the conception of which is formed by the conception of the thing in which it is or to which it belongs we can have therefore correct ideas of non-existent modifications because although out of the understanding they have no reality yet their essence is so comprehended in that of another that they can be conceived through this other the truth of substance out of the understanding lies nowhere but in itself because it is conceived per se if therefore any one says he has a clear idea of substance and yet doubt whether such substance exist this would be as much as to say that he has a true idea and nevertheless doubts whether it be not false as a little attention sufficiently manifests or if any man affirms substance to be created he at the same time affirms that a true idea has become false than which nothing can be more absurd hence it is necessarily confessed that the existence of substance as well as its essence is an eternal truth and hence we must conclude that there is only one substance possessing the same attribute which requires here a fuller development i note therefore one that the correct definition of a thing includes and expresses nothing but the nature of the thing defined from which follows two that no definition includes or expresses a distinct number of individuals because it expresses nothing but the nature of the thing defined ergo the definition of a triangle expresses no more than the nature of a triangle and not any fixed number of triangles three there must necessarily be a distinct cause for the existence of every existing thing for this cause by reason of which anything exists must either be contained in the nature and definition of the existing thing viz that it pertains to its nature to exist or else must be beyond it must be something different from it as therefore it pertains to the nature of substance to exist so must its definition include a necessary existence and consequently from its sole definition we must conclude its existence but as from its definition as already shown in notes two and three it is not possible to conclude the existence of many substances ergo it necessarily follows that only one substance of the same nature can exist it will be necessary for the reader to remember that spinoza commenced his philosophical studies at the same point with descartes both recognized existence as the primal fact self-evident and indisputable but while descartes had in some manner fashioned a quality god and god created substance spinoza only found one substance the definition of which included existence by his fourth proposition of things which have nothing in common one cannot be the cause of the other he destroyed the creation theory because by that theory god is assumed to be a spirit having nothing in common with matter yet acting on matter and levis speaks of the fourth proposition in the following terms this fallacy has been one of the most influential corruptors of philosophical speculation for many years it was undisputed and most metaphysicians still adhere to it the assertion is that only like can act upon like but although it is true that like produces causes like it is also true that like produces unlike thus fire produces pain when applied to our body explosion when applied to gunpowder 
charcoal when applied to wood all these effects are unlike the cause we cannot help thinking that in this instance the usually thoughtful levis has either confused substance with its modes or for the sake of producing a temporary effect has descended to mere sophism spinoza's proposition is that substances having nothing in common cannot act on one another levis deals with several modes of the same substance as though they were different substances way more to make his argument the more plausible he entirely ignores in it that noumenon of which he speaks as underlying all phenomena and uses each phenomenon as a separate existence in each of the instances mentioned however varied may be the modification the essence is the same they are merely examples of one portion of the whole acting upon another portion and there is that in each mode which is common to the whole and by means of which the action takes place much has been said of spinoza's god and divine substance and we must refer the reader to definition six in which god is defined as being infinite substance now although we should be content to strike the word god out of our own tablet of philosophical nomenclature as being a much misused misrepresented and entirely useless word yet we must be very careful when we find another man using the word to get his precise definition and not to use any other ourselves while in his company spinoza when asked what name do you attach to infinite substance says god if he had said any other word we could not have quarrelled with him so long as he defined the word and adhered strictly to the terms of his definition although we might regret that he had not either coined a word for himself or used one less maltreated by the mass spinoza said i can only take cognizance of one substance of which i am part having infinite attributes of extension and thought i take cognizance of substance by its modes and in my consciousness of existence everything is a mode of the attribute of extension every thought wish or feeling a mode of the attribute of thought i call this substance with infinite attributes god spinoza like all other thinkers found himself overpowered by the illimitable vastness of the infinite when attempting to grasp it by his mental powers but unlike other men he did not endeavor to relieve himself by separating himself from that infinite but knowing he was a part of the whole not divisible from the remainder he was content to aim at perfecting his knowledge of existence rather than at dogmatizing upon an indefinable word which if it represented anything professed to represent an incomprehensible existence far beyond his reach we ought not to wonder that in many parts of spinoza's writings we find the word god treated in a less coherent manner than would be possible under the definition given in his ethics and for these reasons spinoza from his cradle upwards had been surrounded with books and traditions sanctified by the past and impressed on his willing mind by his family his tutors and the heads of his church a mind like his gathered all that was given even more quickly than it was offered still craving for more more light more light and at last light came bursting on the young thinker like a lightning flash at dark midnight revealing his mind in chains which had been cast round him in his nursery his school his college his synagogue by a mighty effort he burst these chains and walked forth a free man despite the entreaties of his family the reasonings of the rabbis the knife of the fanatic the curse of his church and the edict of the state but should it be a matter of surprise to us that some of the links of those broken chains should still hang on the young philosopher and seeming to be a part of himself almost imperceptibly inclined to old ways of thinking and to old modes of utterance of those thoughts wonder not that a few links bang about him but rather that he ever succeeded in breaking those chains at all spinoza after his secession from the synagogue became logically an atheist 
education and early impressions enlarged this into a less clearly defined pantheism but the logic comes to us naked disrobed of all by which it might have been surrounded in spinoza's mind if that logic be correct then all the theologies of the world are false we have presented it to the reader to judge for himself many men have written against it of these some have misunderstood some have misrepresented some have failed and few have left us a proof that they had endeavored to deal with spinoza on his own ground mccall says in the glorious throng of heroic names there are few nobler than spinoza's apart altogether from the estimate we may form of his philosophy there is something unspeakably interesting in the life and the character of the man in his metaphysical system there are two things exceedingly distinct there is first the immense and prodigious but terrible mathematical skeleton which his subtle intellect binds up and throws as calmly into space as we drop a pebble into the water and whose bones striking against the wreck of all that is sacred in belief or bold in speculation rattle a wild response to our wildest fantasies and drive us almost to think in despair that thinking is madness and there is secondly the divinest vision of the infinite and the divinest incense which the intuition of the infinite ever yet poured forth at the altar of creation the treatise on politics is not spinoza's greatest work it is in all respects inferior to the ethics and to the theological political treatise but there are in politics certain external principles and it is for setting forth and elucidating these that the treatise of spinoza is so valuable in the second chapter of that treatise after defining what he means by nature etc he on the sixth section proceeds as follows but many believe that the ignorant disturb more than follow the order of nature and conceive of men in nature as a state within the state for they assert that the human mind has not been produced by any natural causes but created immediately by god and thereby rendered so independent of other things as to have absolute power of determining itself and of using reason aright but experience teaches us more than enough that it is no more in our power to have a sound mind than a sound body since moreover everything as far as it is able strives to conserve its being we cannot doubt that if it were equally in our power to live according to the prescripts of reason as to be led by blind desire all would seek the guidance of reason and live wisely which is not the case for every one is the slave of the particular pleasure to which he is most attached nor do theologians remove the difficulty when they assert that this inability is a vice or a sin of human nature which derives its origin from the fall of the first parent for if it was in the power of the first man to stand rather than to fall and if he was sound in faculty and had perfect control over his own mind how did it happen that he the wise and prudent fell but they say he was deceived and tempted by the devil but who was it that led astray and tempted the devil himself who i ask rendered this the most excellent of intelligent creatures so mad that he wished to be greater than god could he render himself thus mad he who had a sane mind and strove as much as in him lay to conserve his being how moreover could it happen that the first man in possession of his entire mental faculties and master of his will should be both open to temptation and suffer himself to be robbed of his mind for if he had the power of using his reason aright he could not be deceived for as far as in him lay he necessarily sought to conserve his own being and the sanity of his mind but it is supposed that he had this in his power therefore he necessarily conserved his sane mind neither could he be deceived which is evidently false from his history and consequently it must be granted that it was not in the power of the first person to use reason aright 
but that he like us was subject to passions spinoza is scarcely likely to become a great favorite with the woman's rights convention in his ninth chapter of the same treatise he says if by nature women were equal to men and excelled as much as they in strength of mind and in talent truly amongst nations so many and so different some would be found where both sexes ruled equally and others where the men were ruled by the women and so educated as to be inferior to them in talent but as this has never happened we are justified in assuming that women by nature have not an equal right with men but that they are necessarily obedient to men and thus it can never happen that both sexes can equally rule and still less that men be ruled by women levis in his seventh chapter on modern philosophy thus sums up spinoza's teachings and their result he says the doctrine of spinoza was of great importance if for nothing more than having brought about the first crisis in modern philosophy his doctrine was so clearly stated and so rigorously deduced from admitted premises that he brought philosophy into this dilemma either my premises are correct or we must admit that every clear and distinct idea is absolutely true true not only subjectively but objectively if so my objection is true or my premises are false the voice of consciousness is not the voice of truth and if so then is my system false but all philosophy is impossible since the only ground of certitude our consciousness is pronounced unstable and our only means of knowing the truth is pronounced fallacious spinozism or scepticism choose between them for you have no other choice mankind refused however to make a choice if the principles which descartes had established could have no other result than spinozism it was worth while inquiring whether those principles might not themselves be modified the ground of discussion was shifted psychology took the place of ontology it was descartes theory of knowledge which led to spinozism that theory must therefore be examined that theory becomes the great subject of discussion before deciding upon the merits of any system which embraced the great questions of creation the deity immortality etc men saw that it was necessary to decide upon the competency of the human mind to solve such problems all knowledge must be obtained either through experience or independent of experience knowledge dependent on experience must necessarily be merely knowledge of phenomena all are agreed that experience can only be experience of ourselves as modified by objects all are agreed that to know things per se noumena we must know them through some other channel than experience have we or have we not that other channel this is the problem thus before we can dogmatize upon ontological subjects we must settle this question can we transcend the sphere of our consciousness and know things per se end of chapter four spinoza read for you by ted delorme Chapter 5 of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Chapter 5 Anthony Collins. Free thought, as developed in the deistic straggles of the seventeenth century, had to battle for existence against a puritanic reaction which took its second rise from the worn-out licentious age of the last of the Stuarts, and that of the no less dangerous, though concealed, libertinism of the Dutch king. A religious rancor also arose, which, but for the influence of a new power, would have re-enacted the tragedy of religious persecution but this rancor became somewhat modified from the fact that the various parties were now unlike the old schismatics 
who were each balanced at the opposite ends of the same pole extreme papacy on the one hand and fifth monarchists on the other when each oscillation from the protestant centre deranged the balance of enthusiasm and drove it to the farthest verge of fanaticism until all religious parties were hurled into one chaos of disunion such were the frequent changes of the seventeenth century but at its close the power of deism had evolved a platform on which was to be fought the hostilities of creeds here then could not exist that commingling of sects which were deducible in all their varied extravagance from the bible theology had no longer to fight with itself but with philosophy metaphysics became the jehu of opinion and sought to drive its chariot through the fables of the saints the old doctrines had to be restated to meet new foes for the papists nonconformists and brownists were excluded to make way for the british illuminati who spread as much consternation through england as did the french encyclopedists across europe the new field of action was only planned for when catholicism first opposed protestantism its leaders little thought what a pandoric box it was opening nor did the divines of the latter sect ever doubt the finality of their own doctrines they wished to replace one infallibility by another and the same charge can be substantiated against deism when in this augustan age the free-thinking leaders fresh from the trammels of christism first took the name of moral philosophers they little knew they were paving the way for an atheism they so much dreaded a democracy more unbridled than their most constitutional wishes a political economy to be tried for half a century and then to be discarded a revolutionary fervor which should plough up europe and then give place to a communism which the first founders of this national agitation would have gazed upon with amazement and shrunk from with despair such is the progress of change the rise of the deistic movement may be defined in a sentence it was the old struggle of speculative opinion shifting its battleground from theology to philosophy prior to the one being discarded and the other developed into positive science among the most distinguished of these reformers stands the name of anthony collins who and what he was we have little opportunity of knowing save from the scattered notices of contemporaries but sufficient is left on record to prove him one of the best of men and the very coryphius of deism the twin questions of necessity and prophecy have been examined by him perhaps more ably than by any other liberal author there are slight discrepancies in relation to the great events of his life the abbe lodovicat says he was born june twenty first sixteen seventy six of a rich and noble family at heston in middlesex and was appointed treasurer of the county but another account says hounslow which we think was the more likely place he was educated at eton and cambridge he studied for the bar for some time but being wealthy ultimately renounced jurisprudence while his youthful studies admirably fitted him for his subsequent magisterial duties he was clever honest learned and esteemed by all who knew his character the elder disraeli says that he was a great lover of literature and a man of fine genius while his morals were immaculate and his personal character independent the friendship of locke alone is sufficient to stamp the character of collins with honor and he was one of the most valued friends of this great man in a volume published by de Maisieux, a writer we shall have occasion to notice in the year seventeen twenty containing a collection of the posthumous works of locke there are several letters addressed to collins which fully substantiate our opinion locke was then an old man residing in the country and collins was a young man in london who took a pleasure in executing the commissions of his illustrious friend in one of them dated october twenty ninth seventeen o three he says if i were now setting out in the world i should think it my greatest happiness to have such a companion as you who had a true relish of truth 
would in earnest seek it with me from whom i might receive it undisguised and to whom i might communicate what i thought true freely believe it my good friend to love truth for truth's sake is the principal part of human perfection in this world and the seed-plot of all other virtue and if i mistake not you have as much of it as ever i met within anybody what then is there wanting to make you equal to the best a friend for any one to be proud of during the following year the correspondence of locke appears in a most interesting light the affectionate inquiries the kind advice and the most grateful acknowledgments are made to collins on september eleventh locke writes he that has anything to do with you must own that friendship is the natural product of your constitution and your soul a noble soil is enriched with the two most valuable qualities of human nature truth and friendship what a treasure have i then in such a friend with whom i can converse and be enlightened about the highest speculations on the first of october he wrote collins on his rapid decay but this i believe he will assure you that my infirmities prevail so fast on me that unless you make haste hither i may lose the satisfaction of ever seeing again a man that i value in the first rank of those i leave behind me this was written twenty-seven days before his death four days before his decease he wrote a letter to be given to collins after his death this document is one of the most important in relation to the life of the great freethinker it irrefragably proves the falsity of everything that may be alleged against the character of collins oates august twenty third seventeen o four for anthony collins esq dear sir by my will you will see that i had some kindness for hmm, and i knew no better way to take care of him than to put him and what i designed for him into your hands and management the knowledge i have of your virtues of all kinds secures the trust which by your permission i have placed in you and the peculiar esteem and love i have observed in the young man for you will dispose him to be ruled and influenced by you so of that i need say nothing may you live long and happy in the enjoyment of health freedom content and all those blessings which providence has bestowed on you and your virtues entitle you to i know you loved me living and will preserve my memory now i am dead i leave my best wishes with you john locke such is the honourable connection which existed between locke and collins collins first publication was a tract several of the london cases considered in the year seventeen hundred in seventeen o seven he published an essay concerning the use of reason on propositions the evidence whereof depends upon human testimony in which says dr leland there are some good observations mixed with others of a suspicious nature and tendency it principally turned on the trinitarian controversy then raging and is of little interest now in this year collins united with dodwell in the controversy carried on by dr samuel clark one of clark's biographers alluded to it thus dr clark's arguments in favor of the immateriality and consequent immortality of the soul called out however a far more formidable antagonist than dodwell in the person of anthony collins an english gentleman of singular intellectual acuteness but unhappily of infidel principles the controversy was continued through several short treatises on the whole though clark in some instances laid himself open to the keen and searching dialectics of his gifted antagonist the victory certainly remained with the divine of course it is only to be expected that such will be the opinion of an opponent but it is further proof of collins ability and character in seventeen o three appeared his celebrated discourses of freethinking which perhaps created the greatest sensation in the religious world with the exception of the age of reason of any book published against christianity this book is as able a defence of the freedom of the expression of thought without penalty as was ever published it is divided into four sections in the first freethinking is defined in five arguments 
in the second that it is our duty to think freely on those points of which men are denied the right to think freely such as of the nature and attributes of god the truth and authority of scriptures and of the meaning of scriptures in seven arguments and eleven instances the third section is the consideration of six objections to free thinking from the whole of which he concludes one that freethinkers must have more understanding and that they must necessarily be the most virtuous people two that they have in fact been the most understanding and virtuous people in all ages here follows the names of a great number of men whom collins classified as freethinkers and of whom we have no reason to be ashamed this book was answered by many divines but none of them emerged from the contest with such christian honors as the famous dr bentley considered england's greatest classical scholar in the same year the doctor published his reply under the signature of philelutheros lipsiensis the fame of bentley was considered equal to collins's and it has always been represented that this reply completely crushed the freethinker nothing could be farther from the truth bentley principally attacked the greek quotations and denounced collins for his ignorance in not putting his bentley's construction on every disputed word for this reply bentley received the thanks of the university of cambridge in condition with this work collins is also charged with wilful deception which has been reproduced in our own lives by divines who perhaps never read a line of collins a french edition of the discourse was translated under the personal inspection of collins and it is said that he altered the construction of several sentences to evade the charges brought against him by bentley dr leland is particularly eloquent upon this and the rev mr lorimer of glasgow triumphantly plagiarizes the complaint of the men whose defects he can only imitate there is another charge connected with bentley and his friends which it is desirous should be exposed the elder disraeli says anthony collins wrote several well-known works without prefixing his name but having pushed too far his curious and polemical points he incurred the odium of a freethinker a term which then began to be in vogue and which the french adopted by translating it in their way a strong thinker or esprit fort whatever tendency to liberalize the mind from the dogmas and creeds prevails in these works the talents and learning of collins were of the first class his morals were immaculate and his personal character independent but the odium theologicum of those days combined every means to stab in the dark till the taste became hereditary with some i may mention a fact of this cruel bigotry which occurred within my own observation on one of the most polished men of the age the late mr cumberland in the romance entitled his life gave this extraordinary fact he said that dr bentley who so ably replied to collins discourse when many years after he discovered him fallen into great distress conceiving that by having ruined collins character as a writer for ever he had been the occasion of his personal misery he liberally contributed to his maintenance in vain i mentioned to that elegant writer who was not curious about facts that this person could never have been anthony collins who had always a plentiful fortune and when it was suggested to him that this a collins as he printed it must have been arthur collins the historic compiler who was often in pecuniary difficulties still he persisted in sending the lie down to posterity without alteration in his second edition observing to a friend of mine that the story while it told well might serve as a striking instance of his great relative's generosity and that it should stand because it could do no harm to any but to anthony collins whom he considered as little short of an atheist such is a specimen of christian honor and justice in seventeen fifteen appeared his philosophical inquiry into human liberty dr clark was again his opponent the publication of this work marked an epoch in metaphysics dugald stuart in criticizing the discussion on moral liberty between clark and leibnitz says but soon after this controversy was brought to a conclusion by the death of his antagonist he clark had to renew the same argument in reply to his countryman anthony collins who following the footsteps of hobbes with logical talents not inferior to his master 
and with a weight of personal character in his favor to which his master had no pretensions gave to the cause which he so warmly espoused a degree of credit amongst sober and inquiring politicians which it had never before possessed in england the following are the principal arguments of collins in reference to liberty and necessity first though i deny liberty in a certain meaning of that word yet i contend for liberty as it signifies a power in man to do as he wills or pleases secondly when i affirm necessity i contend only for moral necessity meaning thereby that man who is an intelligent and sensible being is determined by his reason and senses and i deny any man to be subject to such necessity as is in clocks watches and such other beings which for want of intelligence and sensation are subject to an absolute physical or mechanical necessity thirdly i have undertaken to show that the notions i advance are so far from being inconsistent with that they are the sole foundation of morality and laws and of rewards and punishments in society and that the notions i explode are subversive of them from the above premises collins sought to show that man is a necessary agent one from our experience through consciousness two from the impossibility of liberty three from the consideration of the divine prescience four from the nature and use of rewards and punishments five from the nature of morality such were the principles on which the great question of necessity has ever been advocated from hobbes to collins jonathan edwards to mackintosh and spencer in the year 1704, Toland dedicated to him a new translation of Aesop's fables. There are many anecdotes respecting Collins inserted in religious magazines, most of which are false, and all without proof. One of them, related in a most circumstantial manner, appears to be the favorite. It depicts Collins walking out in the country on a Sunday morning, when he meets a countryman returning from church. Well, Hodge, says Collins, so you have been enjoying the fresh breezes of nature this fine morning. The clown replied that he had been worshipping nature's god, and proved it by repeating the substance of the Athanasian creed, upon which Collins questions him as to the residence of his god, and for a reply is told that his god is so large that he fills the universe, and so small that he dwells in his breast this sublime fact we are told had more effect upon collins's mind than all the books written against him by the clergy when will sensible men reject such charlatanism the next great work of collins was his discourse on the grounds and reasons of the christian religion in two parts the first containing some considerations on the quotations made from the old in the new testament and particularly on the prophecies cited from the former and said to be fulfilled in the latter the second containing an examination of the scheme advanced by mr whiston in his essay towards restoring the true text of the old testament and for vindicating the citations thence made in the new testament to which is prefixed an apology for free debate and liberty of writing this book took the religious world by storm. It is even thought it struck more dismay amongst divines than his former essay on free-thinking. The book proceeds to show that Christianity is not proved by prophecy, that the apostles relied on the predictions in the Old Testament, and their fulfillment in Jesus as the only sure proof of the truth of their religion if therefore the prophecies are not thoroughly literal and fulfilled distinctly there can be no proof in christianity he then examines the principal prophecies and dismisses them as allegorical fables too vague to be of any credit in less than two years no less than thirty-five books were published in reply to this work written by the ablest and most influential theologians in england in seventeen twenty seven collins published another large work the scheme of literal prophecy considered in which he still further defends his view principally against the sophistical reasoning of whiston and finally vanquished the whole of his opponents perhaps no freethinker with the single exception of hobbes was so attacked during his life as collins 
toland and woolston were persecuted and driven into prison and poverty but collins with his profusion of wealth could oppose christianity with applause mingle in the gaiety of the court occupy a seat on the magisterial bench be the welcome guest of the most liberal of the aristocracy contemporary with others who even languished in prison for the propagation of similar sentiments since his day the clergy have grown wiser then the most trivial pamphlet on the deistic side created a consternation amongst the saints and they strove who should be the first to answer it indeed it was considered a test of honor amongst the clergy to be eager in the exposure of deism but this style of warfare was discontinued after the lapse of a few years the most discerning observers discovered that in proportion to the answers published against liberal works the influence of the most powerful side decreased force then gradually interfered and acts of parliament were considered the only logical refutation of a philosophical heresy the anomaly of our laws interfered again collins was rich and so must escape the fangs of the law thomas woolston was poor so his vitals were pierced by laws which collins escaped yet both committed the same offence in later times gibbon traced the rise of christianity and about the same time Paine accomplished another portion of the same risk and the government which prosecuted the plebeian flattered the patrician but collins's time was rapidly drawing nigh on the thirteenth of december seventeen twenty nine he expired aged fifty-three years and to show the esteem in which his character was held the following notice was inserted in the newspapers of the day all hostile to his views yet striving to make it appear that he was after all not so great an infidel as his reputation honored him with on saturday last died at his house in harley square anthony collins esq he was a remarkably active upright and impartial magistrate the tender husband the kind parent the good master and the true friend he was a great promoter of literature in all its branches and an immovable asserter of universal liberty in all civil and religious matters whatever his sentiments were on certain points this is what he declared at the time of his death viz that he had always endeavored to the best of his ability to serve god his king and his country so he was persuaded he was going to that place which god hath prepared for them that serve him and presently afterwards he said the catholic religion is to serve god and run he was an eminent example of temperance and sobriety and one that had the true art of living his worst enemies could never charge him with any vice or immorality with this character the freethinkers have no right to be dissatisfied the abbe lodibicat says his library was curious and valuable always open to the learned even to his opponents whom he furnished with pleasure both with books and arguments which were employed in confuting him mr disraeli says he has seen a catalogue of collins library elaborately drawn up in his own handwriting and it must have contained a splendid selection of books this is proved by the correspondence with locke and the extensive number of quotations spread throughout his published works by the death of collins and the defalcation of one who abused the name of a deist the cause of free thought was impeded at the time when it most needed assistance collins had written a great number of tracts and larger works intending them to be published after his death one collection of eight octavo volumes of manuscript containing the attacks upon christianity by which he intended his name to be transmitted to posterity were all arranged ready for publication as his posthumous works to ensure their creditable appearance and to reward a man whom he had thought worthy of confidence and one who professed to be a disciple of collins he bequeathed them to de Mazur, then a popular author and editor he had edited the correspondence of locke and collins written the light of bale and subsequently edited toland the idea of collins was to give his work to de Mazur for a recompense for the trouble of publishing them while he would derive the whole profits of their sale which no doubt would be very large it appears that the widow of collins was much younger than himself in league with the church of england and was in rather a suspicious friendship with more than one clerical antagonist of her late husband 
de Maju being worked upon conjointly by mrs collins and a person named tomlinson was induced to accept a present of fifty guineas and relinquished the possession of the manuscripts it was not long however before his conscience accused him of the great wrong done to the memory of his benefactor and to the free-thinking cause his regret was turned into the most profound compunction for his crime and in this state of mind he wrote a long letter to one who had been a mutual friend to collins and himself acknowledging that he had done a most wicked thing saying i am convinced that i have acted contrary to the will and intention of my dear deceased friend showed a disregard to the particular mark of esteem he gave me on that occasion in short that i have forfeited what is dearer to me than my own life honor and reputation i send you the fifty guineas i received which i do now look upon as the wages of iniquity and i desire you to return them to mrs collins who as i hope it of her justice equity and regard to mr collins's intentions will be pleased to cancel my paper this appeal which proved that de Maizieux, if he was weak-minded was not absolutely dishonest had no effect on mrs collins the manuscripts were never returned what their contents were no one now can inform us we are justified however in supposing that as those eight volumes were the crowning efforts of a mind which in its youth was brilliant in no common degree must have been even superior to those books which roused england from its dreamy lethargy and brought about a revolution in controversy whether they touched upon miracles or the external evidences or the morals of christism is unknown the curtain was drawn over the scene of demolition seven years after this time the controversy was reopened by mrs collins in the year seventeen thirty seven on account of a report being current that mrs c had permitted transcripts of those manuscripts to get abroad the widow wrote some very sharp letters to de Maizieux, and he replied in a tone which speaks faithfully of the affection he still bore to collins memory he concludes thus mr collins loved me and esteemed me for my integrity and sincerity of which he had several proofs how i have been drawn in to injure him to forfeit the good opinion he had of me and which were he now alive would deservedly expose me to his utmost contempt is a grief which i shall carry to the grave it would be a sort of comfort to me if those who have consented i should be drawn in were in some measure sensible of the guilt towards so good kind and generous a man such is an epitome of the secret history of the manuscripts of anthony collins if we look at the fate of the manuscripts of other deists we shall have good reasons for believing that some of the ablest writings meant to give a posthumous reputation to their authors have disappeared into the hands of either ignorant or designing persons five volumes at least of toland's works meant for publication were by his death irretrievably lost blunt's manuscripts never appeared two volumes of tyndall's were seized by the bishop of london and destroyed woolston's manuscripts met with no better fate chubb carefully prepared his works and published them in his lifetime bolingbroke made mallette his confidant as collins did by de Maizieux. the name of st john produced ten thousand pounds to mallette but those works were left with the tacit acknowledgment that the scotch poet should write a suitable life of the peer the letter of mallet to lord cornbury can only be compared to an invitation for a bid for the suppression of the philosophical works of st john and if this was not sufficient we need only instance the apparent solicitation with which he stopped a well-known influential dignitary of the church on the day when the works were to appear by pulling out his watch and saying my lord christianity will tremble at a quarter to twelve we may be thankful to the pecuniary poverty of our opponents even for the possession of the first philosophy some of hume's and gibbon's works have not yet appeared 
the manuscripts of most of the minor freethinkers disappeared with their authors there is no doubt but what robert taylor left some valuable writings which cannot be recovered such is the feeble chance of great men's writings being published when they are no longer alive with regard to the literary claims of collins his works are logically composed and explicitly worded he invariably commences by stating the groundwork of his opponent's theories and from them deduces a great number of facts and axioms of a contrary character and upon those builds his whole chain of argument he is seldom witty never uses the flowers of rhetoric combining a most rigid analysis with a synthetic scheme admitting but of one unswerving end he was characteristically great in purpose he avoided carrying forward his arguments beyond the basis of his facts whether in treating the tangled intricacies of necessity or the theological quagmires of prophecy he invariably explained without confusing and refuted without involving other subjects than those legitimately belonging to the controversy his style of writing was serious plain and without an undue levity yet withal perfectly readable men studied collins who shrunk from contact with the lion-hearted woolston whose brusque pen too often shocked those it failed to convince there was a timidity in many of the letters of blunt and a craving wish to rely more on the witticisms of brown than was to be found in the free and manly spirit of our hero to the general public the abstruse speculations of the persecuted toland were a barrier which his many classical allusions only heightened and the musical syllables of shaftesbury with his style at once so elevated so pompous and so quaint or the political economic doctrines of mandeville all tended to exalt the name of collins above those of his contemporaries and immediate successors and posterity cannot fail to place his bust in that historic niche between hobbes his master on one hand and bolingbroke his successor on the other from the great st john has descended in the true apostolical descent the mantle of free thought upon hume gibbon Paine, godwin carlyle taylor and owen and amongst this brilliant galaxy of genius no name is more deserving of respect than that of anthony collins end of chapter five ancient and modern celebrated freethinkers by charles bradlaugh read for you by ted delorme chapter six of ancient and modern celebrated freethinkers this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Chapter 6. Descartes. René Descartes Duperon, better known as Descartes, the father of modern philosophy, was born at La Haye in Touraine of Breton parents, near the close of the sixteenth century at a time when bacon was like the morning sun rising to shed new rays of bright light over the then dark world of philosophy the mother of descartes died while he was but a few days old and himself a sickly child he began to take part in the battle of life with but little appearance of ever possessing the capability for action on the minds of his fellows which he afterwards so fully exercised debarred however by his physical weakness from many boyish pursuits he devoted himself to study in his earliest years and during his youth gained the title of the young philosopher from his eagerness to learn and from his earnest endeavors by inquiry and experiment to solve every problem presented to his notice he was educated in the jesuits college of la fleche and the monument erected to him at stockholm informs us that having mastered all the learning of the schools which proved short of his expectations he betook himself to the army in germany and hungary and there spent his vacant winter hours in comparing the mysteries and phenomena of nature with the laws of mathematics 
daring to hope that the one might serve as a key to the other quitting therefore all other pursuits he retired to a little village near egmont in holland where spending twenty-five years in continual reading and meditation he effected his design in his celebrated discourse on method he says as soon as my age permitted me to leave my preceptors i entirely gave up the study of letters and resolving to seek no other science than that which i could find in myself or else in the great book of the world i employed the remainder of my youth in travel in seeing courts and camps in frequenting people of diverse humors and conditions in collecting various experiences and above all in endeavoring to draw some profitable reflection from what i saw for it seemed to me that i should meet with more truth in the reasonings which each man makes in his own affairs and which if wrong would be speedily punished by failure than in those reasonings which the philosopher makes in his study upon speculations which produce no effect and which are of no consequence to him except perhaps that he will be the more vain of them the more remote they are from common sense because he would then have been forced to employ more ingenuity and subtlety to render them plausible at the age of thirty-three descartes retired from the world for a period of eight years and his seclusion was so effectual during that time that his place of residence was unknown to his friends he there prepared the meditations and discourse on method which have since caused so much pen and ink warfare amongst those who have aspired to be ranked as philosophical thinkers he became european in fame and invited by christina of sweden he visited her kingdom but the rudeness of the climate proved too much for his delicate frame and he died at stockholm in the year sixteen fifty from inflammation of the lungs being fifty-four years of age at the time of his death descartes was perhaps the most original thinker that france had up to that date produced and contemporary with bacon he exercised a powerful influence on the progress of thought in europe but although a great thinker he was not a brave man and the fear of giving offence to the church and government has certainly prevented him from making public some of his writings and perhaps has toned down some of these thoughts which when first uttered took a higher flight and struck full home to the truth itself the father and founder of the deductive method descartes still proudly reigns to the present day although some of his conclusions have been overturned and others of his thinkings have been carried to conclusions which he never dared to dream of he gave a strong aid to the tendency of advancing civilization to separate philosophy from theology thereby striking a blow slow in its effect and effectual in its destructive operation on all priestcraft in his dedication of the meditations he says i have always thought that the two questions of the existence of god and the nature of the soul were the chief of those which ought to be demonstrated rather by philosophy than by theology for although it is sufficient for us the faithful to believe in god and that the soul does not perish with the body it does not seem possible ever to persuade the infidels to any religion unless we first prove to them these two things by natural reason having relinquished faith he found that he must choose an entirely new faith in which to march with reason the old ways were so cumbered with priests and bibles that progression would have been impossible this gave us his method he wanted a starting point from which to reason some indisputable fact upon which to found future thinkings he has given us the detailed history of his doubts he has told us how he found that he could plausibly enough doubt of everything except his own existence he pushed his scepticism to the verge of self-annihilation there he stopped there in self there in his consciousness he found at last an irresistible fact an irreversible certainty 
firm ground was discovered he could doubt the existence of the external world and treat it as a phantasm he could doubt the existence of god and treat the belief as a superstition but of the existence of his own thinking doubting mind no sort of doubt was possible he the doubter existed if nothing else existed the existence that was revealed to him in his own consciousness was the primary fact the first indubitable certainty hence his famous cogito ergo sum i think therefore i am labus biography history philosophy proceeding from the certainty of his existence descartes endeavors to find other equally certain facts and for that purpose presents the following doctrine and rules for our guidance the basis of all certitude is consciousness consciousness is the sole foundation of absolute certainty whatever it distinctly proclaims must be true the process is therefore rendered clear and simple examine your consciousness each distinct reply will be a fact he tells us further that all clear ideas are true that whatever is clearly and distinctly conceived is true and in these lie the vitality of his system the cause of the truth or error of his thinkings the following are the rules he gave us for the detection and separation of true ideas from false i e imperfect or complex one never to accept anything as true but what is evidently so to admit nothing but what so clearly and distinctly presents itself as true that there can be no reason to doubt it two to divide every question into as many separate parts as possible that each part being more easily conceived the whole may be more intelligible three to conduct the examination with order beginning by that of objects the most simple and therefore the easiest to be known and ascending little by little up to knowledge of the most complex four to make such exact calculations and such circumspections as to be confident that nothing essential has been omitted consciousness being the basis of all certitude everything of which you are clearly and distinctly conscious must be true everything which you clearly and distinctly conceive exists if the idea of it involve existence in these four rules we have the essential part of one half of descartes system the other which is equally important is the attempt to solve metaphysical problems by mathematical aid to mathematics he had devoted much of his time he it was who at the age of twenty-three made the grand discovery of the applicability of algebra to geometry while deeply engaged in mathematical studies and investigations he came to the conclusion that mathematics were capable of a still further simplification and of much more extended application impressed with the certainty of the conclusions arrived at by the aid of mathematical reasoning he began to apply mathematics to metaphysics his ambition was to found a system which should be solid and convincing having searched for certitude he had found its basis in consciousness he next wanted a method and hoped he had found it in mathematics he tells us that those long chains of reasoning all simple and easy by which geometers used to arrive at their most difficult demonstrations suggested to him that all things which came within human knowledge must follow each other in a similar chain and that provided we abstain from admitting anything as true which is not so and that we always preserve in them the order necessary to deduce one from the other there can be none so remote to which we cannot finally attain nor so obscure but that we may discover them acting out this he dealt with metaphysics as we should with a problem from euclid and expected by rigorous reasoning to discover the truth he like archimedes had wished for a standing place from which to use the lever that should overturn the world 
but having a sure standing place in the indubitable fact of his own existence he did not possess sufficient courage to put forth the mighty power it was left for one who came after him to fairly attempt the overthrow of the world of error so long existent cartesianism was sufficiently obnoxious to the divines to provoke their wrath and yet from some of its peculiarities it has found many opponents among the philosophical party the cartesian philosophy is founded on two great principles the one metaphysical the other physical the metaphysical is descartes foundation stone the i think therefore i am this has been warmly attacked as not being logical descartes said his existence was a fact a fact above and beyond all logic logic could neither prove nor disprove it the cogito ergo sum was not new itself but it was the first stone of a new building the first step in a new road from this fact descartes tried to reach another and from that others the physical principle is that nothing exists but substance which he makes of two kinds the one a substance that thinks the other a substance extended actual thought and actual extension are the essence of substance so that the thinking substance cannot be without some actual thought nor can anything be retrenched from the extension of a thing without taking away so much of its actual substance in his physical speculations descartes has allowed his imagination to run very wild his famous theory of vortices is an example of this assuming extension to be the essence of substance he denied the possibility of a vacuum by that assumption for if extension be the essence of substance wherever extension is there substance must be this substance he assumes to have originally been divided into equal angular particles each endowed with an equal degree of motion several systems or collections of these particles he holds to have a motion about certain equidistant points or centers and that the particles moving round these composed so many vortices these angular particles by their intestine motions he supposes to become as it were ground into a spherical form the parts rubbed off are called matter of the first element while the spherical globules he calls matter of the second element and since there would be a large quantity of this element he supposes it to be driven towards the center of each vortex by a circular motion of the globules and that there it forms a large spherical body such as the sun this sun being thus formed and moving about its own axis with the common matter of the vortex would necessarily throw out some parts of its matter through the vacuities of the globules of the second element constituting the vortex and this especially at such places as are farthest from its poles receiving at the same time in by these poles as much as it loses in its equatorial parts and by these means it would be able to carry round with it those globules that are nearest with the greater velocity and the remoter with less and further those globules which are nearest the centre of the sun must be smallest because were they greater or equal they would by reason of their velocity have a greater centrifugal force and recede from the centre if it should happen that any of these sun-like bodies in the centres of the several vortices should be so encrusted and weakened as to be carried about in the vortex of the true sun if it were of less solidity or had less motion than the globules toward the extremity of the solar vortex it would descend towards the sun till it met with globules of the same solidity and susceptible of the same degree of motion with itself and thus being fixed there it would be forever after carried about by the motion of the vortex without either approaching any nearer to or receding from the sun and so become a planet supposing then all this we are next to imagine that our system was at first divided into several vortices in the center of each of which was a lucid spherical body and that some of these being gradually incrustated were swallowed up by others which were larger and more powerful till at last they were all destroyed and swallowed up by the biggest solar vortex 
except some few which were thrown off in right lines from one vortex to another, and so became comets. It should also be added that in addition to these two elements mentioned above, those particles which may yet exist and be only in the course of reduction to their globular form as it still retain their angular proportions form a third element. This theory has found many opponents, but in this state of our work we conceive our duty to be that of giving a simple narrative of the philosopher's ideas, rather than a history of the various criticisms upon those ideas, the more especially as our pages scarcely afford room for such a mode of treatment. Having formed his method, Descartes proceeded to apply it, the basis of certitude being consciousness, he interrogated his consciousness, and found that he had an idea of a substance infinite, eternal, immutable, independent, omniscient, omnipotent. This he called an idea of God. He said, I exist as a miserably imperfect finite being, subject to change, ignorant, incapable of creating anything. I find by my finitude that I am not the infinite by my liability to change that i am not the immutable by my ignorance that i am not the omniscient in short by my imperfection that i am not the perfect yet an infinite immutable omniscient and perfect being must exist because infinity immutability omniscience and perfection are applied as correlatives in my ideas of finitude change etc god therefore exists his existence is clearly proclaimed in my consciousness and therefore ceases to be a matter of doubt any more than the fact of my own existence the conception of an infinite being proved his real existence for if there is not really such a being i must have made the conception but if i could make it i can also unmake it which evidently is not true therefore there must be externally to myself an archetype from which the conception was derived all that we clearly and distinctly conceive as contained in anything is true of that thing now we conceive clearly and distinctly that the existence of god is contained in the idea we have of him ergo god exists levis's biography of history and philosophy Descartes was of the opinion that his demonstrations of the existence of God equal or even surpass in certitude the demonstrations of geometry. In this opinion, we must confess, we cannot share. He has already told us that the basis of all certitude is consciousness, that whatever is clearly and distinctly conceived must be true, that imperfect and complex conceptions are false ones. The first proposition, all must admit, is applicable to themselves. I conceive a fact clearly and distinctly, and despite all resistance am compelled to accept that fact. And if that fact be accepted beyond doubt, no higher degree of certainty can be attained. That two and two are four, that I exist, are facts, which I never doubt. The cogito ergo sum is irresistible, because indubitable but cogito ergo deus est is a sentence requiring much consideration and upon the face of it is no syllogism but on the contrary is illogical if descartes meant i am consciousness that i am not the whole of existence he would be indisputable but if he meant that i can be conscious of an existence entirely distinct apart from and external to that very consciousness then his whole reasoning from that point appears fallacious we use the word i as given by descartes mill in his system of logic says the ambiguity in this case is in the pronoun i by which in one place is to be understood my will in another the laws of my nature if the conception existing as it does in my mind had no original without, the conclusion would unquestionably follow that I had made it, that is, that the laws of my nature had spontaneously evolved it, but that my will made it would not follow. Now when Descartes afterwards adds that I cannot unmake the conception, he means that I cannot get rid of it by an act of my will, which is true but is not the proposition required. 
that what some of the laws of my nature have produced other laws or those same laws in other circumstances might not subsequently efface he would have found it difficult to establish treating the existence of god as demonstrated from the a priori idea of perfection and infinity and by the clearness of his idea of god's existence descartes then proceeds to deal with the distinction between body and soul to prove this distinction was to him an easy matter the fundamental and essential attribute of substance must be extension because we can denude substance of every quality but that of extension this we cannot touch without at the same time affecting the substance the fundamental attribute of mind is thought it is in the act of thinking that the consciousness of existence is revealed to be without thought would be to be without consciousness descartes has given us among others the axiom that two substances are really distinct when their ideas are complete and no way imply each other the idea of extension is complete and distinct from the idea of thought, which latter is also clear and distinct by itself. It follows, therefore, that substance and mind are distinct in essence. Descartes has, from the vagueness of some of his statements, subjected himself to the charge of asserting the existence of innate ideas, and the following quotations will speak for themselves on the subject. When I said that the idea of god is innate in us i never meant more than this that nature has endowed us with a faculty by which we may know god but i have never either said or thought that such ideas had an actual existence or even that they were a species distinct from the faculty of thinking although the idea of god is so imprinted on our minds that every person has within him the faculty of knowing him it does not follow that there may not have been various individuals who have passed through life without ever making this idea a distinct object of apprehension and in truth they who think they have an idea of a plurality of gods have no idea of god whatever this seems explicit as negating the charge of holding the doctrine of innate ideas but in the edinburgh review several passages are given amongst which is the following by the word idea i understand all that can be in our thoughts and i distinguish three sorts of ideas adventitious like the common idea of the sun framed by the mind such as that which astronomical reasoning gives of the sun and innate as the idea of god mind body a triangle and generally all those which represent true immutable and eternal essences with regard to these rather opposite statements levis says if descartes when pressed by objections gave different explanations we must only set it down to a want of a steady concept of the vital importance of innate ideas to his system the fact remains that innate ideas form the necessary groundwork of the cartesian doctrine the radical error of all ontological speculation lies in the assumption that we have ideas independent of experience because experience can only tell us of ourselves or of phenomena of noumena it can tell us nothing the fundamental question then of modern philosophy is this have we any ideas independent of experience descartes disciples are of two classes the mathematical cultivators of physics and the deductive cultivators of philosophy the first class of disciples are far in advance of their chief and can only be considered as having received an impulse in a true direction the second class unhesitatingly accepted his principles and continued his thinking although they developed his system in a different manner and arrived at stronger conclusions than descartes courage would have supported some of the physical speculations of descartes have been much ridiculed by subsequent writers but many reasons may be urged not only against that ridicule but also against the more moderate censure which several able critics have dealt out against the intellectual character of descartes it should be remembered that the theories of all his predecessors were mere conjectural speculations respecting the places and paths of celestial bodies etc 
innumerable hypotheses had been formed and found useless and we ought rather to look to what descartes did accomplish under the many difficulties of his position in respect to the then state of scientific knowledge than to judge harshly of those speculations which though attended with no beneficial result to humanity at large were doubtless well intended by their author he was the first man who brought optical science under the command of mathematics by the discovery of the law of refraction of the ordinary ray through diaphanous bodies and probably there is scarcely a name on record the bearer of which has given a greater impulse to mathematical and philosophical inquiry than descartes although as a mathematician he published but little yet in every subject which he has treated he has opened not only a new field for investigation but also a new road for the investigators to proceed by his discovery of the simple application of the notation of indices to algebraical powers has totally remodeled the whole science of algebra his conception of expressing the fundamental property of curved lines and curved surfaces by equations between the coordinates has led to an almost total supersedence of the geometry of the ancients contemporary with galileo and with a knowledge of the persecution to which that father of physics was being subjected by the church we are tempted to express our surprise that descartes did not extend the right hand of fellowship help and sympathy to his brother philosopher but it is nevertheless the fact that either jealous of the fame of galileo as some have alleged or from a fear of being involved in the same persecutions descartes abstained from visiting the astronomer although travelling for some time near his place of abode in italy levis in his life of descartes says descartes was a great thinker but having said this we have almost exhausted the praise we can bestow on him as a man in disposition he was timid to servility while promulgating the proofs of the existence of the deity he was in evident alarm lest the church should see something objectionable in them he had also written an astronomical treatise but hearing of the fate of galileo he refrained from publishing and always used some chicanery in speaking of the world's movement he was not a brave man he was also not an affectionate one there was in him a deficiency of all finer feelings but he was even tempered and studious of not giving offence we are tempted after a careful perusal of the life and writings of descartes and his contemporaries to be of opinion that he was a man who wished to be considered the chief thinker of his day and who shunned and rejected the offers of friendship from other philosophers lest they by being associated with him should jointly wear laurels which he was cultivating solely to form a crown for himself despite all his brow still bears a crown and his fame has a freshness that we might all be justly proud of if appertaining to ourselves we trust that in these few pages we have succeeded in presenting descartes to such of our readers who were unacquainted with his writings sufficiently well to enable them to appreciate him and to induce them to search further and at the same time we hope that those better acquainted with him will not blame as for the omission of much which they may consider more important than the matter of which appears in this little tract we have endeavored to picture descartes as the founder of the deductive method as having the foundation stone of all his reasoning in his consciousness End of chapter six of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers. Read for you by Ted DeLorme. Chapter seven of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Chapter 7 Voltaire. Francois Marie Arouet, better known by the name of Voltaire, was born at Chateauneuf on the 20th of February, 1694. By assuming the name of Voltaire, young Arouet followed the custom at the time generally practised by the rich citizens and younger sons who leaving the family name to the heir assumed that of a fief or perhaps of a country house 
the father of monsieur de voltaire was treasurer to the chamber of accounts and his mother margaret d'aumont was of a noble family of poitou the fortune which the father enjoyed enabling him to bestow a first-class education upon the young arouet who was sent to the jesuits college where the sons of the nobility received their education while at school voltaire began to write poetry and gave signs of a remarkable genius his tutors father poret and jay from the boldness and independence of his mind predicted that he would become the apostle of deism in france this prediction he fulfilled voltaire was says lord brougham through his whole life a sincere believer in the existence and attributes of the deity he was firm and decided and an openly declared unbeliever in christianity but he was without any hesitation or any intermission a theist his open declaration of disbelief in the inspiration of the bible and his total rejection of the dogmas of christianity laid him open to the malignant attacks and misrepresentations of the priesthood and the bigots of europe and so strong were they that his life was continually in danger lord brougham in his men of letters of the time of george the third says voltaire's name is so intimately connected in the minds of all men with infidelity in the minds of most men with irreligion and in the minds of all who are not well informed with these qualities alone that whoever undertakes to write his life and examine his claim to the vast reputation which all the hostile feelings excited by him against himself have never been able to destroy or even materially to impair has to labor under a great load of prejudice and can hardly expect by any detail of particulars to obtain for his subject even common justice at the hands of the general reader voltaire was born in a corrupt age and in a capital where it was fashionable to be immoral when he left college he was introduced by his own godfather the abbe de chateauneuf to the notorious ninon de l'enclos who at her death left him by will two thousand livres to purchase books in estimating the character of voltaire a due consideration must be had for the period in which he lived and of the nature of the society amidst which he was reared he lived twenty years under the reign of louis the fourteenth and during the whole of the reign of the infamous louis the fifteenth when kings courtiers and priests set the example of the grossest immorality it was then as voltaire said that to make the smallest fortune it was better to say four words to the mistress of a king than to write a hundred volumes voltaire's life from his youth upwards was a stormy one after he left college his father finding him persisting in writing poetry and living at large forbade him in his house he insisted upon his son binding himself to an attorney but his restless disposition quite unfitted him for regular employment and he soon quitted the profession he early made the acquaintance of the most celebrated men of his time but his genius his wit and his sarcasm soon raised up numerous enemies at the age of twenty-two he was accused of having written a satire upon louis the fourteenth who was just dead and was thrown into the bastille but he was not cast down it was here that he sketched his poem of the league corrected his tragedy of oedipus and wrote some merry verses on the misfortune of being a prisoner the regent duke of orleans being informed of his innocence restored him to freedom and granted him a recompense i thank your royal highness said voltaire for having provided me with food but i hope you will not hereafter trouble yourself concerning my lodging voltaire with his activity of mind and living to so great an age must necessarily produce many works they are voluminous consisting of history poetry and philosophy his dramatic pieces are numerous many of which are considered second only to shakespeare's oedipus zadik ingenue zaire henriade irene tancred mahomet merope saul azure le fanatisme mariamne gaston de foix 
Enfant Projet, Pucelle d'Orleans, an essay on fire, the elements, history of Charles Twelfth, lectures on man, letters on England, memoirs, voyage of the Sacramentado, Micromegas, maid of Orleans, Brutus, Adelaide, death of Caesar, temple of taste, essay on the manners and spirit of nations, an examination of the holy scriptures, and the philosophical dictionary are works that emanated from the active brain of this wit poet satirist and philosopher in seventeen twenty two while at brussels voltaire met jean baptiste rousseau whose misfortunes he deplored and whose poetic talents he esteemed voltaire read some of his poems to rousseau and he in return read to voltaire his ode addressed to posterity which voltaire it is asserted told him would never arrive at the place to which it was addressed the two poets parted irreconcilable foes in seventeen twenty five voltaire was again shut up in the bastille through attempting to revenge an insult inflicted upon him by a courtier at the end of six months he was released but ordered to quit paris he sought refuge in england in seventeen twenty six he was the guest in that country of a mr falconer of wandsworth whose hospitality he remembered with affection so long as life lasted voltaire was known to most of the wits and free thinkers of that day in england at this early age he was at war with christianity his visit to england says lamartine gave assurance and gravity to his incredulity for in france he had only known libertines in england he knew philosophers he went to visit congreve who had the affectation to tell him that he congreve valued himself not on his authorship but as a man of the world to which voltaire administered a just rebuke by saying i should never have come so far to see a gentleman voltaire soon acquired an ample fortune much of which was expended in aiding men of letters and in encouraging such youth as he thought discovered the seeds of genius the use he made of riches might prevail on envy itself to pardon him their acquirement his pen and his purse were ever at the service of the oppressed calas an infirm old man living at toulouse was accused of having hung his son to prevent his becoming a catholic the catholic population became inflamed and the young man was declared to be a martyr the father was condemned to the torture and the wheel and died protesting his innocence the family of calas was ruined and disgraced voltaire assuring himself of the innocence of the old man determined to obtain justice for the family to this end he labored incessantly for three years in all this time he said a smile did not escape him for which he did not reproach himself as for a crime his efforts were successful nor was this the only cause in which he was engaged on the side of the weak and the wronged against the powerful and the persecuting his whole life though maligned as an infidel and a scoffer was one long act of benevolence on learning that a young niece of corneille languished in a condition unworthy of his name voltaire in the most delicate manner invited her to his house and she there received an education suitable to the rank that her birth had marked for her in society it is the duty of a soldier he said to succor the niece of his general voltaire lived for a time at the court of frederick the great of prussia and for many years carried on a correspondence with that monarch he quarrelled with the king and left the court in a passion an emissary was dispatched to him to request an apology who said he was to carry back to the king his answer verbatim voltaire told him that the king might go to the devil on being asked if that was the message he meant to be delivered yes he answered and add to it that i told you that you might go there with him in his memoirs he has drawn a most amusing picture of his prussian majesty he also says priests never entered the palace and in a word frederick lived without religion without a council and without a court 
wearied with his rambling and unsettled mode of living voltaire bought an estate at ferney in the pays de gay where he spent the last twenty years of his life he rebuilt the house laid out gardens kept a good table and had crowds of visitors from all parts of europe removed from whatever could excite momentary or personal passion he yielded to his zeal for the destruction of prejudice which was the most powerful and active of all the sensations he felt this peaceful life seldom disturbed except by the threats of persecution rather than persecution itself was adorned by those acts of enlightened and bold benevolence which while they relieve the sufferings of certain individuals are of any service to the whole human race he was known to europe as the sage of ferney after an absence of more than twenty-seven years he revisited paris at the beginning of seventeen seventy eight he had just finished his play of irene and was anxious to see it performed his visit was an ovation he had outlived all his enemies after having been the object of unrelenting persecution by the priests and corrupt courtiers of france for a period of more than fifty years he yet lived to see the day when all that was the most eminent in station or most distinguished in talents all that most shone in society or most ruled in court seemed to bend before him at this period he for the first time saw benjamin franklin they embraced each other in the midst of public acclamations and it was said to be solon who embraced sophocles voltaire did not survive his triumph long his unwearied activity induced him at his great age to commence a dictionary upon a novel plan which he prevailed upon the french academy to take up these labors brought on spitting of blood followed by sleeplessness to obviate which he took opium in considerable quantities condorcet says that the servant mistook one of the doses which threw him into a state of lethargy from which he never rallied he lingered for some time but at length expired on the thirtieth of may seventeen seventy eight in his eighty-fifth year it was the custom in those days and prevails to a considerable extent even in our own time for the religious world to fabricate horrible death-beds of all freethinkers voltaire's last moments were distorted by his enemies after the approved fashion and notwithstanding the most unqualified denial on the part of dr burard and others who were present at his death there are many who believe these falsehoods at this moment voltaire died in peace with the exception of the petty annoyances to which he was subjected by the priests the philosophers too who wished that no public stigma should be cast upon him by the refusal of christian burial persuaded him to undergo confession and absolution this to oblige his friends he submitted to but when the cure one day drew him from his lethargy by shouting into his ear do you believe the divinity of jesus christ voltaire exclaimed in the name of god sir speak to me no more of that man but let me die in peace this put to flight all doubts of the pious and the certificate of burial was refused but the prohibition of the bishop of troyes came too late voltaire was buried at the monastery of Celieres in champagne of which his nephew was abbot afterwards during the first french revolution the body at the request of the citizens was removed to paris and buried in the pantheon lamartine in his history of the girondists page one forty nine speaking of the ceremony says on the eleventh of july the departmental and municipal authorities went in state to the barry of charenton to receive the mortal remains of voltaire which were placed on the ancient site of the bastille like a conqueror on his trophies his coffin was exposed to public gaze and a pedestal was formed for it of stones torn from the foundations of this ancient stronghold of tyranny and thus voltaire when dead triumphed over those stones which had triumphed over and confined him when living on one of the blocks was the inscription receive on this spot where despotism once fettered thee 
the honours decreed to thee by thy country the coffin of voltaire was deposited between those of descartes and mirabeau the spot predestined for this intermediary genius between philosophy and policy between the design and the execution the aim of voltaire's life was the destruction of prejudice and the establishment of reason deists said w j fox in eighteen nineteen have done much for toleration and religious liberty it may be doubted if there be a country in europe where that cause has not been advanced by the writings of voltaire in the preface and conclusion to the examination of the scriptures voltaire says the ambition of domineering over the mind is one of the strongest passions a theologian a missionary or a partisan of any description is always for conquering like a prince and there are many more sects than there are sovereigns in the world to whose guidance shall i submit my mind must i be a christian because i happened to be born in london or in madrid must i be a mussulman because i was born in turkey as it is myself alone that i ought to consult the choice of a religion is my greatest interest one man adores god by mahomet another by the grand lama another by the pope weak and foolish men adore god by your own reason i have learnt that a french vicar by the name of john messier who died a short time since prayed on his deathbed that god would forgive him for having taught christianity i have seen a vicar in dorsetshire relinquish a living of two hundred pounds a year and confess to his parishioners that his conscience would not permit him to preach the shocking absurdities of the christians but neither the will nor the testament of john meslier nor the declaration of this worthy vicar are what i consider decisive proofs uriel acosta a jew publicly renounced the old testament in amsterdam however i pay no more attention to the jew acosta than to parson meslier i will read the arguments on both sides of the trial with careful attention not suffering the lawyers to tamper with me but will weigh before god the reasons of both parties and decide according to my conscience i commence by being my own instructor i conclude that every sensible man every honest man ought to hold christianity in abhorrence the great name of theist which we can never sufficiently revere is the only name we ought to adopt the only gospel we should read is the grand book of nature written with god's own hand and stamped with his own seal the only religion we ought to profess is to adore god and act like honest men it would be as impossible for this simple and eternal religion to produce evil as it would be impossible for christian fanaticism not to produce it but what shall we substitute in its place say you what a ferocious animal has sucked the blood of my relatives i tell you to rid yourselves of this beast and you ask me what you shall put in its place is it you that put this question to me then you are a hundred times more odious than the pagan pontiffs who permitted themselves to enjoy tranquillity among their ceremonies and sacrifices who did not attempt to enslave the mind by dogmas who never disputed the powers of the magistrates and who introduced no discord among mankind you have the face to ask what you must substitute in the place of your fables as will be seen by his exclamation on his deathbed, voltaire was no believer in the divinity of christ he disbelieved the bible in toto the accounts of the doings of the jewish kings as represented in the old testament he has unsparingly ridiculed in the drama of saul the quiet irony of the following will be easily appreciated divinity of jesus the socinians who are regarded as blasphemers do not recognize the divinity of jesus christ they dare to pretend with the philosophers of antiquity with the jews the mahometans and most other nations that the idea of a god man is monstrous that the distance from god to man is infinite 
and that it is impossible for a perishable body to be infinite immense or eternal they have the confidence to quote eusebius bishop of caesarea in their favor who in his ecclesiastical history book one chapter nine declares that it is absurd to imagine the uncreated and unchangeable nature of almighty god taking the form of man they cite the fathers of the church justin and tertullian who have said the same thing justin in his dialogue with trophonius and tertullian in his discourse against praxius they quote st paul who never calls jesus christ god and who calls him man very often they carry their audacity so far as to affirm that the christians passed three entire ages in forming by degrees the apotheosis of jesus and that they only raised this astonishing edifice by the example of the pagans who had deified mortals at first according to them jesus was only regarded as a man inspired by god and then as a creature more perfect than others they gave him some time after a place above the angels as st paul tells us every day added to his greatness he in time became an emanation proceeding from god this was not enough he was even born before time at last he was god consubstantial with god crelius volkelsius natalus alexander and hornbeck have supported all these blasphemies by arguments which astonish the wise and mislead the weak above all faustus sosinus spread the seeds of this doctrine in europe and at the end of the sixteenth century a new species of christianity was established there were already more than three hundred philosophical dictionary volume one page four o five though a firm and consistent believer in the being of a god voltaire was no bigot the calm reasoning of the following passage does honor to its author faith divine faith about which so much has been written is evidently nothing more than incredulity brought under subjection for we certainly have no other faculty than the understanding by which we can believe and the objects of faith are not those of the understanding we can believe only what appears to be true and nothing can appear true but in one of the three following ways by intuition or feeling as i exist i see the sun or by an accumulation of probability amounting to certainty as there is a city called constantinople or by positive demonstration as triangles of the same base and height are equal faith therefore being nothing at all of this description can no more be a belief a persuasion than it can be yellow or red it can be nothing but the annihilation of reason a silence of adoration at the contemplation of things absolutely incomprehensible thus speaking philosophically no person believes the trinity no person believes that the same body can be in a thousand places at once and he who says i believe these mysteries will see beyond the possibility of a doubt if he reflects for a moment on what passes in his mind that these words mean no more than i respect the mysteries i submit myself to those who announce them for they agree with me that my real reason their own reason believe them not but it is clear if my reason is not persuaded i am not persuaded and my reason cannot possibly be two different things it is an absolute contradiction that i should receive that as true which my understanding rejects as false faith therefore is nothing but submissive or deferential incredulity but why should this submission be exercised when my understanding invincibly recoils the reason we well know is that my understanding has been persuaded that the mysteries of my faith are laid down by god himself all then that i can do as a reasonable being is to be silent and adore that is what divines call external faith and this faith neither is nor can be anything more than respect for things incomprehensible in consequence of the reliance i place on those who teach them if god himself were to say to me thought is of an olive color 
the square of a certain number is bitter i should certainly understand nothing at all from these words i could not adopt them either as true or false but i will repeat them if he commands me to do it and i will make others repeat them at the risk of my life this is faith it is nothing more than obedience in order to obtain a foundation then for this obedience it is merely necessary to examine the books which require it our understanding therefore should investigate the books of the old and new testament just as it would plutarch or livy and if it finds in them incontestable and decisive evidences evidences obvious to all minds and such as would be admitted by men of all nations that god himself is their author then it is our incumbent duty to subject our understanding to the yoke of faith prayer we know of no religion without prayers even the jews had them although there was no public form of prayer among them before the time when they sang their canticles in their synagogues which did not take place until a late period the people of all nations whether actuated by desires or fears have summoned the assistance of the divinity philosophers however more respectful to the supreme being and rising more above human weakness have been habituated to substitute for prayer resignation this in fact is all that appears proper and suitable between creature and creator but philosophy is not adapted to the great mass of mankind it soars too highly above the vulgar it speaks a language they are unable to comprehend to propose philosophy to them would be just as weak as to propose the study of conic sections to peasants or fishwomen. Among philosophers themselves I know of no one besides Maximus Tyrius who has treated of this subject. The following is the substance of his ideas upon it. The designs of God exist from all eternity. If the object prayed for be conformable to his immutable will, it must be perfectly useless to request of him the very thing which he has determined to do. If he is prayed to for the reverse of what he has determined to do, he is prayed to be weak, fickle, and inconstant. Such a prayer implies that this is thought to be his character, and is nothing better than ridicule or mockery of him you either request of him what is just and right in which case he ought to do it and it will be actually done without any solicitation which in fact shows distrust of his rectitude or what you request is unjust and then you insult him you are either worthy or unworthy of the favor you implore if worthy he knows it better than you do yourself if unworthy, you commit an additional crime in requesting that which you do not merit. In a word, we offer up prayers to God only because we have made him after our own image. We treat him like a pasha or a sultan who is capable of being exasperated and appeased. In short, all nations pray to God. The sage is resigned and obeys him. Let us pray with the people, and let us be resigned to him with the sage. We have already spoken of the public prayer of many nations, and of those of the Jews. That people have had one from time immemorial, which deserves all our attention, from its resemblance to the prayer taught us by Jesus Christ himself. This Jewish prayer is called the Kaddish, and begins with these words, O oh, God, let thy name be magnified and sanctified, make thy kingdom to prevail, let redemption flourish, and the Messiah come quickly. As this Kaddish is recited in Chaldee, it has induced the believer that it is as ancient as the captivity, and that it was at that period that the Jews began to hope for a Messiah, a liberator or redeemer, whom they have since prayed for in the seasons of their calamities voltaire's contempt for the bible led him to use the language of holy writ in the coarsest jokes although perhaps with such material the jokes could not well be otherwise than coarse the following letter he addressed to m bayonne intendant of lyons on account of a poor jew taken up for uttering contraband goods this kind of writing obtained for voltaire the title of scoffer 
blessings on the old testament which gives me this opportunity of telling you that amongst all those who adore the new there is not one more devoted to your service than myself a certain descendant of jacob a peddler as all these gentlemen are whilst he is waiting for the messiah waits also for your protection which at present he has the most need of some honest men of the first trade of st matthew who gather together the jews and christians at the gates of your city have seized something in the breeches pocket of an israelitish page belonging to the poor circumcised who has the honor to tender you this billet with all proper submission and humility i beg you leave to join my amen to his at a venture i but just saw you at paris as moses saw the deity and should be very happy in seeing you face to face if the word face can any ways be applied to me preserve some remembrance of your old eternal humble servant who loves you with that chaste and tender affection which the religious solomon had for his three hundred shuhamites voltaire's prodigious wit and sarcasm were so exuberant that he expended them upon all people and all subjects even himself when occasion admitted of it in one of his letters addressed to the elector palatine september ninth seventeen sixty one he gives this excuse for not attending at the court i should really make an excellent figure amidst the rejoicings of your electoral highness it was only i think in the egypt of antiquity that skeletons were admitted to a place in their festivals to say the truth my lord it is all over with me i laugh indeed sometimes but i am forced to acknowledge that pain is an evil it is a comfort to me that your highness is well but i am fitter for an extreme unction than a baptism may the peace serve for an era to mark the prince's birth and may his august father preserve his regard for and accept the profound respects of his little swiss voltaire in politics voltaire was not very far advanced he seems to have had no idea of a nation without a king a monarch who should not commit any very flagrant acts of tyranny was as much as he appeared to desire he evidently did not foresee the great revolution that was so soon to burst forth in france but that he mainly contributed by his writings to bring it about there can be no doubt his influence upon the men of his time both in france and europe is ably depicted by such writers as lamartine quinet and brougham voltaire's was the one great mind of his day whose thoughts engrossed the attention of all men he was great by his learning his genius and his benevolence and this man was the champion of reason the enemy of superstition and an infidel quinet in his lectures on the romish church says i watch for forty years the reign of one man who is in himself the spiritual director not of his country but of his age from the corner of his chamber he governs the kingdom of spirits intellects are every day regulated by his one word written by his hand traverses europe princes love and kings fear him they think they are not sure of their kingdom if he be not with them whole nations on their side adopt without discussion and emulously repeat every syllable that falls from his pen who exercises this incredible power which had been nowhere seen since the middle ages is he another gregory the second is he a pope no voltaire we conclude our little sketch with the eloquent words of lamartine who describes in a few sentences the inestimable services rendered to free thought and intellectual progression by the sage of Fernet if we judge of men by what they have done then voltaire is incontestably the greatest writer of modern europe no one has caused through the powerful influence of his genius alone and the perseverance of his will so great a commotion in the minds of men his pen aroused a world and has shaken a far mightier empire than that of charlemagne the european empire of a theocracy his genius was not force but light heaven had destined him not to destroy but to illuminate and wherever he trod light followed him for reason which is light had destined him to be first her poet then her apostle 
and lastly her idol. End of chapter 7 of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh Read for you by Ted DeLorme Chapter number eight of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Chapter eight. John Toland. In the Augustan age of free thought, no British writer achieved more renown or performed greater services to biblical criticism than John Toland. His life would fill a volume, while his works would stock a library. True to his convictions, he spoke like a man and died as a hero. His books are strewn with classical illustrations, and deal so with abstract and to us uninteresting arguments, that we shall simply give a brief sketch of the life of this extraordinary man. He gave his thoughts to the scholars at the same time that Woolston addressed the people. Conjointly they revolutionized opinion in our favor. Toland was born on November 30th, 1670, at Londonderry, in Ireland. It is said his registered name was James Junius, another account says Julius Caesar, but we have been unable to find any authentic date for either supposition, and whatever his name was registered, we have indisputable evidence that he was always called John Toland. We have less proof as to his parentage. Some writers allege that he was the natural son of a Catholic priest, while others contend that he was born of a family once affluent but at the time of his birth in very reduced circumstances. Whether this was the case, or the reverse, young Tolland received a liberal education. He was early taught the classics, studied in the Glasgow College, and on leaving Glasgow he was presented with letters of credit from the city magistrates, highly flattering to him, as a man and a scholar. He received the diploma of A.M. at Edinburgh, the day previous to the Battle of the Boyne, he finished his studies at the University of Leyden. The first work of importance which Toland published was A Life of John Milton, containing besides the history of his works several extraordinary characters of men and books, sects, parties, and opinions. This work, being violently opposed, was speedily followed by A Mentor, or A Defense of Milton's Life, containing one, a general apology for all writings of that kind, Two, a catalogue of books attributed in the primitive times to Jesus Christ, his apostles, and other eminent persons, with several important remarks relating to the canon of Scripture. Three, a complete history of the book, entitled Icon Basilica, proving Dr. Gowden and not King Charles I to be the author of it, etc. Those works established the fame of Toland, as well as formed the groundwork for persecution which hunted him even on his deathbed. In the year 1699, Toland collected, edited, and published from the original manuscripts the whole of the works of James Harrington, prefixed by a memoir of this extraordinary theorist. In his preface, he says that he composed this work in his beloved retirement at Cannon near Banstead in Surrey. From this, along with other excerpts scattered throughout his works, we cannot but infer that at the outset of his career he possessed a moderate competence of worldly wealth and social position. He says his idea was to transmit to posterity the worthy memory of James Harrington, a bright ornament to useful learning, a hearty lover of his native country, and a generous benefactor to the whole world a person who obscured the false lustre of our modern politicians, and equalled, if not exceeded, all the ancient legislators. This to us is an interesting fact, for it shows the early unanimity which existed between the earlier reformers in politics and those of theology. The supervision of the Oceana by Toland bears the same inferential analogy, as if Mr. Holyoke were the biographer and publisher of the New Moral World and its author. In 1700 he published Anglia Libera, or The Limitation and Succession of the Crown of England, Explained and Asserted, etc. 
this book is concluded by the following apothegm assuring the people that no king can ever be so good as one of their own making as there is no title equal to their approbation which is the only divine right of all magistracy for the voice of the people is the voice of god in seventeen o two tollen spent some time in germany publishing a series of letters to a friend in holland entitled some remarks on the king of prussia's country on his government his court and his numerous palaces about this time appeared the art of governing by parties this was always a favorite subject of the old freethinkers and is still further elucidated by bolingbroke in seventeen o seven he published a large treatise in english and latin as a philippic oration to incite the english against the french a work i have never seen we now return to an earlier date and shall trace the use of his theological works the first of note sixteen ninety six was christianity not mysterious showing that there is nothing in the gospel contrary to reason nor above it and that no christian doctrine can be properly called a mystery as soon as this book was issued from the press it was attacked with unmanly virulence one man peter brown who was more disgustingly opposed to tollen than the rest was made a bishop and by far the greatest majority amongst the anglican clergy who attacked him were all rewarded by honors and preferment the author was accused of making himself a new heresiarch that there was a tradition amongst the irish that he was to be a second cromwell and that tolland himself boasted that before he was forty years old he would be governor over a greater country than cromwell and that he would be the head over a new religion before he was thirty one of his opponents publicly stigmatizes him as saying that he tolland himself designed to be as great an impostor as mahomet and more powerful than the pope while the puritans denounced him as a disguised jesuit and the papists as a rancorous nonconformist to complete the comedy the irish parliament condemned his book to be publicly burnt some ecclesiastics loudly murmuring that the author should be burned with it others more moderate were anxious that tollen should burn it himself while at last they came to a unanimous resolution to burn it in front of the threshold of his door so that when the author appeared he would be obliged to step over the ashes of his own book which was accordingly done amid the brutal cheers of an ignorant and infuriated populace as a proof of the high esteem in which tolland was held by the few able and liberal men of the day we extract the following account from the correspondence of john locke and mr molyneux the latter gentleman writing to the former says i am told the author of christianity not mysterious is of this country and that his name is tolland but he is a stranger in these parts i believe if he belongs to this kingdom he has been a good while out of it or i have not heard of any such remarkable man among us in another letter the same writer says in my last letter to you there was a passage relating to the author of christianity not mysterious i did not then think he was so near me as within the bounds of this city but i find since that he has come over hither and have had the favor of a visit from him i now understand that he was born in this country but that he has been a great while abroad and his education was for some time under the great leclerc but that for which i can never honor him too much is his acquaintance and friendship to you and the respect which upon all occasions he expresses for you i propose a great deal of satisfaction in his conversation i take him to be a candid freethinker and a good scholar but there is a violent sort of spirit which reigns here which begins already to show itself against him and i believe will increase daily for i find the clergy alarmed to a mighty degree against him and last sunday he had his welcome to this city by hearing himself harangued against out of the pulpit by a prelate of this country locke's posthumous works edited by de Mazieux. mr locke in return says for the man i wish very well and could give you if it needed proofs that i do so and therefore i desire you to be kind to him 
but i must leave it to your prudence in what way and how far for it will be his fault alone if he proves not a very valuable man and have not you for his friend to this mr molyneux writes to mr locke i look upon mr tolland as a very ingenious man and i should be very glad of any opportunity of doing him service to which i think myself indispensably bound by your recommendation soon after this mr molyneux describes the treatment tolland underwent in ireland in another letter to locke he has had his opposers here as you will find by a book which i have sent to you the author peter brown is my acquaintance but two things i shall never forgive in his book the one is the foul language and opprobrious names he gives mr tolland the other is upon several occasions calling in the aid of the civil magistrate and delivering up mr tolland to secular punishment this indeed is a killing argument but some will be apt to say that where the strength of his reason failed him then he flies to the strength of his sword and this reminds me of a business that was very surprising to many the presentment of some pernicious books and their authors by the grand jury of middlesex this is looked upon as a matter of dangerous consequence to make our civil courts judges of religious doctrines and no one knows upon a change of affairs whose turn it may be next to be condemned but the example has been followed in this country and mr tolland and his book have been presented here by a grand jury not one of whom i am persuaded ever read one leaf in christianity not mysterious let the sorbonne for ever now be silent a learned grand jury directed by as learned a judge does the business much better the dissenters here were the chief promoters of this matter but when i asked one of them what if a violent church of england jury should present mr baxter's books as pernicious and condemn them to the flames by the common executioner he was sensible of the error and said he wished it had never been done mr locke in his reply coincides with his friend and says the dissenters had best consider but they are a sort of men which will always be the same a remark which one hundred fifty years has not failed in its truthfulness mr molyneux concludes his remarks in reference to tolland as follows mr tolland is at length driven out of our kingdom the poor gentleman at last wanted a meal's meat and the universal outcry of the clergy ran so strong against him that none durst admit him to their tables the little stock of money which he had was soon exhausted he fell to borrowing and to complete his hardships the parliament fell on his book voted it to be burnt by the common hangman and ordered the author to be taken into custody by the sergeant-at-arms and to be prosecuted by the attorney-general hereupon he is fled out of this kingdom and none here knows where he has directed his course from this correspondence we glean the following facts that john locke and mr molyneux were favorable to free thought that on locke's authority tolland possessed abilities of no common order that tolland was unjustly persecuted and he met with the sympathy of the liberals tolland having received a foretaste of his country's vengeance retired for two years to germany where he was welcomed by the first scholars of the age hearing that the house of convocation in london was about to denounce two of his works as heretical christianity not mysterious and amintor he hastened to england and published two letters to the prolocutor which were never laid before convocation he insisted that he should be heard in his own defence before sentence was passed on his works but as usual this wish was denied him a legal difficulty prevented the bishops from prosecuting the works and tolland gave the world a full account in his vindicius liberius the letters to serena written in a bold honest unflinching manner were the next performances of tolland the first letter is on the origin and force of prejudices it is founded on a reflection of cicero that all prejudices spring from moral and not physical sources and while all admit the power of the senses to be infallible all strive to corrupt the judgment by false metaphor and unjust premises tolland traces the progress of superstition from the hands of a midwife to those of a priest 
and shows how the nurse parent schoolmaster professor philosopher and politician all combine to warp the mind of man by fallacies from his progress in childhood at school at college and in the world how the child is blinded with an idea and the man with a word the second letter is a history of the soul's immortality among the heathens a lady had been reading plater's phaedo and remarked as to how cato could derive any consolation from the slippery and vague suppositions of that verbiant dialogue toland therefore for her edification drew up a list of the specifications of the ancients on the subject analyzing in its progress the varying phases of the fables of the elysian fields the charons the Styx, etc deriving them all from the ancient egyptians toland thought the idea had arisen among the people like our witches ghosts and fairy stories and subsequently defended by the philosophers who sought to rule their passions by finding arguments for their superstitions and thus the rise of their exoteric and esoteric doctrines were the first foundations of the belief in the immortality of the soul the third letter is on the origin of idolatry or as it might rather be called a history of the follies of mankind he traces the causes the origin and the science of superstition its phenomena and its devotees proving that all the sacrifices prayers and customs of idolatry are the same in all ages they only differ in language and adaptability of climate and that with the fall of judicial astrology idolatry received its greatest blow for while men thought that priests could control destiny they feared them but this idea destroyed it removed the terror which so long had existed as an immediate object betwixt the man and this sacerdotal tyrant in letter fourth addressed to a gentleman in holland showing spinoza's system of philosophy to be without any principle or foundation and in the concluding article toland argues that motion is essential to matter in answer to some remarks by a noble friend on the above in the fifteenth section of this argument toland thus rebuts the allegation that were motion indissolubly connected with matter there must be extension without surface for motion or matter to exert their respective powers upon it is often used as an argument that if a vase was filled with any commodity to the utmost extent where would be the space for motion we know that in a kettle of water if there is no outlet for the steam which is the motion of the water the kettle will burst toland says you own most bodies are in actual motion which can be no argument that they have been always so or that there are not others in actual repose i grant that such a consequence does not necessarily follow though the thing may itself be true but however it may not be amiss to consider how far this actual motion reaches and is allowed before we come to treat of rest though the matter of the universe be everywhere the same yet according to its various modifications it is conceived to be divided into numberless particular systems vortices or whirlpools of matter and these again are subdivided into other systems greater or less which depend on one another as every one on the whole in their centres textures frame and coherence our sun is the centre of one of the larger systems which contains a great many small ones within the sphere of its activity as all the planets which move about it and these are subdivided into lesser systems that depend on them as his satellites wait upon jupiter and the moon on the earth the earth again is divided into the atmosphere ground water and other principal parts these again into the vegetable animal and mineral kingdoms now as all these depend in a link on one another so their matter is mutually resolved into each other for earth air fire and water are not only closely blended and united but likewise interchangeable transformed in a perpetual revolution earth becoming water water air air ether and so back again in mixtures without end or number 
the animals we destroy contribute to preserve us till we are destroyed to preserve other things and become parts of grass or plants or water or air or something else that helps to make other animals and they one another or other men and these again into stone or wood or metals or minerals or animals again or become parts of all these and of a great many other things animals or vegetables daily consuming and devouring each other so true it is that everything lives by the destruction of another all the parts of the universe are in this constant motion of destroying and begetting of begetting and destroying and the greater systems are acknowledged to have their ceaseless movements as well as the smallest particles the very central globes of the vortices revolving on their own axis and every particle in the vortex gravitating towards the center our bodies however we may flatter ourselves do not differ from those of other creatures but like them receive increase or diminution by nutrition or evacuation by accretion transpiration and other ways giving some parts of ours to other bodies and receiving again of theirs not altogether the same yesterday as to-day nor to continue the same to-morrow being alive in a perpetual flux like a river and in the total dissolution of our system at death to become parts of a thousand other things at once our bodies partly mixing with the dust and the water of the earth partly exhaled and evaporated into the air flying to so many different places mixing and incorporating with numerous things no parts of matter are bounded to any one figure or form losing and changing their figures and forms continually that is being in perpetual motion dipped or worn or ground to pieces or dissolved by other parts acquiring their figures and these theirs and so on incessantly earth air fire and water iron wood and marble plants and animals being rarefied condensed liquefied congealed dissolved coagulated or any other way resolved into one another the whole face of the earth exhibits those mutations every moment to our eyes nothing continuing one hour numerically the same and these changes being but several kinds of motion are therefore the incontestable effects of universal action but the changes in the parts make no change in the universe for it is manifest that the continual alterations successions revolutions and transmutations of matter cause no accession or diminution therein no more than any letter is added or lost in the alphabet by the endless combinations and transpositions thereof into so many different words and languages for a thing no sooner quits one form than it puts on another leaving as it were the theatre in a certain dress and appearing again in a new one which produces a perpetual youthfulness and vigor without any decay or decrepitness of the world as some have falsely imagined contrary to reason and experience the world with all the parts and kinds thereof continuing at all times in the same condition but the species still continue by propagation notwithstanding the decay of the individuals and the death of our bodies is but matter going to be dressed in some new form the impressions may vary but the wax continues still the same and indeed death is in effect the very same thing with our birth for as to die is only to cease to be what we formerly were so to be born is to begin to be something which we were not before considering the numberless successive generations that have inhabited this globe returning at death into the common mass of the same 
mixing with all the other parts thereof and to this the incessant river-like flowing and transpiration of matter every moment from the bodies of men while they live as well as their daily nourishment inspiration of air and other additions of matter to their bulk it seems probable that there is no particle of matter on the whole earth which has not been a part of man nor is this reasoning confined to our own species but remains as true of every order of animals or plants or any other beings since they have been all resolved into one another by ceaseless revolutions so that nothing is more certain than that every material thing is all things and that all things are but manifestations of one in his reply to Watton, who attacks those letters to Serena, Tullin says they were addressed to a lady, the most accomplished then in the world. The name of the lady will probably remain forever a mystery. In 1718 he published the celebrated work Nazarenus, or Jewish Gentile and Mohammedan Christianity, which caused an immense sensation at the time it appeared, and led to his Manganentes, seventeen twenty a work singularly profound and effective in the same year he gave the world tetradimus containing hodigus or the pillar of cloud and fire that guided the israelites in the wilderness not miraculous but a thing equally practised by other nations and or of the exoteric and esoteric philosophy and hypatia there is a long preface to those books from under an elm in binsbury or chebham's camp on the warren at the south end of wimbledon common 1720 about this time pantheisticon appeared written as a caricature on church liturgies which archdeacon hare denounced as downright atheism along with the above toland wrote a multitude of small pamphlets he translated the fables of aesop and published a poem entitled cleto which caused much excitement at the time and as it represented tollen's ideal character we reprinted it in the london investigator his earlier political works were esteemed so valuable in the defence of the protestant succession and advancing the interests of the elector subsequently king of england that in one of his visits paid to that court he was presented by the electress with miniature portraits of herself and family the following is a catalogue of the works of toland which have never yet been published and the works in which they are mentioned the history of socrates in the life of harrington systems of divinity exploded an epistolary dissertation in christianity not mysterious the history of the canon of the new testament in nazarenus republica mosaica in nazarenus a treatise concerning tradition in tetradimus there were several other works part of them written which passed into the hands of lord molesworth we believe part of which were published and the history of the druid and also giordano bruno but whether they exist at the present time or not we are unable to say there is also great difficulty in deciding as to the manner of Toland's life. Of this, however, we are certain that he caused great opposition in his own day, and he was patronized by able men. He edited an edition of Lord Shaftesbury's letters, and published a work of that noble lord's surreptitiously. He mingled amongst the German courts, and appeared on terms of equality with the elite of the philosophers and the aristocracy. The brief memoir prefaced to one of his works is an epistolary document addressed to a noble lord. His acquaintance with Locke, Shaftesbury, Collins, Molesworth, and Molyneux must have proceeded from other causes than his genius, or why was Toland exalted when Mandeville, Chubb, and the brave Woolston are never so much as alluded to? We consider that there is a strong probability that he was wealthy or at least possessed of a moderate competence his abilities were of a curious order he seemed to be one of a school which rose about this time to advocate free thought but shackled by a dogma his collegiate education gave him an early liking for the dead languages and he carried out the notion of the ancients that the exoteric or esoteric methods were still in force 
from a careful perusal of the works of the fathers and the contemporary books of the heathens he fancied that all the superstitions in the world differed but in degree that religion was but the organic cause of superstition the arguments made for it by the philosophers to propitiate the vulgar this idea in the main was agreed to by woolston although his violent discourses which were addressed to the unlearned contain within them the germ of their intrinsic popularity yet even woolston's works notwithstanding their bluff exterior had something more within them than what the people could appreciate or even the present race of freethinkers can always understand for underneath that unrivalled vein of sarcasm there was in every instance an esoteric view which comprehended the meaning by which the earlier christians understood the gospels and rendered them on the same scale as the works of the ancients the renowned William Whiston was another who interpreted scripture in a similar manner. All those writers would have been Swedenborgians if there had been no free thought, while Whiston would have been an atheist had there been no representative of that school. We do not consider Toland, then, as an absolute deist. At that time the age was not so far progressed as to admit a biblical scholar into the extreme advanced list and when a man has spent the whole of his childhood in a sectarian family and his youth and early manhood in a university it is an impossibility to throw off at one struggle the whole of his past ideas he may be unfettered in thought and valiant in speech still there is the encyclopedia of years hanging upon him as a drag to that extreme development which he wishes but cannot bring his passions to follow not that we would by any means observe that Tolland was comparatively behind his age, but that even in his more daring works he still had a vague idea of scripture being partly inspired, although overlaid with a mass of ecclesiastical verbiage. It also seems a mystery how the works of Woolston could be condemned, his person seized, while in the case of Tolland we hear of nothing but his works being burnt why was convocation so idle why make idle threats and let their victim ramble at large was it because the one had powerful friends and the other had none or was it that in the earlier portion of the career of toland the invisible hand of bolingbroke stayed the grasp of persecution or was shaftesbury's memory so esteemed that his friend was untouched those particulars we cannot learn, but they will take rank with other parallel cases, as when the same government prosecuted Payne and gave Gibbon a sinecure, or, nearer our own times, when a series of men were imprisoned for atheism, and Sir William Molesworth published similar sentiments without hindrance. In The History of the Soul's Immortality, Toland thus gives the explanation respecting the exoteric and esoteric doctrines of Pythagoras. Pythagoras himself did not believe the transmigration which has made his name so famous to posterity, for in the internal or secret doctrine he meant no more than the eternal revolution of forms in matter, those ceaseless vicissitudes and alterations which turn everything into all things, and all things into anything as vegetables and animals become part of us we become part of them and both become parts of a thousand other things in the universe each turning into water water into air etc and so back again in mixtures without end or number but in the external or popular doctrine he imposed on the mob by an equivocal expression that they should become various kinds of beasts after death thereby to deter them the more effectually from wickedness though the poets embellished their pieces with the opinion of the soul's immortality yet a great number of them utterly rejected it for seneca was not single in saying not after death and death itself is not of a quick race only the utmost goal then may the saints lose all their hope of heaven and sinners quit their racky fears of hell we now dismiss john toland from our view he was one of the most honest brave truthful and scholastic of the old deists 
his memory will be borne on the wings of centuries and if ever a true millennium does arise the name of this sterling freethinker will occupy one of the brightest niches in its pantheon of worthies end of chapter eight of ancient and modern celebrated freethinkers by charles bradlaugh read for you by ted delorme Chapter 9 of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Chapter 9 Comte de Volney. Constantine Francis Chasbeuf de Volney was born on February 3, 1757, at Craon in Anjou. His father, a distinguished advocate, not wishing his son to bear the name of Chasbeuf, resolved that he should assume that of Boisgirais. With this name, Constantine Francis was first known in the world, studying at the college of Ancenis and Angers. He afterwards commenced his oriental travels, changing his name to Volney. At the age of seventeen, finding himself his own master, and possessed of fifty franc a year inherited from his mother, he went to Paris, in order to study the sciences, preferring the study of medicine and physiology, although giving great attention to history and the ancient languages. On inheriting a legacy of 240 francs, he visited Egypt and Syria, starting on foot, a knapsack on his back, a gun on his shoulder, and his 240 francs in gold concealed in a belt. When he arrived in Egypt, he shut himself up for eight months in a Coptic monastery, in order to learn Arabic, after which he commenced his travels through Egypt and Syria, returning to France after an absence of four years and publishing his Voyage in Egypt et in Syrie, which was acknowledged by the French army on their conquering Egypt to be the only book that had never deceived them. The French government named him Director of Commerce and Agriculture in Corsica, but being elected a deputy of the Terres Etats at the Seneschaux of Anjou, he resigned the government appointment, holding the maxim that a national deputy ought not in any way to be a pensioner. He opposed all secret deliberations, and wished to admit the constituents and the citizens. He was made secretary on the 23rd of November, 1790, and in the debates which arose upon the power of the king to determine peace and war, Volney proposed and carried the resolution that the French nation renounces from this moment the undertaking of any war tending to increase their territory. In 1792 he accompanied Pazzo di Borgo to Corsica, in compliance with invitations from many influential inhabitants who sought his information. In Corsica he became acquainted with Napoleon Bonaparte who was then an artillery officer, and some years after, hearing that Bonaparte had obtained the command of the army of Italy, Volney exclaimed, If circumstances favor him, we shall see the head of a Caesar upon the shoulders of an Alexander. When Volney returned to Paris, he published an account of the state of Corsica. He was afterwards appointed professor of history, attracting large audiences, but the normal school being suppressed, he embarked for the United States of America in 1795. He was received by Washington, who bestowed publicly on him marks of honor and friendship. In 1798, Volney returned to France, and gave up to his mother-in-law the property which he was entitled to from the death of his father, which had just occurred. During his absence he had been chosen a member of the Institute. Bonaparte also, on Volney's return, tried to win his esteem and assistance, soliciting him as colleague in the consulship, but he refused the cooperation, as also the office of Minister of the Interior. Seldom do men find so many inducements to accept office as were offered to Volney 
and seldom do men appear who are disinterested enough to reject the inducements then held out to him although he refused to work with the ruling powers of that day he never ceased to work for the people he occupied himself till the last year of his life in giving to the world that literature which will never be forgotten it would be impossible to notice all the works written by such an indefatigable thinker as the heretic of our sketch we ought to mention however that subsequently to his being made peer of france by louis the eighteenth and when there existed an intention of crowning louis volney published the history of samuel the inventor of royal coronations this book represents samuel as an impostor saul as the blind instrument of sacerdotal cunning and david as an ambitious youth in september seventeen ninety one volney presented to the assembly the ruins or meditations on the revolutions of empires a book which will immortalize him in the memory of freethinkers the originality of style and the eloquence of expression cannot fail to interest all who read it we give the following extracts from the above work but as it contains so much that ought to be read we must return to the subject in another number legislators friends of evidence and of truth that the subject of which we treat should be involved in so many clouds is by no means astonishing since beside the difficulties that are peculiar to it thought itself has till this moment ever had shackles imposed upon it and free inquiry by the intolerance of every religious system been interdicted but now that thought is unrestrained and may develop all its powers we will expose in the face of day and submit to the common judgment of assembled nations such rational truths as unprejudiced minds have by long and laborious study discovered and this not with the design of imposing them as a creed but from a desire of provoking new lights and obtaining better information chiefs and instructors of the people you are not ignorant of the profound obscurity in which the nature origin and history of the dogmas you teach are enveloped imposed by force and authority inculcated by education maintained by the influence of example they were perpetuated from age to age and habit and inattention strengthened their empire but if man enlightened by experience and reflection summon to the bar of mature examination the prejudices of his infancy he presently discovers a multitude of incongruities and contradictions which awaken his sagacity and call forth the exertion of his reasoning powers at first remarking the various and opposite creeds into which nations are divided we are led boldly to reject the infallibility claimed by each and arming ourselves alternately with their reciprocal pretensions to conceive that the senses and the understanding emanating directly from god are a law not less sacred and a guide not less sure than the indirect and contradictory codes of the prophets if we proceed to examine the texture of the codes themselves we shall observe that their pretended divine laws that is to say laws immutable and eternal have risen from the complexion of times of places and of persons that these codes issue one from another in a kind of genealogical order mutually borrowing a common and similar fund of ideas which every institutor modifies agreeably to his fancy if we ascend to the source of those ideas we shall find that it is lost in the night of time in the infancy of nations in the very origin of the world to which they claim alliance 
and there immersed in the obscurity of chaos and the fabulous empire of tradition they are attended with so many prodigies as to be seemingly inaccessible to the human understanding but this prodigious state of things gives birth to a ray of reasoning that resolves the difficulty for if the miracles held out in systems of religion have actually existed if for instance metamorphoses apparitions and the conversations of one or more gods recorded in the sacred books of the hindus the hebrews and the parses are indeed events in real history it follows that nature in those times was perfectly unlike the nature that we are acquainted with now that men of the present age are totally different from the men that formerly existed but consequently that we ought not to trouble our heads about them on the contrary if those miraculous facts have had no real existence in the physical order of things they must be regarded solely as productions of the human intellect and the nature of man at this day capable of making the most fantastic combinations explains the phenomenon of those monsters in history the only difficulty is to ascertain how and for what purpose the imagination invented them if we examine with attention the subjects that are exhibited by them if we analyze the ideas which they combine and associate and weigh with accuracy all their concomitant circumstances we shall find a solution perfectly conformable to the laws of nature those fabulous stories have a figurative sense different from their apparent one they are founded on simple and physical facts but these facts being ill-conceived and erroneously represented have been disfigured and changed from their original nature by accidental causes dependent on the human mind by the confusion of signs made use of in the representation of objects by the equivocation of words the defect of language and the imperfection of writing these gods for example who act such singular parts in every system are no other than the physical powers of nature the elements the winds the meteors the stars all which have been personified by the necessary mechanism of language and the manner in which objects are conceived by the understanding their life their manners their actions are only the operation of the same powers and the whole of their pretended history no more than a description of their various phenomena traced by the first naturalist that observed them but taken in a contrary sense by the vulgar who did not understand it or by succeeding generations who forgot it in a word all the theological dogmas respecting the origin of the world the nature of god the revelation of his laws the manifestation of his person are but recitals of astronomical facts figurative and emblematical narratives of the motion and influence of the heavenly bodies the very idea itself of the divinity which is at present so obscure abstracted and metaphysical was in its origin merely a composite of the powers of the material universe considered sometimes analytically as they appear in their agents and their phenomena and sometimes synthetically as forming one whole and exhibiting an harmonious revelation in all its parts thus the name of god has been bestowed sometimes upon the wind upon fire water and the elements sometimes upon the sun the stars the planets and their influences sometimes upon the universe at large and the matter of which the world is composed sometimes upon abstract and metaphysical properties such as space 
duration motion and intelligence but in every instance the idea of a deity has not flowed from the miraculous revelation of an invisible world but has been the natural result of human reflection has followed the progress and undergone the changes of the successive improvement of intellect and has had for its subject the visible universe and its different agents it is then in vain that nations refer the origin of their religion to heavenly inspiration it is in vain that they pretend to describe a supernatural state of things as first in order of events the original barbarous state of mankind attested by their own monuments belies all their assertions these assertions are still more victoriously refuted by considering this great principle that man receives no ideas but through the medium of his senses for from hence it appears that every system which ascribes human wisdom to any other source than experience and sensation includes in it a hysteron vroteron and represents the last results of understanding as earliest in the order of time if we examine the different religious systems which have been formed respecting the actions of the gods and the origin of the world we shall discover at every turn an anticipation in the order of narrating things which could only be suggested by subsequent reflection reason then emboldened by these contradictions hesitates not to reject whatever does not accord with the nature of things and accepts nothing for historical truth that is not capable of being established by argument and ratiocination its ideas and suggestions are as follows before any nation received from a neighbor nation dogmas already invented before one generation inherited the ideas of another none of these complicated systems had existence the first men the children of nature whose consciousness was anterior to experience and who brought no preconceived knowledge into the world with them were born without any idea of those articles of faith which are the result of learned contention of those religious rites which had relation to arts and practices not yet in existence of those precepts which supposed the passions already developed of those laws which have reference to a language and a social order hereafter to be produced of that god whose attributes are abstractions of the knowledge of nature and the idea of whose conduct is suggested by the experience of a despotic government in fine of that soul and those spiritual existences which are said not to be the object of the senses but which however we must forever have remained unacquainted with if our senses had not introduced them to us previously to arriving at these notions an immense catalogue of existing facts must have been observed man originally savage must have learned from repeated trials the use of his organs successive generations must have invented and refined upon the means of subsistence and the understanding at liberty to disengage itself from the wants of nature must have risen to the complicated art of comparing ideas digesting reasonings and seizing upon abstract similitudes it was not till after having surmounted those obstacles and run a long career in the night of history that man reflecting on his state began to perceive his subjection to forces superior to his own and independent of his will the sun gave him light and warmth fire burned thunder terrified the winds buffeted water overwhelmed him all the various natural existences acted upon him in a manner not to be resisted 
for a long time an automaton he remained passive without inquiring into the cause of this action but the very moment he was desirous of accounting to himself for it astonishment seized his mind and passing from the surprise of a first thought to the reverie of curiosity he formed a chain of reasoning at first considering only the action of the elements upon him he inferred relatively to himself an idea of weakness of subjection and relatively to them an idea of power of domination and this idea was the primitive and fundamental type of all his conceptions of the divinity the action of the natural existences in the second place excited in him sensations of pleasure or pain of good or evil by virtue of his organization he conceived love or aversion for them he desired or dreaded their presence and fear or hope was the principle of every idea of religion afterwards judging everything by comparison and remarking in those beings a motion spontaneous like his own he supposed there to be a will an intelligence inherent in that motion of a nature similar to what existed in himself and hence by way of inference he started a fresh argument having experienced that certain modes of behavior towards his fellow-creatures wrought a change in their affections and governed their conduct he applied those practices to the powerful beings of the universe when my fellow-creature of superior strength said he to himself is disposed to injure me i humble myself before him and my prayer has the art of appeasing him i will pray to the powerful beings that strike me i will supplicate the faculties of the planets the waters and they will hear me i will conjure them to avert calamities and to grant me the blessings which are at their disposal my tears will move my offerings propitiate them and i shall enjoy complete felicity and simple in the infancy of his reason man spoke to the sun and the moon he animated with his understanding and his passions the great agents of nature he thought by vain sounds and useless practices to change their inflexible laws fatal error he desired that the water should ascend the mountains be removed the stone mount in the air and substituting a fantastic to a real world he constituted for himself beings of opinion to the terror of his mind and the torment of his race thus the ideas of god and religion sprung like all others from physical objects and were in the understanding of man the products of his sensations his wants the circumstances of his life and the progressive state of his knowledge as these ideas had natural beings for their first models it resulted from hence that the divinity was originally as various and manifold as the forms under which he seemed to act each being was a power a genius and the first men found the universe crowded with innumerable gods in like manner the ideas of the divinity having had for motors the affections of the human heart they underwent an order of division calculated from the sensations of pain and pleasure of love and hatred the powers of nature the gods the genie were classified into benign and maleficent into good and evil ones and this constitutes the universality of these two ideas in every system of religion these ideas analogous to the condition of their inventors were for a long time confused and cross wandering in woods beset with wants destitute of resources men in their savage state had no leisure to make comparisons and draw conclusions suffering more ills than they tasted enjoyments their most habitual sentiment was fear 
their theology terror their worship was confined to certain modes of salutation of offerings which they presented to beings whom they supposed to be ferocious and greedy like themselves in their state of equality and independence no one took upon him the office of mediator with gods as insubordinate and poor as himself no one having any superfluity to dispose of there existed no parasite under the name of priest nor tribute under the name of victim nor empire under the name of altar their dogmas and morality jumbled together were only self-preservation and their religion an arbitrary idea without influence on the mutual relations existing between men was but a vain homage paid to the visible powers of nature such was the first and necessary origin of every idea of the divinity in reality when the vulgar heard others talk of a new heaven and another world they gave a body to these fictions they erected on it a solid stage and real scenes and their notions of geography and astronomy served to strengthen if they did not give rise to the delusion on the one hand the phoenician navigators those who passed the pillars of hercules to fetch the pewter of thule and the amber of the baltic related that at the extremity of the world the boundaries of the ocean the mediterranean where the sun sets to the countries of asia there were fortunate islands the abode of an everlasting spring and at a farther distance hyperborean regions placed under the earth relatively to the tropics where reigned an eternal night from those stories badly understood and no doubt confusedly related the imagination of the people composed the elysian fields delightful spots in a world below having their heaven their sun and their stars and tartarus a place of darkness humidity mire and chilling frost now inasmuch as mankind inquisitive about all that of which they are ignorant and desirous of a protracted existence had already exerted their faculties respecting what was to become of them after death inasmuch as they had early reasoned upon that principle of life which animates the body and which quits it without changing the form of the body and had conceived to themselves airy substances phantoms and shades they loved to believe that they should resume in the subterranean world that life which it was so painful to lose and this abode appeared commodious for the reception of those beloved objects which they could not prevail on themselves to renounce on the other hand the astrological and philosophical priests told such stories of their heavens as perfectly quadrated with these fictions having in their metaphorical language denominated the equinoxes and solstices the gates of heaven or the entrance of the seasons they explained the terrestrial phenomena by saying that through the gate of horn first the bull afterwards the ram vivifying fires descended which in spring gave life to vegetation and aquatic spirits which caused at the solstice the overflowing of the nile that through the gate of ivory originally the bowman or sagittarius then the balance and through that of capricorn or the urn the emanations or influences of the heavens returned to their source and reascended to their origin and the milky way which passed through the doors of the solstices seemed to them to have been placed there on purpose to be their road and vehicle the celestial scene farther presented according to their atlas a river the nile designated by the windings of the hydra together with a barge the vessel argo and the dog sirius both bearing relation to that river of which they foreboded the overflowing these circumstances added to the preceding ones increased the probability of the fiction and thus to arrive at tartarus or elysium souls were obliged to cross the rivers styx and Acheron, 
in the boat of charon the ferryman and to pass through the doors of horn and ivory which were guarded by the mastiff cerberus at length a civil usage was joined to all these inventions and gave them consistency the inhabitants of egypt having remarked that the putrefaction of dead bodies became in their burning climate the source of pestilence and diseases the custom was introduced in a great number of states of burying the dead at a distance from the inhabited districts in the desert which lies at the west to arrive there it was necessary to cross the canals of the river in a boat and pay a toll to the ferryman otherwise the body remaining unburied would have been left a prey to wild beasts this custom suggested to her civil and religious legislators a powerful means of affecting the manners of her inhabitants and addressing savage and uncultivated men with the motives of filial piety and reverence for the dead they introduced as a necessary condition the undergoing that previous trial which should decide whether the deceased deserved to be admitted upon the footing of his family honors into the black city such an idea too well accorded with the rest of the business not to be incorporated with it it accordingly entered for an article into religious creeds and hell had its minos and its Radamanthus and the wand and the chair the guards and the urn after the exact model of this civil transaction the divinity then for the first time became a subject of moral and political consideration a legislator by so much the more formidable as while his judgment was final and his decrees without appeal he was unapproachable to his subjects this mythological and fabulous creation composed as it was of scattered and discordant parts then became a source of future punishments and rewards in which divine justice was supposed to correct the vices and errors of this transitory state a spiritual and mystical system such as i have mentioned acquired so much the more credit as it applied itself to the mind by every argument suited to it the oppressed looked thither for an indemnification and entertained the consoling hope of vengeance the oppressor expected by the costliness of his offerings to secure himself impunity and at the same time employed this principle to inspire the vulgar with timidity kings and priests the heads of the people saw in it a new source of power as they reserved to themselves the privilege of awarding the favors or the censure of the great judge of all according to the opinion that they should inculcate of the odiousness of crimes and the meritoriousness of virtue thus then an invisible and imaginary world entered into competition with that which was real such o persians was the origin of your renovated earth your city of resurrection placed under the equator and distinguished from all other cities by this singular attribute that the bodies of its inhabitants cast no shade such o jews and christians disciples of the persians was the source of your new jerusalem your paradise and your heaven modelled upon the astrological heaven of hermes meanwhile your hell o ye mussulmans a subterraneous pit surmounted by a bridge your balance of souls and good works your judgment pronounced by the angels mankir and nekir derives its attributes from the mysterious ceremonies of the cave of mitra and your heaven is exactly coincident with that of osiris ormuzd and brahma it is evident that it is not truth for which you contend that it is not her cause you are jealous of maintaining but the cause of your own passions and prejudices that it is not the object as it really exists that you wish to verify but the object as it appears to you that it is not the evidence of the thing that you are anxious should prevail but your personal opinion your mode of seeing and judging 
there is a power that you want to exercise an interest that you want to maintain a prerogative that you want to assume in short the whole is a struggle of vanity and as every individual when he compares himself with every other finds himself to be his equal and fellow he resists by a similar feeling of right and from this right which you all deny to each other and from the inherent consciousness of your equality spring your disputes your combats and your intolerance now the only way of restoring unanimity is by returning to nature and taking the order of things which she has established for your director and guide and this farther truth will then appear from your uniformity of sentiment if we would arrive at uniformity of opinion we must previously establish certainty and verify the resemblance which our ideas have to their models now this cannot be obtained except so far as the objects of our inquiry can be referred to the testimony and subjected to the examination of our senses whatever cannot be brought to this trial is beyond the limits of our understanding we have neither rule to try it by nor measure by which to institute a comparison nor source of demonstration and knowledge concerning it whence it is obvious that in order to live in peace and harmony we must consent not to pronounce upon such objects nor annex to them importance we must draw a line of demarcation between such as can be verified and such as cannot and separate by an inviolable barrier the world of fantastic beings from the world of realities that is to say all civil effect must be taken away from theological and religious opinions this o nations is the end that a great people freed from their fetters and prejudices have proposed to themselves this is the work in which by their command and under their immediate auspices we were engaged when your kings and your priests came to interrupt our labors kings and priests you may yet for a while suspend the solemn publication of the laws of nature but it is no longer in your power to annihilate or to subvert them we conclude with the following investigate the laws which nature for our direction has implanted in our breasts and form from thence an authentic and immutable code nor let this code be calculated for one family or one nation only but for the whole without exception be the legislators of the human race as ye are the interpreters of their common nature show us the line that separates the world of chimeras from that of reality and each of us after so many religions of error and delusion the religion of evidence and truth our space prohibits further quotation in this number but when we return to the subject we shall notice chapter twenty one problem of religious contradictions and also the law of nature or principles of morality few men wrote more on various topics than volney and few have been more respected while living and esteemed when dead by those whose respect and esteem it is always an honor to possess at the age of fifty-three after much travel and great study volney consoled his latter days by marrying his cousin the hope of his youth mademoiselle de chasseboeuf a disorder of the bladder contracted when traversing the arabian deserts caused his death at the age of sixty-three he was buried in the cemetery of pere lanchet while laya director of the french academy pronounced a noble panegyric over his grave and months after his death he was spoken highly of by some of the most illustrious men of france thus ended the days of one of the free thinkers of the past whose works despite all suppression will never die
End of chapter 9. Recorded by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina. Chapter 10 of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Chapter 10 Charles Blunt. Look with me through the dark vista of 150 years of clouded history throw your mind across the bridge of time for we are about to visit a tragic scene a scene which might be depicted by a poet so much of beauty of truth and of goodness all blasted by the perjuries of the priest yonder in the dim library of an ancestral mansion embowered amid the woods of the south close by the gurgling waters which beat an echo to the stormy breezes those breezes which will never more fan his cheek that water where he has often bathed his limbs will be his rippling monument the shady moonlight of an august evening is gilding the rich pastures of hertfordshire the gorse bushes have not yet lost their beauty the pheasants are playing in the woods woods that so lately resounded with laughter laughter ringing like a bell the music of a merry heart withdraw those curtains which hide the heart-struck and the dead above you is the exquisite picture of eleonora gazing into the very bed at that form which lay shrouded in nothingness you see the broad manly brow even now the brown hair rises in graceful curls over that damp forehead the lips are locked in an eternal smile, as if to mock the closed eyes and the recumbent form. Is it true that pictures of those we love are endowed with a clairvoyant power of gazing at those who have caressed them in life? If it is, then on that August night the wife of Charles Blunt was watching over his beer but who is that pale form with dishevelled hair and weeping eyes with an alabaster skin stained with the blue spots of grief the rapid upheaving swells of that fair bosom tell of affection withered not by remorse but by superstition see here how she nervously grasps that dead man's hand how she imprints kisses on his lips her hair, which yesterday was glossy as the raven's, is now as bleached as the driven snow. Today she utters her plaintive cries. Tomorrow she hastens to join her lover in the tomb. This is a sad history. It should be written with the juice of hemlock, as a warning to genius of impatient love while the fair girl watches by the couch of the suicide while from the painted canvas eleonora gleams on the living and the dead while the clouds of night gather silently over that ancestral hall around the drooping combs on the bold sloping park and the clear blue river all so quiet and gentle let us gather up the events of the past and learn the cause of a death so tragic a grief so piercing in the year sixteen seventy two at the age of nineteen years a young man the son of a baronet led to the altar the lovely daughter of sir timothy tyrrell flowers strewed the path of the wedded pair and for years their life was one scene of bliss at last struck down by disease charles blunt stood by the side of his dying wife in his arms his eleonora yielded her last sigh he buried her by the willow tree in the old churchyard the lily blended with the white rose and the myrtle overshadowed the grave it was here where the widower rested in the evening here where he taught his children the virtues of their dead mother sometimes he gazed at the azure skies and strange fancies beguiled the mind of the mourner 
when he saw the sun sink to the west gilding the world with its glorious rays he mused on the creeds of many lands he fancied he saw a heaven and a god and traced in the lines of light the patriarchal worshippers of the world he looked at the sun and its worshippers those who sought the origin of purity by worshipping that which is the origin of all good he looked at the fables of greece and found delight in the thought of sappho uttering her diapason of joy in lyrics which told of love and beauty at egypt where the priests in their esoteric cunning searched in vain for that which gives life and motion and joy and then he glanced at the christian heaven but here all was dark dark as the plutonian caverns of homer's hell he wished to meet his eleonora not in pagan dreams not in christian parables but in the world of realities he looked with eager eyes upon the world around him in society at court and in the homes of his country but wherever he went there was but one thought one feeling he wished a mother for his children a mother like the sainted dead there was but one who answered the ideal like in features in passion and in beauty to the lost eleonora born of the same parents loved by the same brother educated by the same teachers imbued with the same thoughts she was the model of her dead sister with a sisterly love for her brother she was already both mother and aunt to her sister's children with deliberate thoughts with convulsive passion the love of charles blunt passed the bounds of that of a brother longing to make her his wife he adored her with the passion he had lavished on the dead it seemed as if the shade of eleonora was perpetually prompting him to bestow all his affection on the young and beautiful eliza she caressed his children with the pride of an aunt she traced the image of her sister in the laughing eyes of the merry babes still she was not happy how could she be happy she loved him as a man as a brother she was a christian he an infidel she was bound by creeds he by conduct she was doing the duty she owed to the dead he sought to do it by uniting himself to the living eliza was anxious to marry but there existed something which to her mind was greater than human duties and it often outraged them god and the church demanded her first attention and then her lover and his children the church in cruel mockery of human rights stepped between her judgment and her affections it denied the power of a woman to occupy the married home of her deceased sister she was willing to pledge her love to charles blunt at the altar but the priest mocked her prayers and denounced her affections the occasion was too good to be lost episcopalism sought revenge on its opponent and it triumphed eliza felt the force of blunt's arguments she wandered with him through the green fields but her sorrow was too great to pluck the wild roses the luscious fruits of summer were past untasted a heart sick and in trouble a mind wandering from her sister's grave to her children and then at the anathema of the church made her a widowed maid to overcome her scruples her lover wrote a book inviting the clergy to refute it defending the marriage with a deceased wife's sister but ever as he spoke there was a film before her eyes there was a gaunt priest with canonical robes stood before the gates of heaven before him and through him was the way to an eternal happiness below him was a fiery hell and he shouted with hoarse voice incest 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 
and ever as he shouted he pointed with his finger of scorn at this christian hell and she conjured up in her mind the old stories of this priest until she saw the livid flames rising up higher till they encircled her form and then the priest screamed with fury anathema maranatha incest incest and in terror she stood with the big drops of sweat dripping from her brow with her heart beating with her mind distracted but her affections unclouded the priest was the church of england and those fancies were driven into her imagination by her creed her litanies and her sermons eliza tyrrell was miserable she was placed between her love her duty and her religion if she had been a woman of a strong mind she would have torn her creed into shreds she would have dared the anathema of the priest the ostracism of its dupes and would have clung to the man she loved so truly in defiance of that which was at the best but a faint possibility the arguments in that pamphlet of blunt's were conclusive but she distrusted reason the plainest dictates of common logic were referred to the promptings of the devil how could it be otherwise can the teachings of a lifetime be overthrown by the courtship of a few months eliza tyrrell true to blunt loved him true to her religion she durst not marry him without the sanction of the church so blunt as a last resolve laid the matter before the lord's vicegerent at canterbury and many of those most learned divines of england and from those ecclesiastical leeches there was a shylock cry of incest 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 and those terrible words came greeting the ears of charles blunt making his home like a charnel-house and they nearly sent his beautiful eliza to a maniac's grave still she lingered on denied the power of a wife she would not relinquish her duties as a mother to her sister's babes there was a calm heroism here which few can imitate the passions of blunt could not brook further insults the last kick of bigotry against the broken-hearted freethinker was given he could no longer rise with the lark and roam over the hills of his ancestral home to him the birds as they warbled spoke of joys never to return the broad river told him of the days when the little skiff floated on its waters with eleonora and even his friends only too bitterly reminded him of the tournaments of wit where hobbes brown and gildon jousted each other in the presence of his wife his life was one scene of misery he saw no chance of amendment in a fit of despair he loaded his pistol with due deliberation placed it to his head and shot himself he lingered for some time and then died on the breast of eliza this was a strange suicide blunt's memory bears its weight of obloquy it is hard to draw the line when and where a man has a right to take away his life common sense tells us that so long as our families are dependent on us we have no right to end our lives and if we have no dependents no friends then our country has a claim upon us but at the same time the one sole end of existence is to be happy if a man cannot find happiness in life if there is a great coalition against him he is justified in taking up arms against them but at the same time it proves a greater amount of courage to bear up against the ills of life than to madly leave it and thus weaken the force of those who wish to stem its injustice charles blount died and with him expired much of the chivalry of free thought his friend charles gildon writing of him to a lady says you know austria eliza and have an exact friendship with her 
you can attest her beauty wit honour virtue good humour and discretion you have been acquainted with the charms of her conversation and conduct and condemn her only adhering to a national custom to the loss of so generous a friend and so faithful a lover but custom and obedience meeting the more easily betrayed her virtue into a crime i know my friend loved her to his last breath and i know therefore that all who love his memory must for her sake love and value her as being a lady of that merit that engaged the reason of philander charles blunt to so violent a passion for her the same writer says his father was sir henry blunt the socrates of the age for his aversions to the reigning sophisms and hypocrisies eminent in all capacities the best husband father and master extremely agreeable in conversation and just in all his dealings from such a father our hero derived himself to such a master owed his generous education unmixed with the nauseous methods and profane opinions of the schools nature gave him parts capable of the noblest sciences and his industrious studies bore a proportion to his capacities he was a generous and constant friend an indulgent parent and a kind master his temper was open and free his conversation pleasant his reflections just and modest his repartees close not scurrilous he had a great deal of wit and no malice his mind was large and noble above the little designs of most men an enemy to dissimulation and never feared to own his thoughts he was a true englishman and lover of the liberties of his country and declared it in the worst of times he was an enemy to nothing but error and none were his enemies that knew him but those who sacrificed more to mammon than reason this was the man who died because a dominant priesthood insisted on a dogma which interfered with a purely secular right which blasted two hearts in a vain attempt to perpetuate a system which dashes its rude fingers and tears out the heart of human felicity to sprinkle the altar of superstition with the gore of offended innocence charles blunt was a deist as such he believed in a god which he described in his account of a deist religion let us examine his thoughts and see if they bear the interpretation which christianity has always placed upon them blunt gives the deist's opinion of god he says whatever is adorable amiable and imitable by mankind is in one supreme perfect being an atheist cannot object to this he speaks in the manner in which god is to be worshipped he says not by sacrifice or by a mediator but by a steady adherence to all that is great and good and imitable in nature this is the brief religious creed of charles blunt he never seeks to find out fabled attributes of deity he knows what is of value to mankind and sedulously practices whatever is beneficial to society in his anima mundi or history of the opinions of the heathens on the immortality of the soul page ninety seven blunt says the heathen philosophers were much divided concerning the soul's future state some held it mortal others immortal of those who held the mortality of the soul the epicureans were the chief sect who notwithstanding their doctrines led virtuous lives cardan had so great a value for their moral actions that he appeared in justification of them it appears says he by the writings of cicero diogenes and laertius that the epicureans did more religiously observe laws piety and fidelity among men than either the stoics or the platonists and i suppose the cause thereof was that a man is either good or evil by custom 
but none confideth in those that do not possess sanctity of life wherefore they were compelled to use greater fidelity thereby the better to justify their profession from which reason it likewise proceeds that at this day few do equal the fidelity of usurers notwithstanding that they are most base in the rest of their life also among the jews whilst the pharisees that confessed the resurrection and the immortality of the soul frequently persecuted christ the sadducees who denied the resurrection angels and spirits meddled not with him above once or twice and that very gently thus if you compare the lives of pliny and seneca not their writings you shall find pliny with his mortality of the soul did as far exceed seneca in honesty of manners as seneca excels him in religious discourse the epicureans observed honesty above others and in their conversation were usually found inoffensive and virtuous and for that reason were often employed by the romans when they could persuade them to accept of great employs for their fault was not any want of ability or honesty but their general desire of leading a private life of ease and free from trouble although inglorious for when immortality is not owned there can be no ambition of posthumous glory the epicureans instead of those bloody scenes of gallantry which tyrants applaud undertook to maintain carefully the inheritance of orphans bringing up at their own charge the children of their deceased friends and were counted good men unless it were in front of religious worship for they constantly affirmed that there were no gods, or at least such as concerned themselves with human affairs, according to the poets. Neither doth the hope of immortality conduce to fortitude, as some vainly suggest, for Brutus was not more valiant than Cassius, and if we will confess the truth, the deeds of Brutus were more cruel than those of Cassius for he used the rhodians who were his enemies far more kindly than brutus did those amicable cities which he governed in a word though they both had a hand in caesar's murder yet brutus was the only parricide so that the stoics which believed a providence lived as if there were none whereas the epicureans who denied it lived as if there were the next sect to the epicureans in point of incredulity concerning the soul i conceive to be the sceptics who were by some esteemed not only the modestest but the most perspicuous of all sects they neither affirmed nor denied anything but doubted of all things they thought all our knowledge seemed rather like truth than to be really true and that for such like reasons as these one they denied any knowledge of the divine nature because they say to know adequately is to comprehend and to comprehend is to contain and the thing contained must be less than that which contains it to know inadequately is not to know two from the uncertainty of our senses as for instance our eyes represent things at a distance to be less than they really are a straight stick in the water appears crooked the moon to be no bigger than a cheese the sun greater at rising and setting than at noon the shore seems to move and the ship to stand still square things to be round at a distance an erect pillar to be less at the top neither say they do we know whether objects are really as our eyes represent them to us for the same thing which seems white to us seems yellow to a jaundiced man and red to a creature afflicted with red eyes also if a man rubs his eyes the figure which he beholds seems long or narrow and therefore it is not improbable that goats cats and other creatures which have long pupils of the eye may think those things long which we call round for as glasses represent the object variously according to their shape so it may be with our eyes 
and so the sense of hearing deceives thus the echo of a trumpet sounded in a valley makes the sound seem before us when it is behind us besides how can we think that an ear which has a narrow passage can receive the same sound with that which has a wide one or the ear whose inside is full of hair to hear the same with a smooth ear experience tells us that if we stop or half stop our ears the sound cometh different as when the ears are open nor is the smelling taste or touch less subject to mistake for the same sense please some and displease others and so in our tastes to a rough and dry tongue that very thing seems bitter as in an ague which to the most moist tongue seems otherwise and so it is in other creatures the like is true of the touch for it were absurd to think that those creatures which are covered with shells scales or hairs should have the same sense in touching with those that are smooth thus one and the same object is diversely judged of according to the various qualities of the instruments of sense which convinceth to the imagination from all which the sceptic concluded that what these things are in their own nature whether red white bitter or sweet he cannot tell for says he why should i prefer my own conceit in affirming the nature of things to be thus or thus because it seemeth so to me when other living creatures perhaps think it is otherwise but the greatest fallacy is in the operation of our inward senses for the fancy is sometimes persuaded that it hears and sees what it does not and our reasoning is so weak that in many disciplines scarce one demonstration is found though this alone produces science wherefore it was democritus's opinion that truth is hid in a well that she may not be found by men now although this doctrine be very inconsistent with christianity yet i could wish adam had been of this persuasion for then he would not have mortgaged his posterity for the purchase of a twilight knowledge now from these sinister observations it was that they esteemed all our sciences to be but conjectures and our knowledge but opinion whereupon doubting the sufficiency of human reason they would not venture to affirm or deny anything of the soul's future state but civilly and quietly gave way to the doctrines and ordinances under which they lived without raising or espousing any new opinions speaking of the origin of the world gildon gives the following as a translation from oscillus lucanus again says he as the frame of the world has been always so it is necessary that its parts should likewise always have existed by parts i mean the heaven earth and that which lieth betwixt viz the sky for not without these but with these and of these the world consists also if the parts exist it is necessary that the things which are within them should also coexist as with the heavens the sun moon fixed stars and planets with the earth animals plants minerals gold and silver with the air exhalations winds and the alterations of weather sometimes heat and sometimes cold for with the world all those things do and ever have existed as parts thereof nor hath man had any original production from the earth or elsewhere as some believe but have always been as now he is co-existent with the world whereof he is a part now corruptions and violent alterations are made according to the parts of the earth by winds and waters imprisoned in the bowels thereof but a universal corruption of the earth never hath been nor ever shall be yet these alterations have given occasion for the invention of many lies and fables 
and thus are we to understand them that derive the original of the greek history from inachus the argive not that he really was the original as some make him but because a most memorable alteration did then happen and some were so unskilful as to attribute it to inachus but for the universe and all the parts whereof it subsists as it is at present so it ever was and ever shall be one nature perpetually moving and another perpetually suffering one always governing and the other always being governed the course which nature takes in governing the world is by one contrary prevailing over another as thus the moisture in the air prevaileth over the dryness of the fire and the coldness of the wafer over the heat of the air and the dryness of the earth over the moisture of the water and so the moisture of the water over the dryness of the earth and the heat in the air over the coldness in the water and the dryness in the fire over the moisture of the air and thus the alterations are made and produced out of one another as nature cannot create by making something out of nothing so neither can it annihilate by turning something into nothing whence it consequently follows as there is no access so there is no diminution in the universe no more than in the alphabet by the infinite combination and transposition of letters or in the wax by the alteration of the seal stamped upon it now as for the forms of natural bodies no sooner doth any one abandon the matter he occupied but another instantly steps into the place thereof no sooner hath one acted his part and is retired but another comes presently forth upon the stage though it may be in a different shape and so act a different part so that no portion of the matter is or at any time can be altogether void and empty but like proteus it burns itself into a thousand shapes and is always supplied with one form or another there being in nature nothing but circulation the following are the principal works of blunt anima mundi or an historical narration of the opinions of the ancients concerning man's soul after this life according to enlightened nature published in sixteen seventy nine upwards of twenty answers were published to this work in sixteen eighty he published a translation with notes of the life of apollonius of tiana this work was suppressed during the same year he gave the world great is diana of the ephesians or the original of idolatry by able critics this is considered one of his ablest works in sixteen eighty three religio laici appeared which is published in a latin work of lord herbert's in sixteen eighty eight he wrote a vindication of learning and of the liberty of the press this tractate sparkles with wit and argument but by far the most important work he was connected with was published in the year he died and mainly written by himself the oracles of reason a favorite title with both american and english freethinkers it consists of sixteen sections the most interesting being the first four containing a vindication of dr burnett's archaeology the seventh and eighth chapters translated of the same of moses's description of the original state of man and dr burnett's appendix of the brahmin's religion we would quote from these sections of the oracles but intend to form separate half-hours with sketches of doctors brown and burnett it will be more appropriate to use blunt's translation in describing those quaint but highly instructive authors in the general style of blunt's works he is not seen to advantage there is too much heaviness enhanced by the perpetual greek and latin quotations but as his works were intended for scholars and the time in which they were written was essentially the most pedantic era of our literary history 
we cannot expect that vivacity and clearness which other writers in a later age possessed it was in his character as a man that blunt excelled he was the leader of the chivalry of the period as in the next age woolston was his successor at the court he was the gayest of the gay without the taint of immorality in a period of the grossest licentiousness he defended the honor of his friends frequently at the expense of calumny and danger in witty repartees he was equal to rochester while for abstruse learning he was superior to many of the most learned theologians daintily brave and skilfully alive to the requirements of friends and foes he passed through life in the gilded barge of pleasure and ended it sailing through a cloud where he foundered but the darkness which enveloped his history is now charged with that sympathetic power which draws the young to his grave and compels the gloomiest to shed a tear over his unhappy fate at the close of august in sixteen ninety three a few friends met near the grave of blunt to join in their last respects to their lost friend foremost among them was charles gildon who so soon repented of the part he had taken in the oracles of reason but never forgot the kindness he experienced from blunt he lived long enough for pope to be revenged on his apostasy by inserting his name in his great satire at the time we speak he was mournful and deeply grieved at the loss he had sustained near him was harvey willwood whose bold demeanor and sorrowful countenance told of heart-struck grief for of the few able to appreciate the genius of blunt he was one of the earliest and most devoted in his friendship now we see the noble lord whom blunt always addressed as the most ingenious strephon along with him there is the pretty anne rogers with savage and major arkwright we look in vain for eliza tyrrell they talk slowly over him that is no more they recount to themselves the intellectual achievements and the brilliant hours they have spent in the past and while they speak so kindly and think so deeply they kneel on the hallowed spot but not to pray some of them pledge their enmity against christian laws and christian priests and they executed it during this time the calm radiance of the lunar light shines on the church of ridge illumining those ghostly tablets of white marble where the forefathers of blunt lie entombed the baronial arms are emblazoned on the wall heraldic pomp is keeping watch over the mouldering bones of the now levelled great anne rogers weeps wildly for eliza and eleanora those metaphysical disquisitions which have exalted woman to so high a nature that devotion to aesthetics which women should always cultivate not as a household slave but as one of equal rights with a man and his leader in everything which concerns taste elegance and modesty such gifts in no ordinary degree had anne rogers and often in dialectic subtlety had she mastered her relative who stood by her side and given tokens of her admiration of blunt's philosophy and conduct strephon was passionately attached to his confidant and friend and could not give so calm an expression to his loss he wept wildly for he had lost one who tempered his rebuke with a kind word and pointed out that epicurean path which leads to enjoyment without excess to pleasure without a reaction it was a memorable meeting while the remembrance of past deeds of love lighted up the eye and made the blood course faster through their veins anne rogers detailed the following episode in his character blunt had visited the court of king james and had been singled out by that monarch for one of his savage fits of spleen i hear mr blunt that you are very tenacious of the opinions of sir henry your father and you consider his conduct during the rebellion as worthy of imitation is it so your majesty replies blunt has been correctly informed i admire my father's conduct 
what says james in opposing his king blunt quickly answered a king my liege is the chief magistrate of the commonwealth and is so hereditarily while he obeys the laws of that commonwealth whose power he represents but when he usurps the direction of that power he is king no longer and such was the case with your royal father with a scowl of defiance on his face king james left the freethinker and sought more congenial company and as anne rogers told the story each eye was dimmed with tears the moon had risen high in the heavens ere the mourners prepared to depart the first streaks of dawn broke through the eastern sky and revealed the grave watered with tears where the most chivalrous freethinker of his age reposed in that sleep which knows of no awakening end of chapter ten read for you by ted delorme in fort mill south carolina chapter eleven of ancient and modern celebrated freethinkers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. ancient and modern celebrated freethinkers by charles bradlaugh chapter eleven percy bish shelley percy bish shelley the son and heir of a wealthy english baronet sir timothy shelley of castle goring in the county of sussex was born at field place near horsham in that county on the fourth of august seventeen ninety two ushered into the world in the midst of wealth and fashion with all the advantages of family distinction the future of shelley's life appeared a bright one but the sunshine of the morning only served to render the darkness which came over his noontide more dark and to make poor shelley still more susceptible of the hardships he had to encounter first educated at eton his spirit there manifested itself by an unflinching opposition to the fagging system and by revolt against the severe discipline of the school in his revolt of islam shelley has thus portrayed this feeling i do remember well the hour which burst my spirit's sleep a fresh may dawn it was when i walked forth upon the glittering grass and wept i knew not why until there rose from the near schoolroom voices that alas were but one echo from a world of woes the harsh and grating strife of tyrants and of foes and then i clasped my hands and looked around and none was near to mock my streaming eyes which poured their warm drops on the sunny ground so without shame i spake i will be wise and just and free and mild if in me lies such power for i grow weary to behold the selfish and the strong still tyrannize without reproach or check and from that hour did i with earnest thought heap knowledge from forbidden minds of lore yet nothing that ray tyrants knew or taught i cared to learn but from that secret store wrought linked armor for my soul before it might walk forth to war among mankind from eton shelley went to oxford and while there he scarce at the age of eighteen published a volume of political rhymes entitled margaret nicholson's remains the said margaret being a woman who tried to assassinate george the third he also wrote a pamphlet in defence of atheism a copy of this pamphlet he caused to be sent to the head of each of the colleges in oxford with a challenge to discuss and answer the answer to this was the edict which expelled shelley from oxford and at the same time placed a wide chasm between him and his family this breach was still further widened in the following year by his marriage at the age of nineteen with a beautiful girl named westbrook 
although miss westbrook was respectfully connected shelley's aristocratic family regarded this as a mesalliance and withdrew his pecuniary allowance and had it not been for the bride's father who allowed the young couple two hundred pounds a year they would have been reduced to actual poverty this was an unfortunate marriage for both after having two children disagreements arose and shelley was separated from his wife she like all beautiful women was soon attacked by the busy tongue of slander and unable to bear the world's taunts committed suicide by throwing herself into a pond just four years from the date of their marriage shelley on this account suffered much misery and misrepresentation and this misery was much increased by his family who applied to the court of chancery and obtained a decree by which shelley was deprived of the custody of his children on the ground of his atheism the same spirit even now pervades the Shelley family, and scarce a copy of his poems can be found in the neighborhood of his birthplace. Shelley afterwards contracted a second marriage with the daughter of Godwin, the author of Caleb Williams, and Mary Wollstonecraft, who died in giving birth to Shelley's wife. And for some time the poet resided at Marlow in Buckinghamshire, where he composed The Revolt of Islam and it is a strong proof of the reality of shelley's poetical pleadings for the oppressed amongst the human race that he was indefatigable in his attentions to the poor cottagers of his neighborhood and that he suffered severely from an attack of ophthalmia which was originated in one of his benevolent visits nearly the first of shelley's poems was his queen mab in which having in vain struggled to devote himself to metaphysics apart from poetry he blended his metaphysical speculation with his poetical aspirations the following quotations are taken from that poem in which his wonderful command of language is well shown there's not one atom of yon earth but once was living man, nor the minutest drop of rain that hangeth in its thinnest cloud, but flowed in human veins. And from the burning plains, where Libyan monsters yell, from the most gloomy glens of Greenland's sunless clime, to where the golden fields of fertile England spread their harvest to the day, thou canst not find one spot whereon no city stood how strange is human pride i tell thee that those living things to whom the fragile blade of grass that springeth in the morn and perishes ere noon in an unbounded world i tell thee that those viewless beings whose mansion is the smallest particle of the impassive atmosphere think feel and live like man that their affections and antipathies like his produce the laws ruling their mortal state and the minutest throb that through their frame diffuses the slightest faintest motion is fixed and indispensable as the majestic laws that rule yon rolling orbs how bold the flight of passion's wandering wing how swift the step of reason's firmer tread how calm and sweet the victories of life how terrorless the triumph of the grave how powerless were the mightiest monarch's arm vain his loud threat and impotent his frown how ludicrous the priest's dogmatic roar the weight of his exterminating curse how light and his affected charity to suit the pressure of the changing times what palpable deceit but for thy aid religion but for thee prolific fiend who peoplest earth with demons hell with men and heaven with slaves thou taintest all thou look'st upon the stare which on thy cradle beamed so brightly sweet were gods to the distempered playfulness of thy untutored infancy the trees the grass the clouds the mountains and the sea all living things that walk swim creep or fly were gods 
the sun had homage and the moon her worshipper then thou becamest a boy more daring in thy frenzies every shape monstrous or vast or beautifully wild which from sensation's relics fancy culls the spirits of the air the shuddering ghost the genie of the elements the powers that give a shape to nature's varied works had life and place in the corrupted belief of thy blind heart yet still thy youthful hands were pure of human blood then manhood gave its strength and ardor to thy frenzied brain thine eager gaze scanned the stupendous scene whose wonders mocked the knowledge of thy pride their everlasting and unchanging laws reproached thine ignorance awhile thou stoodst baffled and gloomy then thou didst sum up the elements of all that thou didst know the changing seasons winter's leafless rain the budding of the heaven-breathing trees the eternal orbs that beautify the night the sunrise and the setting of the moon earthquakes and wars and poison and disease and all their causes to an abstract point converging thou didst bend and called it god the self-sufficing the omnipotent the merciful and the avenging god who prototype of human misrule sits high in heaven's realm upon a golden throne even like an earthly king and whose dread work hell gapes forever for the unhappy slaves of fate whom he created in his sport to triumph in their torments when they fell earth heard the name earth trembled as the smoke of his revenge ascended up to heaven blotting the constellations and the cries of millions butchered in sweet confidence and unsuspecting peace even when the bonds of safety were confirmed by wordy oaths sworn in his dreadful name rung through the land whilst innocent babes writhed on thy stubborn spear and thou didst laugh to hear the mother's shriek of maniac gladness as the sacred steel felt cold in her torn entrails religion thou wert then in manhood's prime but age crept on one god would not suffice for senile puerility thou framedst a tale to suit thy dotage and to glut thy misery thirsting soul that the mad fiend thy wickedness had pictured might afford a plea for sating the unnatural thirst for murder rapine violence and crime that still consumed thy being even when thou heardst the step of fate that flames might light thy funeral scene and the shrill horrent shrieks of parents dying on the pile that burned to light their children to thy paths the roar of the encircling flames the exulting cries of thine apostles loud commingling there might sate thy hungry ear even on the bed of death but now contempt is mocking thy gray hairs thou art descending to the darksome grave unhonored and unpitied but by those whose pride is passing by like thine and sheds like thine a glare that fades before the sun of truth and shines but in the dreadful night that long has lowered above the ruined world speaking of the atheist's martyrdom in answer to the spirit of iantha shelley makes his fairy say there is no god nature confirms the faith his death grown sealed let heaven and earth let man's revolving race his ceaseless generations tell their tale let every part depending on the chain that links it to the whole point to the hand that grasps its term 
let every seed that falls in silent eloquence unfold its store of argument infinity within infinity without belie creation the exterminate spirit it contains is nature's only god but human pride is skilful to invent most serious names to hide its ignorance the name of god has fenced about all crime with holiness himself the creature and his worshippers whose names and attributes and passions change seva buddha for jehovah goa or lord even with the human dupes who build his shrines still serving o'er the war polluted world for desolation's watchword whether hosts stain his death blushing chariot wheels as on triumphantly they roll whilst brahmins raise a sacred hymn to mingle with the groans or countless partners of his powers divide his tyranny to weakness or the smoke of burning towns the cries of female helplessness unarmed old age and youth and infancy horribly massacred ascend to heaven in honour of his name or last and worst earth groans beneath religion's iron age and priests dare babble of a god of peace even whilst their hands are red with guiltless blood murdering the while uprooting every germ of truth exterminating spoiling all making the earth a slaughter-house ianthus spirit however asks still further and the ghost of ahasuerus having been summoned the question is repeated is there a god ahasuerus is there a god ay an almighty god and vengeful as almighty once his voice was heard on earth earth shuddered at the sound the fiery visaged firmament expressed abhorrence and the grave of nature yawned to swallow all the dauntless and the good that dared to hurl defiance at his throne girt as it was with power none but slaves survived cold-blooded slaves who did the work of tyrannous omnipotence whose souls no honest indignation ever urged to elevated daring to one deed which gross and sensual self did not pollute these slaves built temples for the omnipotent fiend gorgeous and vast the costly altars smote with human blood and hideous moans rung through all the long-drawn aisles a murderer heard his voice in egypt one whose gifts and arts had raised him to his eminence in power accomplice of omnipotence in crime and confidant of the all-knowing one these were jehovah's words from an eternity of idleness god awoke in seven days toil made earth from nothing rested and created man i placed him in a paradise and there planted the tree of evil so that he might eat and perish and my soul procure wherewith to sate its malice and to turn even like a heartless conqueror of the earth all misery to my fame the race of men chosen to my honour with impunity may sate the lusts i planted in their heart here i command thee hence to lead them on until with hardened feet their conquering troops wade on the promised soil through woman's blood and make my name be dreaded through the land yet ever burning flame and ceaseless woe shall be the doom of their eternal souls with every soul on this ungrateful earth virtuous or vicious weak or strong even all shall perish to fulfil the blind revenge which you to men call justice of their god the murderer's brow quivered with horror god omnipotent is there no mercy must our punishment be endless 
will long ages roll away and see no term oh wherefore hast thou made in mockery and wrath this evil earth mercy becomes the powerful be but just o god repent and save one way remains i will beget a son and he shall bear the sins of all the world he shall arise in an unnoticed corner of the earth and there shall die upon a cross and purge the universal crime so that the few on whom my grace descends those who are marked as vessels to the honour of their god may credit this strange sacrifice and save their souls alive millions shall live and die who ne'er shall call upon their saviour's name but unredeemed go to the gaping grave thousands shall deem it an old woman's tale such as the nurses frighten babes withal these in a gulf of anguish and of flame shall curse their reprobation endlessly yet tenfold pangs shall force them to avow even on their beds of torment where they howl my honour and the justice of their doom what then avail their virtuous deeds their thoughts of purity with radiant genius bright or lit with human reason's earthly ray many are called but few i will elect do thou my bidding moses in his poem of rosalind and helen the poet indulges in the following prophecy which he puts in the mouth of helen fear not the tyrants shall rule for ever or the priests of the bloody faith they stand on the brink of that mighty river whose waves they have tainted with death it is fed from the depths of a thousand dells around them it foams and rages and swells and their swords and their sceptres i floating see like wrecks on the surge of eternity beside the poems mentioned shelley wrote the cinci alastor prometheus unbound and many others including a beautiful little ode to a skylark and the well-known sensitive plant shelley was a true and noble man no poet was ever warmed by a more genuine and unforced aspiration de quincey says shelley would from his earliest manhood have sacrificed all that he possessed for any comprehensive purpose of good for the race of man he dismissed all insults and injuries from his memory he was the sincerest and most truthful of human creatures if he denounced marriage as a vicious institution that was but another phase of the partial lunacy which affected him for to no man were purity and fidelity more essential elements in the idea of real love again de quincey speaks of shelley's fearlessness his gracious nature his truth his purity from all fleshliness of appetite his freedom from vanity his diffusive love and tenderness this testimony is worth much the more especially when we remember that it is from the pen of thomas de quincey who while truthfully acknowledging the man hesitates not to use polished irony rough wit and covert sneering when dealing with the man's uttered thinkings that shelley understood the true mission of a poet and the true nature of poetry will appear from the following extract from one of his prose essays poetry he says is the record of the best and happiest moments of the happiest and best minds we are aware of evanescent visitations of thought and feeling sometimes associated with place and person sometimes regarding our own mind alone and always arising unforeseen and departing unbidden but elevating study delightful beyond all expression poets are not only subject to these experiences as spirits of the most refined organization but they can color all they combine with the evanescent lines of this ethereal world 
a word a trait in the representation of a scene or passion will touch the enchanted chord and reanimate in those who have ever experienced these emotions the sleeping the cold the buried image of the past poetry thus makes immortal all that is best and most beautiful in the world it arrests the vanishing apparitions which haunt the interlunations of life and veiling them or in language or in form sends them forth among mankind bearing sweet news of kindred joy to those with whom their sisters abide abide because there is no portal of expression from the caverns of the spirit which they inhabit into the universe of things shelley's beautiful imagery and idealistic drapery is sometimes so accumulated in his poems that it is difficult to follow him in his thinkings in his verse he wishes to stand high as a philosophical reasoner and this together with his devotion to the cause which even men of de quincey's stamp call insolent infidelity has prevented shelley from becoming so popular as he might have been shelley lived a life of strife passed his boyhood and youth in struggling to be free misunderstood and misinterpreted and when at last in his manhood happier circumstances were gathering around him a blast of wind came and the waves of the sea washed away one who was really and truly a man and a poet on monday july eighth eighteen twenty two being then in his twenty-ninth year shelley was returning from leghorn to his home at larishi in a schooner rigged boat of his own with one friend and an english servant when the boat had reached about four miles from the shore the storm suddenly rose and the wind suddenly shifted from excessive smoothness all at once the sea was foaming and breaking and getting up in a heavy swell the boat is supposed to have filled to leeward and carrions two tons of ballast to have sunk instantaneously all on board were drowned the body of shelley was washed on shore eight days afterwards near via Reggio, in an advanced state of decomposition and was therefore burned on a funeral pyre in the presence of lee hunt lord byron mr trelawney and a captain shenley thus died shelley in the midday of life and ere the warm sun of that midday could dispel the clouds that had gathered round the morning of his career the following comparison made between the personal appearance of shelley and of byron by gilfillan has been called by de quincey an eloquent parallel and we therefore conclude the present number by quoting it in the forehead and head of byron there is more massive power and breadth shelley has a smooth arched spiritual expression wrinkle there seems none on his brow it is as if perpetual youth had there dropped its freshness byron's eye seems the focus of pride and lust shelley's is mild pensive fixed on you but seeing you through the mist of his own idealism defiance curls on byron's nostril and sensuality steps his full large lips the lower features of shelley's face are frail feminine flexible byron's head is turned upwards as if having risen proudly above his contemporaries he were daring to claim kindred or demand a contest with a superior order of beings shelley's is half bent in reverence and humility before some vast vision seen by his own eye alone misery erect and striving to cover its retreat under an aspect of contemptuous fury is the permanent and pervading expression of byron's countenance sorrow softened and shaded away by hope and habit lies like a holier day of still moonshine upon that of shelley in the portrait of byron taken at the age of nineteen you see the unnatural age of premature passion his hair is young his dress is youthful but his face is old 
in shelley you see the eternal child none the less that his hair is gray and that sorrow seems hath his immortality end of chapter eleven of ancient and modern celebrated freethinkers by charles bradlaugh read for you by ted delorme in fort mill south carolina